Reflections. Even the greatest artifact can be defeated by a counter artifact that is lesser but specialized. That was what the defense professor had told Harry after dropping the true cloak to pool in fuliginous folds near Harry's shoes. The mirror of perfect reflection has power over what is reflected within it, and that power is said to be unchallengeable. But since the true cloak of invisibility produces a perfect absence of image, it should evade this principle rather than challenging it. There had followed a series of questions in Parseltongue establishing that Harry currently did not intend to do anything stupid or try to run away, and further reminders that Professor Quirrell could sense him and had spells to detect the cloak and was holding hostage hundreds of lives plus Hermione. Then Harry was told to don the cloak, open the door that lay beyond the quenched fires, and advance through the door into the final chamber, as Professor Quirrell stood well back, outside of that door's sight. The last chamber was illuminated in lights of soft gold, and the stone walls were of gentle white and faced with marble. In the center of the room stood a simple and unornamented golden frame, and within the frame was a portal to another gold-illuminated room, beyond whose door which lay another potions chamber. That was what Harry's brain told him. The mirror's transformation of light was so perfect that conscious thought was required to deduce that the room inside the frame was only a reflection rather than a portal, though it might have been easier to intuit if Harry hadn't been invisible just then. The mirror did not touch the ground. The golden frame had no feet. It didn't look like it was hovering. It looked like it was fixed in place, more solid and more motionless than the walls themselves, like it was nailed to the reference frame of the Earth's motion. Is the mirror there? Is it moving? came Professor Quirrell's commanding voice from the potions chamber. Is there? Harry hissed back. Not moving! Again, tones of command rang forth. Walk around to the back of the mirror. From behind, the golden frame appeared solid, showing no reflections, and Harry said so in parcel tongue. Now take off your cloak. Report to me at once if the mirror moves to face you. Harry took off his cloak. The mirror remained nailed to the reference frame of Earth's motion, and Harry reported this. Shortly after, there came a hissing and seething, and a balefire phoenix melted through the marble wall behind Harry, the ambient light in the room taking on a red tinge as it entered. Professor Quirrell followed behind it, walking out of the new-made corridor that had been carved, his black formal shoes unharmed by the red-glowing molten surface beneath. Well, that is one possible trap averted. And now... Now we will think of possible strategies for retrieving the stone from the mirror, and you will try them, for I prefer not to let my own image be reflected. I give you fair warning, this is the part that may prove tedious. I take it this isn't a problem you can solve with fiendfire? Ha! Professor Quirrell gestured. The Balefire Phoenix moved forward in a rush of crimson terror, the red light casting writhing shadows on the remaining marble walls. Harry jumped back before he could think. The dreadful dark red blaze rushed past Professor Quirrell, surged into the golden back of the mirror, and disappeared as fast as it touched the gold. Then the fire was gone, and the room was tinged scarlet no more. There was no scratch upon the golden surface, no glow to mark the absorption of heat. The mirror had simply remained in place, untouched. Chills went down Harry's spine. If he'd been playing Dungeons and & Dragons and the dungeon master had reported that result, Harry would have suspected a mental illusion and rolled to disbelieve. Upon the center of the golden back had appeared a sequence of runes in no known alphabet, Black absences of light in small lines and curves, arranged in a level, horizontal row. The thought occurred to Harry that some minor concealing illusion had been consumed in the fiend fire, a far lesser enchantment that had been added to prevent children from seeing those letters. 
How old is this mirror? Nobody knows, Mr. Potter. The defense professor reached out his fingers toward the runes, a look of something like reverence on his face, but his fingers did not touch the gold. But my guess is the same as yours, I think. It is said, in certain legends that may or may not be fabrications, that this mirror reflects itself perfectly, and therefore its existence is absolutely stable. So stable that the mirror was able to survive when every other effect of Atlantis was undone, all its consequences severed from time. You can see why I was amused when you suggested fiend fire. The defense professor let his hand fall. Even in the middle of everything else, Harry felt the awe if that was true. The golden frame gleamed no brighter than before for all the revelation, but you could imagine it going back and back into a civilization that had been made to never be. What does the mirror do, exactly? An excellent question. The answer is in the runes that are written upon the mirror's golden frame. Read them to me. They're not in any alphabet I recognize. They look like randomly oriented chicken scratches drawn by Tolkien elves. Read them anyway. Is not dangerous. The runes say... Noitelav delato parche tner hakrui tu bekafrui ton nawachsi. Harry stopped, feeling more prickles at his spine. Harry knew what the rune for Noitelav meant. It meant Noitelav. And the next rune said to delato the Noitelav until it reached parche, then keep the part that was both tner and hak. That belief felt like knowledge like he could have answered yes with confident authority if someone asked him whether the Tan Wu was Rui or Bekaf Rui. It was just that when Harry tried to relate those concepts to any other concepts, he drew a blank. Do you understand what words mean, boy? Don't think so. Professor Quirrell gave a soft exhalation, his eyes not leaving the golden frame. I had wondered if perhaps the words of false comprehension might be understood to a student of muggle science. Apparently not. Maybe, Harry began. Really, Ravenclaw? said Slytherin. You're pulling this now? Maybe I could try again to understand the words, if I knew more about the mirror? said Harry's Ravenclaw part, which had assumed direct control. Professor Quirrell's lips quirked up. As with most ancient things, scholars have written down enough lies that it is hard to be sure of anything by now. It is definite that the mirror is at least as old as Merlin, for it is known that Merlin used it as a tool. It is also known that after his death, Merlin left written instructions that the mirror did not need to be sealed away, despite it having certain powers that might normally cause one to worry. He wrote that, given how painstakingly the mirror had been crafted to not destroy the world, it would be easier to destroy the world using a lump of cheese. This statement struck Harry as not entirely reassuring. Certain other facts about the mirror are attested by famous wizards who were reasonably skeptical, and whose word has otherwise proven reliable. The mirror's most characteristic power is to create alternate realms of existence, though these realms are only as large in size as what can be seen within the mirror. It is known that people and other objects can be stored therein. It is claimed by several authorities that the mirror alone, of all magics, possesses a true moral orientation, though I am not sure what that could mean in practical terms. I would expect moralists to call the Cruciatus Curse by their name of evil, and the Patronus Charm by their name of good. I cannot guess what a moralist would think was any more moral than that. But it is claimed, for example, that phoenixes came into our world from a realm that was evoked inside this mirror. 
Words like jeepers and what his parents would have termed inappropriate language were all running through Harry's head, none very coherently, as he stared at the golden back of the mirror. I have wandered the world and encountered many stories that are not often heard. Most of them seemed to me to be lies, but a few had the ring of history rather than storytelling. Upon a wall of metal, in a place where no one had come for centuries, I found written the claim that some Atlanteans foresaw their world's end, and sought to create a device of great power to avert the inevitable catastrophe. If that device had been completed, the story claimed, it would have become an absolutely stable existence that could withstand the channeling of unlimited magic in order to grant wishes. And also, this was said to be the vastly harder task. The device would somehow avert the inevitable catastrophes any sane person would expect to follow from that premise. The aspect I found interesting was that, according to the tale writ upon those metal plates, the rest of Atlantis ignored this project and went upon their ways. It was sometimes praised as a noble public endeavor, but nearly all other Atlanteans found more important things to do on any given day than help. Even the Atlantean nobles ignored the prospect of somebody other than themselves obtaining unchallengeable power, which a less experienced cynic might expect to catch their attention. With relatively little support, the tiny handful of would-be makers of this device labored under working conditions that were not so much dramatically arduous as pointlessly annoying. Eventually, time ran out, and Atlantis was destroyed with the device still far from complete. I recognize certain echoes of my own experience that one does not usually see invented in mere tales. A twist in the dry smile. But perhaps that is merely my own preference for one tale among a hundred other legends. You perceive, however, the echo of Merlin's statement about the mirror's creators shaping it to not destroy the world. Most importantly for our purposes, it may explain why the mirror would have the previously unknown capability that Dumbledore or Purnell seems to have evoked, of showing any person who steps before it an illusion of a world in which one of their desires has been fulfilled. It is the sort of sensible precaution you can imagine someone building into a wish-granting creation meant to not go horribly wrong. Wow, Harry whispered and meant it. This was magic with a capital M. The sort of magic that appeared in So You Want to Be a Wizard, not just a collection of random physics-violating things you could do with a wand. Professor Quirrell gestured at the golden back. The final property upon which most tales agree is that whatever the unknown means of commanding the mirror, of that key there are no plausible accounts. The mirror's instructions cannot be shaped to react to individual people. So it is not possible for Purnell to command this mirror, only give the stone to Purnell. Dumbledore cannot state, only give the stone to one who wishes to give it to Nicholas Flamel. There is in the mirror a blindness such as philosophers have attributed to ideal justice. It must treat all who come before it by the same rule, whatever rule may be in force. Thus, there must be some rule for reaching the stone's hiding place which anyone can invoke. And now you see why you, called the boy who lived, shall implement whatever strategies the two of us devise for it was said that this thing possesses a moral orientation, and it may have been given commands reflecting the same. I am well aware that on conventional terms you are said to be good, just as I am said to be evil. Professor Quirrell smiled rather darkly. So, as our first attempt, though not our last, rest assured, let us see what this mirror makes of your attempt to retrieve the stone in order to save the life of Hermione Granger and hundreds of your fellow students. 
And the first version of that plan, said Harry, who was beginning to finally understand, the one you invented on Friday in my first week of Hogwarts, called for the stone to be retrieved by Dumbledore's golden child, the boy who lived, making a selfless and noble attempt to save the life of his dying defense teacher, Professor Quirrell. Of course. It was a poetical sort of plot, Harry supposed, but his appreciation of that elegance was being hampered by the surrounding circumstances. Then another thought occurred to Harry. Um, you think that this mirror is a trap for you? There is no way beneath the heavens that it is not meant as a trap. That is to say, it's a trap for Lord Voldemort. Only it can't be a trap for him personally. There has to be a general rule that underlies it. Some generalizable quality of Lord Voldemort that triggers it. Without conscious awareness, Harry was frowning hard at the mirror's golden back. As you say... Professor Quirrell was beginning to frown at Harry's frowning. Well, on the first Thursday of this year, the mad headmaster Dumbledore, who I'd just seen incinerate a chicken, told me that I had no chance whatsoever of getting into his forbidden corridor since I didn't know the spell Alohomora. I see. Oh, dear. I wish you had thought to mention this to me a good deal earlier. Neither of them needed to state aloud the obvious, that this bit of reverse-reverse psychology had successfully ensured that Harry would stay the heck away from Dumbledore's forbidden corridor. Harry was still concentrating. Do you think Dumbledore suspects that I am, in his terms, a horcrux of Lord Voldemort? Or, more generally, that some aspects of my personality were copied off Lord Voldemort? Even as Harry asked this aloud, he realized what a dumb question it was, and how much completely blatant evidence he'd already seen that... Dumbledore cannot possibly have missed it. It is not exactly subtle. What else is Dumbledore to think? That you are an actor in a play whose stupid author has never met a real eleven-year-old? Only a gibbering dullard would believe that. Ah... Never mind. The two of them stared at the mirror in silence. Finally, Professor Quirrell sighed. (sighs) I have outwitted myself, I fear. Neither you nor I dare be reflected in this mirror. I suppose I must command Professor Sprout to undo my obliviations of Mr. Knott and Miss Greengrass. You see, the other great difficulty of the mirror is that the rule by which it treats those reflected will disregard external forces, such as false memories or a confundus charm. The mirror reflects only those forces arising from within the person themselves, the states of mind they arrive at through their own choices. So it is said in several places. That is why I had Mr. Knott and Miss Greengrass, believing different stories about why the stone's extraction was necessary, ready to appear before the mirror. Professor Quirrell rubbed at the bridge of his nose. I constructed other stories for other students, ready for me to set into motion with the chosen trigger, but as this day approached, I began to feel pessimistic about the project. Such as Knot and Greengrass still seem worth trying if we cannot think of something better. But I wonder if Dumbledore has tried to construct this puzzle to specifically resist Voldemort's cunning. I wonder if he might have succeeded. If you devise an alternative plan which I approve enough to try, I promise that whatever pawn I send forth shall not be harmed by me, then or ever, nor do I expect to break that promise. And I remind you again of the hostages I hold to my failure, both Miss Granger and all the others. Again they stared at the mirror in silence, the elder Tom Riddle and the younger. I suspect, Professor... Harry said after a time, 
that your entire class of hypotheses about someone needing to want the stone for good or honest purposes is mistaken. The headmaster wouldn't set a retrieval rule like that. Why? Because Dumbledore knows how easy it is to end up believing that you're doing the right thing when you're actually not. It'd be the first possibility he imagined. Is it truth or trickery that I hear? Am being honest. Professor Quirrell nodded. Then your point is well taken. I'm not sure why you think this puzzle is solvable. Just set a rule like, your left hand must hold a small blue pyramid and two large red pyramids, and your right hand must be squeezing mayonnaise onto a hamster. No, I think not. The legends are unclear what rules can be given, but I think it must have something to do with the mirror's original intended use. It must have something to do with the deep desires and wishes arising from within the person. Squeezing mayonnaise onto a hamster will not qualify as that, for most people. Huh. Maybe the rule is that the person has to not want to use the stone at all. No, that's too easy. The story you gave Mr. Knott solves it. In some ways, you may understand Dumbledore better than I. So now I ask you this. How would Dumbledore use his notion of the acceptance of death to guard this stone? For that, above all, he thinks I cannot comprehend, and he is not far wrong. Harry thought about this for a while, considering several ideas and discarding them. And then, having thought of something, Harry considered remaining silent, before mapping out the obvious part of the future conversation where Professor Quirrell asked him to say in Parseltongue if he'd thought of something. Reluctantly, Harry spoke. Would Dumbledore think that this mirror could reach the afterlife? Could he put the stone into something that he thinks is an afterlife, so that only people who believe in an afterlife can see it? Hmm. Possibly. Yes, there is a certain plausibility to it. Using this setting of the mirror to show people their heart's desires, Albus Dumbledore would see himself reunited with his family. He would see himself united with them in death, wanting to die himself rather than wishing for them to be returned to life. His brother Aberforth, his sister Ariana, his parents Kendra and Percival. It would be Aberforth to whom Dumbledore gave the stone, I think. Would the mirror recognize that Aberforth particularly had been given the stone? Or will any dead person's relative do if that person believes their relative spirit would give them back the stone? Professor Quirrell was pacing in a short circle, keeping well away from Harry and the mirror as he moved. But all that is only one idea. Let us devise another. Harry began to tap his cheek, then stopped abruptly when he realized where he'd picked up that gesture. What if Purnell is the one who put the stone in here? Maybe she keyed the mirror to give the stone only to the person who put it in originally. Purnell has lived this long by knowing her limitations. She does not overestimate her own intellect. She is not prideful. If that were so, she would have lost the stone long ago. Purnell will not try to think of a good mirror rule herself. Not when Master Flamel can leave the matter in Dumbledore's wiser hands. But the rule of only returning the stone to the one who remembers placing it also works if Dumbledore himself has placed the stone. It would be a hard rule to bypass, since I cannot simply confund someone into believing that they put in the stone. I would have to create a false stone and a false mirror and arrange the drama. Professor Quirrell was frowning now. But it is still something that Dumbledore would imagine Voldemort being able to arrange, given time. If at all possible, Dumbledore will want to make the key to the stone a state of mind that he thinks I cannot arrange in upon, or a rule that Dumbledore thinks Voldemort can never comprehend, such as a rule involving the acceptance of one's own death. That is why I considered your previous idea plausible. Then Harry had an idea. He was not sure if it was a good idea. 
It wasn't like Harry had a lot of choice here. Arguendo. We're not sure what's necessary to retrieve the stone, but a sufficient condition should involve Albus Dumbledore, or maybe someone else, in a state of mind where they believe that the Dark Lord has been defeated, that the threat is over, and that it is time to take out the stone and give it back to Nicholas Flamel. We aren't sure which part of that person's state of mind, let's say Dumbledore's, will be the necessary part that he thinks Lord Voldemort can't understand or duplicate. But under those conditions, Dumbledore's entire state of mind will be sufficient. Reasonable. So? The corresponding strategy is to mimic Dumbledore's state of mind under those conditions in as much detail as possible while standing in front of the mirror. And this state of mind must have been produced by internal forces, not external ones. But how are we to get that without legilimency or the confundus charm, both of which would certainly be external? Aha! I see. Professor Quirrell's ice-pale eyes were suddenly piercing. You suggest that I confund myself, as you cast that hex upon yourself during your first day in battle magic, so that it is an internal force and not an external one. A state of mind that comes about through only my own choices. Say to me whether you have made the suggestion with the intention of trapping me, boy. Say it to me in parcel tongue. My mind that you asked to devise strategy may perhaps have been influenced by such an intent. Who knows? Knew you would be suspicious. Ask this very question. Decision is up to you, teacher. I know nothing you do not know about whether this is likely to trap you. Do not call it betrayal by me if you choose this for yourself and it fails. Harry felt a strong impulse to smile and suppressed it. Lovely, said Professor Quirrell, who was smiling. I suppose there are some threats from an inventive mind that even questioning in parcel tongue cannot neutralize. Harry put on the cloak of invisibility at Professor Quirrell's orders to Stop the man who shall believe himself to be schoolmaster from seeing you. Wearing the cloak or no, you will stand in range of the mirror yourself. If a gush of lava comes forth, you will also burn. I feel that much symmetry should apply. Professor Quirrell pointed to a spot near the right of the door through which they'd entered the room, before the mirror and well back of it. Harry, wearing the cloak, went to where Professor Quirrell had pointed him and did not argue. It was increasingly unclear to Harry whether both riddles dying here would be a bad thing, even with hundreds of other student hostages at stake. For all of Harry's good intentions, he'd shown himself so far to be an idiot, and the returned Lord Voldemort was a threat to the entire world. Though either way, Harry couldn't see Dumbledore doing the lava thing. Dumbledore was probably sufficiently angry at Voldemort to discard his usual restraint but lava wouldn't permanently stop an entity that Dumbledore believed to be a discorporate soul. Then Professor Quirrell pointed his wand, and a shimmering circle appeared around where Harry was standing on the floor. This, Professor Quirrell said, would soon become a greater circle of concealment, by which nothing within that circle could be heard or seen from the outside. Harry would not be able to make himself apparent to the false Dumbledore by taking off the cloak, nor by shouting. You will not cross the circle once it is active. That would cause you to touch my magic, and while confunded, I might not remember how to halt the resonance that would destroy us both. And further, since I do not want you throwing shoes... Professor Quirrell made another gesture, and just within the greater circle of concealment, a slight shimmer appeared in the air, a globe-shaped distortion... This barrier will explode if touched, 
by you or by other material thing. The resonance might lash at me afterward, but you would also be dead. Now tell me in parcel tongue that you do not intend to cross the circle or take off your cloak, or do anything at all impulsive or stupid. Tell me you will wait quietly here, under the cloak, until this is over. Harry repeated this back. Then Professor Quirrell's robes became black, tinged with gold, such robes as Dumbledore might wear upon a formal occasion, and Professor Quirrell pointed his own wand at his head. Professor Quirrell stayed motionless for a long time, still holding his wand to his head. His eyes were closed in concentration. And then Professor Quirrell said, Confund us. At once the expression of the man standing there changed. He blinked a few times as though confused, lowering his wand. A deep weariness spread over the face Professor Quirrell had worn. Without any visible change, his eyes seemed older, the few lines in his face calling attention to themselves. His lips were set in a sad smile. Without any hurry, the man quietly walked over to the mirror as though he had all the time in the world. He crossed into the mirror's range of reflection without anything happening, and stared into the surface. What the man might be seeing there, Harry could not tell. To Harry, it seemed that the flat, perfect surface still reflected the room behind it, like a portal to another place. Ariana, breathed the man. Mother, father, and you, my brother, it is done. The man stood still, as if listening. Yes, done. Voldemort came before this mirror and was trapped by Merlin's method. He is only one more sealed horror now. Again the listening stillness. I would that I could obey you, my brother, but it is better this way. The man bowed his head. He is denied his death forever. That vengeance is terrible enough. Harry felt a twinge, watching this a sense that this was not what Dumbledore would have said. It seemed more like a straw man, a shallow stereotype. But then, this wasn't the real Aberforth spirit either. This was who Professor Quirrell imagined Dumbledore imagined Aberforth was. And that doubly reflected image of Aberforth wouldn't notice anything amiss. It is time to give back the Philosopher's Stone, said the man who thought he was Dumbledore. It must go back into Master Flamel's keeping now. Listening stillness. No! Master Flamel has kept it safe these many years from all who would seek immortality, and I think it will be safest in his hands. No, Aberforth, I do think his intentions are good. Harry couldn't control the tension that was running through him like a live wire. He was having trouble breathing. Imperfect. Professor Quirrell's confundus charm had been imperfect. The underlying personality of Professor Quirrell was leaking through and seeing the obvious question. Why was it okay for Nicholas Flamel to have the stone if immortality was so awful? Even if Professor Quirrell conceptualized Dumbledore as being blind to the question... Professor Quirrell hadn't included a clause in the Confundus saying that Dumbledore's image of Aberforth wouldn't think of it. And all of this was ultimately a reflection of Professor Quirrell's own mind, an image from within the intelligence of Tom Riddle. Destroy it? Maybe. I am not sure it can be destroyed, or Master Flamel would have done it long since. I think many times he has regretted making it. Aberforth, I promised him, and we are not so ancient or so wise ourselves. The Philosopher's Stone must go back into the keeping of the one who made it. And Harry's breath stopped. The man was holding an irregular chunk of scarlet glass in his left hand the size perhaps of Harry's thumb from fingernail to the first joint. The sheen surface of the scarlet glass made it seem wet. 
the appearance was of blood suspended in time and made into a jagged surface. Thank you, my brother. Is that what the stone should look like? Does Professor Coral know what the true stone should look like? Will the mirror give back the real stone under these conditions, or make an imitation and return that? And then... No, Ariana, the man said, smiling gently. I fear I must go now. Be patient, my dearest. It will be soon enough that I join you in truth. Why? Why, I am not sure why I must go. When I hold the stone, I am to step aside from the mirror and wait for Master Flamel to contact me. But I am not sure why I need to step aside from the mirror to do that. <sighs> ah, I am getting old. It is well this dreadful war ended when it did. I suppose there is no harm if I speak to you for a time, my dearest, if you wish it so. A headache was starting behind Harry's eyes. Some part of Harry was trying to send a message about not having breathed in a while, but no one was listening. Imperfect. Professor Quirrell's confundus charm had been imperfect. Professor Quirrell's image of Dumbledore's image of Ariana wanted to talk to Dumbledore, and maybe didn't want to wait because Professor Quirrell knew on some level that there wasn't really an afterlife. And the previously implanted impulse to leave after getting the stone wasn't standing up to riddle Ariana's arguments. And then Harry felt himself become very calm. He started breathing again. Either way, there wasn't much Harry could do about it. Professor Quirrell had stopped Harry from intervening. Well, Professor Quirrell was welcome to reap the consequences of that decision. If the consequences caught Harry as well, so be it. The man who thought he was Dumbledore was mostly nodding patiently, sometimes replying to his dearest sister. Sometimes the man cast an uneasy look to one side as if feeling a strong impulse to go, but suppressing that impulse with the great patience and politeness and concern for his sister that Professor Quirrell imagined Albus Dumbledore having. Harry saw it the instant the confundus wore off and the man's expression changed, becoming again the face of Professor Quirrell. And in the same instant the mirror changed no longer showing Harry the reflection of the room, showing instead the form of the real Albus Dumbledore, as though he were standing just behind the mirror and visible through it. The real Dumbledore's face was set and grim. Hello, Tom, said Albus Dumbledore. End chapter 109 Chapter 110 Reflections, Part 2 The grimness on Albus Dumbledore's face lasted only an instant before giving way to bewilderment. Queerness, what? And then there was a pause. Well, I do feel stupid. I should hope so, Professor Quirrell said easily. If he had been at all shocked himself at being caught, it did not show. A casual wave of his hand changed his robes back to a professor's clothing. Dumbledore's grimness had returned and redoubled. There I am, searching so hard for Voldemort's shade, never noticing that the defense professor of Hogwarts is a sickly, half-dead victim, possessed by a spirit far more powerful than himself. I would call it senility, if so many others had not missed it as well. Quite. Professor Quirrell lifted his eyebrows. Really, am I that hard to recognize without the glowing red eyes? Oh, yes, indeed. Your acting was perfect. I confess myself utterly deceived. Quirinus Quirrell seemed... What is the term I am looking for? Ah, oh, yes, that is the word. He seemed sane. Professor Quirrell chuckled. <laughs> he looked for all the world as though the two of them were just having a casual conversation. 
I never was insane, you know. Lord Voldemort was just another game for me, the same as Professor Quirrell. Albus Dumbledore did not look like he was enjoying a casual chat. I thought you might say that. I regret to inform you, Tom, that anyone who can bring himself to act the part of Voldemort is Voldemort. Ah, said Professor Quirrell, raising an admonishing finger. There is a loophole in that reasoning, old man. Anyone who acts the part of Voldemort must be what moralists call evil. On this we agree. But perhaps the real me is completely, utterly, irredeemably evil in an interestingly different fashion from what I was pretending with Voldemort. I find that I do not care. Then you must think yourself to be rid of me very soon. How interesting. My immortal existence must depend on discovering what trap you have set, and finding a way to escape from it as soon as possible. But let us pointlessly delay to talk of other matters first. How did you come to be waiting inside the mirror? I thought you would be elsewhere. I am there, and also inside the mirror, unfortunately for you. I have always been here, all along. Ah. I suppose my little distraction was for naught, then. And the rage of Albus Dumbledore was no longer leashed. Distraction? Roared Dumbledore, his sapphire eyes tight with fury. You killed Master Flamel for a distraction? Professor Quirrell looked dismayed. I am wounded by the injustice of your accusation. I did not kill the one you know as Flamel. I simply commanded another to do so. How could you? Even you, how could you? He was the library of all of our lore. Secrets you have forever lost to wizardry. There was an edge to Professor Quirrell's smile now. You know, I still do not comprehend how your twisted mind can consider it acceptable for Flamel to be immortal. But when I try for the same, it makes me a monster. Master Flamel never descended into immortality. He, he only stayed awake past his evening for our sake, through his long, long day. I don't know if you recall this, but do you recall that day in your office with Tom Riddle? The one where I begged you, where I went down on my knees and begged you to introduce me to Nicholas Flamel so that I could ask to become his apprentice, to some day make for myself the Philosopher's Stone? That was my last attempt to be a good person, if you are curious. You told me no, and gave me a lecture on how unvirtuous it was to be afraid of death. I went from your office in bitterness and in fury. I reasoned that if I was to be called evil in any case, just for not wanting to die, then I might as well be evil. And one month later, I killed Abigail Myrtle to pursue immortality by other means. Even when I knew more of Flamel, I remained quite put out by your hypocrisy, and for that reason I tormented you and yours more than I otherwise would have done. I have often felt that you ought to know this, but we never had a chance to talk frankly. I decline, said Albus Dumbledore, whose gaze did not waver. I do not accept the teeniest shred of responsibility for what you have become. That was all, entirely, you and your own decisions. I am not surprised to hear you say that. Well... Now I am curious as to what responsibilities you do accept. You have access to some unusual power of divination. That much I deduced long ago. You made too many nonsensical moves, and the paths by which they worked out in your favor were too ridiculous. So tell me, were you forewarned of the result that night of All Hallows' Eve when I was vanquished for a time? I knew said Albus Dumbledore, his voice low and cold. For that I accept responsibility, which is something you will never understand. 
you arranged for Severus Snape to hear the prophecy that he brought to me. I allowed it to happen. And there I was, all excited at having finally gained my own foreknowledge. Professor Quirrell shook his head as though in sadness. So the great hero Dumbledore sacrificed his unwitting pawns, Lily and James Potter, merely to banish me for a few years. Albus Dumbledore's eyes were like stones. James and Lily would have gone willingly to their death if they had known. And the little baby. Somehow I doubt the Potters would have been so eager to leave him in the path of you-know-who. You could scarcely see the flinch. The boy who lived came out of it well enough. Tried to turn him into you, did you? Instead, you turned yourself into a corpse, and Harry Potter became the wizard you should have been. Now there was something like the usual Dumbledore behind the half-moon glasses, a tiny twinkle in those eyes. All of Tom Riddle's icy brilliance tamed to the service of James and Lily's warmth and love. I wonder how you felt when you saw what Tom Riddle could have become if he had grown up in a loving family. Professor Quirrell's lips quirked. I was surprised, even shocked, by the abyssal depths of Mr. Potter's naivete. I suppose the humor of the situation would be lost on you. It was then, finally, that Albus Dumbledore smiled. How I laughed when I realized it, when I saw you had made a good Voldemort to oppose the evil one. Ah, how I laughed! I never had the steel for my role, but Harry Potter shall be more than equal to it when he comes into his power. Albus Dumbledore's smile disappeared. Though I suppose Harry shall have to find some other Dark Lord to vanquish for it, since you will not be there. Ah, yes. That. Professor Quirrell made to walk away from the mirror, and seemed to halt just before reaching the point where the mirror would no longer have reflected him, if it had been reflecting him. Interesting. Dumbledore's smile was colder, now. No, Tom. You are not going anywhere. Professor Quirrell nodded. What have you done, exactly? You have refused death, and if I destroyed your body, your spirit would only wander back, like a dumb animal that cannot understand its being sent away. So I am sending you outside time, to a frozen instant from which neither I nor any other can return you. Perhaps Harry Potter will be able to retrieve you some day, if prophecy speaks true. He may wish to discuss with you just who is at fault for the death of his parents. For you it will only be an instant, if you ever return at all. Either way, Tom, I wish you the best of it. Hmm. The defense professor had paced past where Harry stood, watching Mute with something like horror, only to halt again at the other edge of the mirror. As I suspected. You are using Merlin's old method of sealing, what the tale of Topharius Chang names as the process of the timeless. If legend speaks true, not even you can stop the process, now that it has been in motion this long. Indeed. But Albus's eyes were suddenly wary, and Harry, from where he stood just before and to the right of the door, waiting in silence and controlled terror, could feel it in the air. He could feel the sense of a presence gathering within the mirror's field. Something more alien than magic. Everything about it incomprehensible, except for the fact of its strangeness and the fact of its power. It had been slow, but now it was waxing faster, that presence. But you could still reverse the effect if Chang's account is true. Most powers of the mirror are double-sided, according to legend. So you could banish what is on the other side of the mirror instead. Send yourself, instead of me, into that frozen instant. If you wanted to, that is. And why would I do that? I suppose you are going to tell me that you have taken hostages? 
That was futile, Tom. You fool. You utter fool. You should have known that I would give you nothing for any hostages you had taken. You were always one step too slow. Allow me to introduce you to my hostage. Another presence invaded the air around Harry, a crawling sensation all over his flesh as another Tom Riddle's magic passed very close to his skin. The cloak of invisibility was torn away from him, and the shimmering black cloak flew from him through the air. Professor Quirrell caught it and swiftly drew it over himself. In less than a second, he had pulled down the cloak's hood over his head and disappeared. Albus Dumbledore staggered, as though some essential support had been removed from him. Harry Potter, what are you doing here? Harry stared at the image of Albus Dumbledore, on whose face utter shock and utter dismay were warring. The guilt and the shame were too much, too much, hitting Harry all at once, and he could feel the incomprehensible presence around him rising to a peak. Harry knew without words that there was no time left, and that he was done. It's my fault, Harry said in a tiny voice, from whatever part of him had taken over his throat in the final extremity. I was stupid. I've always been stupid. You mustn't rescue me. Goodbye. Why, look at that, sang out Professor Curl's voice from the empty air. I don't seem to have a reflection anymore. No, 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 no! Into the hand of Albus Dumbledore flew from his sleeve his long, dark gray wand, and in his other hand, as though from nowhere, appeared a short rod of dark stone. Albus Dumbledore threw these both violently aside, just as the building sense of power rose to an unbearable peak, and then disappeared. The mirror returned to showing the ordinary reflection of a gold-lit room of white stone, without any trace of where Albus Dumbledore had been. End Chapter 110 Chapter 111 Failure, Part 1 The Dark Lord was laughing. From the empty air came the voice of the defense professor, laughing wildly, so high and terrible his laughter. It was Voldemort's laughter now, the Dark Lord's laughter beyond all hiding or restraint. Harry's mind was disarrayed. His eyes kept staring at where Albus Dumbledore had been. There was a horror in him that was too huge for understanding or reflection. His mind kept trying to fall back through time and undo reality, but that wasn't a sort of magic that existed, and reality stayed the same. He had lost. He had lost Dumbledore. There were no takebacks, and that meant he had lost the war. And the Dark Lord went on laughing. <laughs> Professor Dumbledore! Ah, oh, Professor Dumbledore, such a fitting end to our game. <laughs> the wrong sacrifice, even at the finish, for the piece you gave up everything to save was already in my possession. The wrong trap, even from the beginning, for I could have abandoned this body at any time. <laughs> You never did learn cunning, you poor old fool. You... A voice was coming from Harry's throat. You... <laughs> Why, yes, little child. You were always along on this adventure as my hostage. It was your whole purpose in being here. <laughs> you are decades too young to play this game against the real Tom Riddle, child. The Dark Lord drew back the hood of the cloak, his head becoming visible, and began to remove the rest of the cloak. And now, boy, you have helped me. Yes, indeed. And so it is time to resurrect your girl child friend to keep promise. The Dark Lord's smile was cold, cold indeed. I suppose you have doubts. 
Mark well, I could kill you this instant, for there is no longer a headmaster of Hogwarts to be informed of it. Doubt me all you wish, but remember that. The hand was once more holding the gun. Now come along, foolish child. And they left. They went back out through the door into the potions room, the Dark Lord banishing the returned purple fire with a stroke of his wand. They went through the chamber where the Bogart had been, and the chamber of ruined chest statues, and through the burned door of the chamber of keys. The Dark Lord floated up through the trap door, and Harry struggled up afterward through the spiral staircase of leaves, the tendrils of the Devil's Snare twitching and then moving back as though afraid. The boy who lived was trying hard not to burst into tears, and his dark side patterns weren't helping, maybe because Voldemort had never known or dealt with guilt. They passed the huge, three-headed Inferi, and at a whispered word from the Dark Lord, it collapsed over the trap door and became a corpse again. They passed Severus Snape standing guard, who told them both that he was guarding the door and that they must leave or he would deduct house points. The Dark Lord spoke the words, Hyakuju Montauk, without pausing in his stride, accompanied by a jab of his wand and Severus staggered before he lifelessly drew himself up beside the door once more. What? What did you... Just fulfilling my obligation to my faithful servant. It shall not kill him, as I promised you. <laughs> the hostages... It was hard to keep his voice steady. The students... You said you would stop whatever is going to kill them. Yes. Stop worrying. We'll do on our way out. Out? We are leaving, child. The Dark Lord was still smiling. The bad feeling this raised was lost in a sea of other bad feelings. The Dark Lord was now consulting what he'd called the Hogwarts map, the handwritten lines upon it seeming to move as they walked. Some part of Harry's mind that had been considering what to do if they ran into Aurors on patrol, whom the Dark Lord could kill or obliviate in an instant, gave up that hope as well. They went down the grand staircase to the second floor, encountering no one. The Dark Lord made a turn Harry did not know and went down another stair flight. As they descended past one floor and another, the window stopped and the torches began. They were within the Slytherin dungeons now. Ahead, the form of a person in Hogwarts robes appeared. A sixth or seventh year Slytherin was waiting by a section of wall that was set with an artistic carving of Salazar Slytherin wielding his wand against what looked like a giant covered in icicles. The witch made no comment at seeing Professor Quirrell walking upright, or seeing Harry in his company, or seeing the gun in the defense professor's hand. If her eyes were blank, Harry couldn't tell the difference. The Dark Lord reached into his robes, took out a knut, and flipped it to her. Claudia Alicia Tabor, I command you thus. Take this knut to the spell circle I showed you beneath the Quidditch stands and put it in the center. Then obliviate yourself of the last six hours. Yes, my lord. The witch said, bowing to him, and went on her way. I thought... I thought you needed the stone to... The Dark Lord was still smiling. He had never stopped smiling. I did not say that part in Parseltongue, child. All I said in Parseltongue was that I had set events in motion to kill students. Events that I would stop if I obtained the stone. The rest was in human speech. I would have also stopped the blood fort sacrifice if I had not obtained the stone, so long as I was not discovered and restrained. The students of Hogwarts are a valuable resource, whom I have already spent much time training. Then the Dark Lord hissed to the wall, Open! Harry's eyes saw the tiny snake that had been set in the upper left of the carving, even as the wall slowly swung backward, revealing the opening of a huge pipe. Moss grew on its sides, and a musty, dusty smell welled up from it. The interior was also covered with cobwebs in multiple sheets. Spiders. <sighs> he sighed, and for that brief moment he sounded once more like Professor Quirrell. The Dark Lord walked into the huge pipe, the cobwebs burning away before him. 
Harry, not seeing any better options, followed. The pipe branched in a Y shape, then branched again. The Dark Lord went left, then right. The pipe came to a solid metal wall. Open! The Dark Lord hissed, and a crack appeared in the metal. It seemed to fold into itself. Beyond was the middle of a long stone tunnel. We shall be walking a while. Did you have more questions to ask, little child? I... I can't think of any right now. Another cold <laughs> laugh replied to this, and they walked into the tunnel, turning right. Harry didn't know, then or ever, how long he walked. The light of burning spiderwebs was too dim to read his mechanical watch, and Harry had not thought to look at the time before entering. It felt like they walked for miles, miles beneath the ground. Slowly, Harry's mind tried to recover itself a final time. Very possibly final, if he was right about the Dark Lord killing him after this. Though the Dark Lord had said that he would resurrect Hermione, which seemed pointless if that was true. Was that simply the Dark Lord following through on a promise he would not otherwise have been able to make in Parseltongue? Why had he not just shot Harry on the spot? Seriously, some last functioning part of his brain said to all the other parts. This would be a good time to think of something. Something that the Dark Lord has not already thought of. Something we can do without our pouch or our wand or our time turner. Something that Professor Quirrell has not imagined we can do. Think. Think. Pretty, pretty, please think of something. Don't just shut down now. Even if you're scared. Even if we've never really, really faced death before, in the sense of being about to die in the next hour, this is not the time to shut down. Harry's mind stayed blank. Suppose, said that last remaining part, suppose we try to condition on the fact that we win this, or at least get out of this alive. If someone told you as a fact that you had survived, or even one, somehow made everything turn out okay. What would you think had happened? Not legitimate procedure, whispered Ravenclaw. The universe doesn't work like that. We're just going to die. Someone realizes we're missing, thought Hufflepuff. And Mad-Eye Moody shows up with a squad of horrors and rescues us. I think the time has come to admit we're not more competent than the standard authorities. The saving factor does have to be something we do somehow, said the last voice. Otherwise, there's no point in our thinking about it. Problem two, said Gryffindor. Harry Potter isn't missing. He's right there at the Quidditch match where everyone can see him. Professor Quirrell thought of that too. It's part of why he sent that fake note. Problem three, I don't think Mad-Eye Moody and an Oro Squad can beat the Dark Lord, and certainly not before he kills us. I'm not sure the entire DMLE can beat the Dark Lord if he's fighting seriously and Dumbledore is gone. Problem four, the Quidditch match was not disrupted. That's probably the only reason why Professor Quirrell was willing to try something as complicated as bringing us along on this trip in the first place. Thinking along different lines, ventured Slytherin, maybe Professor Quirrell calls in someone else to memory charm us. Legilimency, Imperius, Confundus, who knows what else. We're not a perfect Occlumens. Then the Dark Lord would have a smart, well, sort of smart lieutenant that he could use. That could be another reason why Professor Quirrell was so willing to tell us secrets if he knew that the memory would disappear. It's also a reason to leave the Hogwarts wards, so the Dark Lord can call Bellatrix to apparate in and do the work. This entire reasoning process is illegitimate, and I refuse to participate, said Ravenclaw. What lovely last words, said the last voice. Now shut up and think. Rough Stone Tunnel went by underfoot. Harry's shoes sometimes dipping into moisture or nearly slipping on a curved surface. 
the neurons in his brain, which kept on firing, imagined voices talking to each other, yelling at each other, even as the listener stayed numb with horror and shame. Gryffindor and Hufflepuff were conducting a debate about suicide by charging the Dark Lord's gun, or by swallowing the little jewel on Harry's steel ring. It seemed unclear whether the fate of the world was better or worse if the Dark Lord had Harry as a mind slave. If the Dark Lord was going to win anyway, it might be better if he won faster. And the last voice kept talking through it all. Even in the depths of failure, that last voice remained. What else did the Dark Lord always say in human speech and never in parcel tongue? Do we remember anything like that? Anything at all? It was all too distant in time. Too distant in time, even though it had all happened this very day. The Dark Lord had told him in parcel tongue just now that it was time to revive Hermione. And then he'd said other things all in English Harry could hardly remember for all that they'd just been spoken. Before then, there'd been the circle of concealment when Professor Quirrell had hissed that the barrier would explode if touched and the defense professor had said in English for Harry not to take off his cloak or try crossing the circle, said in English that the resonance might strike Professor Quirrell afterwards, but Harry would be dead, said in English that if Harry touched the magic and Professor Quirrell didn't remember how to halt the resonance, it would kill them both. Suppose it doesn't kill us both, said the last voice. On Halloween, in Godric's Hollow, the Dark Lord's body was burned, and we only ended up with a scar on our forehead. Suppose the resonance between us is deadlier to the Dark Lord than to us. What if this entire time we've been able to kill the Dark Lord at any time, just by dashing forward and touching our hands to any part of his exposed skin? And then it makes our scar bleed again, but that's all. The sense of stop, don't do that, is inherited from the Dark Lord's worst memory of his mistake in Godric's Hollow. It may not actually apply to the boy who lived. A small note of hope rose, rose, and was quashed. The Dark Lord can just throw away his wand, droned Ravenclaw. Professor Quirrell can turn into his animagus form. Even if he dies, the Dark Lord will possess someone else and return, and then torture our parents to punish us. We might be able to get to our parents in time, said the last voice. We might be able to hide them. We might be able to get the Philosopher's Stone away from the Dark Lord if we killed his current body now, and that stone could provide the nucleus of a counter-army. The Dark Lord was moving on through the stony corridor. His hand still held the gun. He was at least four meters away from Harry. If we dart forward, he will sense us approaching through the resonance, said Hufflepuff. He will fly forward rapidly. He can do that. He has the broomstick enchantments that let him fly. He will fly forward, turn around, and fire the gun. He knows about the resonance. He's thought of this already. This is not something the Dark Lord has failed to consider. He will be ready for it, and waiting. Continuing the same line of argument, said the last voice. Suppose we can freely cast magic on Professor Quirrell, but he can't cast it on us. Why would that be true? demanded Ravenclaw. In fact, we have evidence that it's false. In Azkaban, when Professor Quirrell's Avada Kedavra hit our Patronus charm, it felt like our head was splitting apart. Suppose that was all his magic going out of control. Suppose if we just cast, say, a Luminos targeting him, nothing bad would have happened. But why? said Ravenclaw. Why suppose that? Because, thought Harry. It explains why Professor Quirrell didn't warn me not to cast any magic on him in Azkaban. Because Professor Quirrell never said in Parseltongue that I can remember that I'd hurt myself if I tried to cast magic on him. He could have given me that warning, but he didn't, even though he gave me a lot of other warnings. Absence of evidence is weak evidence of absence. 
There was a pause while Harry Potter's parts considered this. We don't actually have our wand, said Ravenclaw. We might get it back at some point, thought the last voice. But even then, Harry thought, and the grey hopelessness returned. The resonance is something the Dark Lord knows about. He's already thought of everything I can do with that. He already has a response prepared. That was my mistake from the beginning. I didn't respect the Dark Lord's intelligence. I didn't think that maybe he knew everything I knew and could see everything I saw and had already taken it into account. Then, said the last voice, conditional on our winning, we must have hit him with something he doesn't know about. Dementors, offered Gryffindor. The Dark Lord knows we can destroy, deflect, and possibly control Dementors, said Ravenclaw. He doesn't know how, but he knows we have the capability, and where the heck would we get a Dementor anyway? Maybe, ventured Hufflepuff. The Dark Lord's whole Horcrux system would short out via the Resonance if we grabbed him and held him, sacrificing our own life to destroy him forever. Bull hockey, said Ravenclaw. But I guess it doesn't hurt to engage in some pleasant fantasy before we die, no matter how stupid. If Lord Voldemort had a strong enough fear of death, Hufflepuff argued, if he wanted strongly enough to just not need to think about death again, then the Horcrux system could have design flaws like that. It never occurred to Voldemort to test his Horcruxes on someone else. That could indicate he wasn't able to think about the subject clearly. So his fear of death is his fatal weakness? Said Ravenclaw. Yeah, no. I'm thinking someone with over a hundred Horcruxes might have a few failsafe mechanisms in there. And Harry's brain went on thinking. A genuine asymmetry in the magical resonances between them seemed improbable. There was no reason for the magical effect to work like that. But the magical backlash could hit the stronger wizard harder, the more powerful magic resonating more dangerously. That could explain the observed event in Godric's Hollow. Voldemort explodes, Baby survives and also explained the observed event in Azkaban. Voldemort severely impaired by backlash of his strong magic. First year boy who lived hit by lighter backlash of his weak magic. Or if it was only the caster's magic that resonated, that could also explain both those two observations. That might even explain why Professor Quirrell had been in no rush to warn Harry about casting any magic on him. Though there was another obvious reason why Professor Quirrell would avoid raising the subject of the Resonance. It was a gigantic hint about the mystery of Godric's Hollow, if Harry ever made the connection. The part that was numb with grief and guilt took this opportunity to observe, speaking of obliviousness, that after events in Hogwarts had turned serious, they really, 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 really should have reconsidered the decision made on first Thursday at the behest of Professor McGonagall not to tell Dumbledore about the sense of doom that Harry got around Professor Quirrell. It was true that Harry hadn't been sure who to trust. There was a long stretch where it had seemed plausible that Dumbledore was the bad guy and Professor Quirrell was the heroic opposition. But Dumbledore would have realized... Dumbledore would have realized instantly. The wise old wizard with the true phoenix on his shoulder would have known, and Harry hadn't trusted him. Harry hadn't told him all the relevant facts. And the reason for this had been sheer neglect to reconsider a cashed decision made four days into the start of the school year. It had been marked something not to tell Dumbledore, and even after Azkaban, even after Hermione died, even after everything, Harry had simply forgot to promote the question to deliberation and reconsider the trade-off. Another wave of grief and shame washed over Harry, and for a time he walked on in the silence of the last voice, other voices being happy enough to fill the gap. 
After what was at least several miles and many gray thoughts, the stone tunnel ended. The Dark Lord climbed up stone steps and Harry followed after. The two of them came into a dark, dank stone building. Dirty, old stone doors swung open without being touched. Before them lay marble slabs rising up from bare ground. Upon them, names and dates. The tombstones were scattered in nothing like neat rows, and the rest of the graveyard ran wild. The moon above was over three quarters full, already seeming bright with the night not fully fallen. Harry had stopped walking upon seeing the graveyard. There was a blaring alarm in his brain, saying to be anywhere other than here. But there wasn't any options for accomplishing that, so the alarm cried unanswered, even as behind Harry the stone doors of the mausoleum swung shut again and sealed themselves. The Dark Lord came into the center of the scattered graveyard. He stopped walking and waved his wand above his head in a small circle. There was a rumbling sound, and smoothly from the ground rose an altar, at least two meters wide and of black stone, carved with gray sigils. And then, surrounding the altar, groaned up six dark marble obelisks, regularly spaced, gleaming darkly beneath the fading twilight sky. The unanswerable alarm in Harry's brain grew louder. This is a workspace I made for myself, convenient to either Hogwarts or Hogsmeade. The Dark Lord flourished a hand at the altar. That is where Miss Granger shall revive, and also where I shall be reborn into my true body. I shall remake myself first, of course. Magics to revive girl child Easier with true body. A strange, snakish laughter accompanied these words. Rest assured that though some aspects of girl child's resurrection shall be what others consider dark, girl child will not be harmed or made ugly by it, shall still look like herself. Mind shall be her own nor shall I or mine harm her after. Harry's tongue was dry, and his mind was having trouble functioning. Please, Professor, would you say in parcel tongue what is your real purpose in resurrecting Miss Granger? To restore to you, girl-child friends, counsel, and restraint. To make sure she is part of the world for you to care about. That, boy, is truly the greater part of the reason I am doing this deed. Again, snakish laughter accompanied these words, conveying sardonic awareness of some vast irony. A small spark of hope kindled inside Harry, alongside the much greater note of confusion, and the fear that a perfect occlumens could indeed lie in parcel tongue. Harry didn't understand why the Dark Lord was doing this, if the next step was just to kill the boy who lived, or enslave him. Maybe he'd just never understood Professor Quirrell at all. Maybe somehow Harry's model of Tom Riddle was just that wrong. Maybe the boy who lived would be obliviated of the last day and dropped off somewhere with a confused Hermione Granger while Lord Voldemort went on to conquer the world. Hope flared up in Harry, but it was a confused hope that didn't make any sense. It didn't square with the Dark Lord who had mocked Dumbledore and laughed at his defeat. Harry couldn't come up with any consistent account of Professor Quirrell's motives that allowed for something like this. I do not know what is meant to happen next. The Dark Lord had moved forward to the altar. He knelt there and seemed to reach deep into the stone of the altar itself, drawing forth a vial of liquid that looked black in the fading twilight. When the Dark Lord spoke again, his voice was clipped and precise. Blood, 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 so wisely hidden and the obelisks surrounding the altar began to speak, voices like a chanting chorus coming from the motionless stones, cadences older than Latin. 
Apocatatesi, 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 the sin of you are void. Apocatatesi, 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 the sin of you are void. The obelisk's chant echoed after the end of each line, as if they were speaking out of synchrony with each other. The blood was poured from the vial, and it seemed to catch and hang over the altar, slowly expanding through the air, taking on a shape. A tall form rested upon the altar, and even in the dimming twilight, it looked too pale. The defense professor reached his hand into his robe and drew forth a small irregular chunk of red glass. He placed that upon the tall, pale body. The stone stayed there for a time, minutes at least. The irregular chunk of red glass did not glow, or flash, or give any other indications of power. Then the stone moved, just a little, turning slightly upon the body. The defense professor took back the stone into his robes and prodded the tall form that lay motionless upon the altar, touching the eyes with his fingers, poking the chest with his wand. He threw back his head then and laughed. <laughs> Incredible! Fixed. It is fixed in form. A mere construct sustained by magic become a true substance at the stone's touch. And yet I sensed nothing, nothing. I feared I had been deceived, that I had obtained a false stone, but the substance proves true to my every test. The defense professor tucked the red glass back into his robes. That is eldritch even by my standards, I admit. Then the defense professor walked around the altar. Five times he walked around it, chanting something too low for Harry to hear. He placed his hands, both of them, over the body's forehead. Then the Dark Lord spoke. Fall. Tor. Pawn. Without any warning, there was a flash like lightning that lit up the entire graveyard, and Harry staggered back a step, his hands involuntarily going to his forehead. It felt as if he had been shot there, or a wasp stung him upon his scar. The defense professor collapsed. And the too tall figure sat up upon the altar. It swung around smoothly and stood tall upon the ground, at least a head higher than a normal man. The form's limbs were lean and pale, little muscled but giving an impression of terrible strength. Harry took another staggering step back, his hands still clasped to his scar. Though the distance between them was wide, Harry felt a sense of terrifying apprehension in the air, as though the sense of doom had always been out of focus, and had now clarified, concentrated into a physical pain in the scar on Harry's forehead. Was that what Voldemort was supposed to look like? The nose looked like... It looked like it had malfunctioned during the resurrection process. The too tall figure threw back his head and laughed, <laughs> raising his hands and wand to look at them. The left hand opened wide, and it was like a pale half-spider with four overlong legs, fingers caressing the wand held in the other hand. Leaves stirred up from the graveyard, approaching to dance around the too tall figure, surrounding him and clothing him, reforming into a high-necked shirt and flowing robes. And Lord Voldemort was laughing. Exactly the mirthless laughter that Harry remembered coming from his own throat inside the Dementor's nightmare, precise in tone and timbre. Red eyes gleamed beneath the fading twilight, their pupils slitted like a cat's. The form that Voldemort had abandoned raised itself, quivering from the ground, and in a voice that Harry could barely hear, Quirinus Quirrell gasped, Free! Oh, free! Stupefy! said the high, cold voice of Voldemort, and Quirinus Quirrell was blasted down into the ground. Then, with a wave of Voldemort's other hand, Quirinus Quirrell was picked up and flung away from the altar. 
Voldemort walked away from the altar, then turned and looked at Harry, and the pain in Harry's scar flared at it. Frightened child! Voldemort hissed, like there was an undercurrent of parcel tongue, even to the Dark Lord's human speech. Good. Place the girl on the altar and break your transfiguration. It's time for me to revive her. Is this really going to happen? Are we really going to do this? Harry swallowed, mastering his fear through the note of impossible hope amid the confusion, and walked over to the altar. Then Harry took off his left shoe and his left sock and took off the toe ring that was Hermione Granger, the transfigured shape identical to the toe ring that had been given Harry as an emergency port key. There was a twinge of regret in Harry for not having the real port key now, but only a twinge. An inner circle Death Eater would routinely put up boundaries against port keys if Severus had been right. Behind Harry, Voldemort laughed again in what sounded like surprised appreciation. I need my wand to finite her. You do not. You learn to sustain a transfiguration by touch alone without further use of the wand. You can likewise break your own transfiguration wandlessly by commanding your sustaining magic to drain away. Do so now. Harry swallowed and touched the toe ring. He had to try three times and clear his mind before he could push his magic out of the toe ring, as before he had learned to make a tiny stream of magic flow in. The breaking of the spell went much more slowly that way than a finite incantatum, almost like the sped-up reverse of watching something being transfigured. The toe ring distorted, flowing together, expanding. Colors changed, textures changed. Two-thirds of a dead girl lay strewn across the altar, on her side with one arm falling off the altar's edge, the position in which the reversion had chanced to place her. No blood flowed now from the chewed stumps of her thighs. The dead girl wore Hermione Granger's face, but twisted and pale. It was as Harry had seen before in the hospital's back room, the image burned into his brain during thirty long minutes of transfiguration, the image he had reproduced during four even longer hours to transfigure the decoy. The dead girl was naked, for her clothes were not part of her and had not been transfigured. The sight brought back flashbacks of the hours spent in the infirmary room, of the nightmares afterward, all of which Harry suppressed. Go back! This is my work now. Harry swallowed and retreated from the altar to the mouth of the long corridor where he'd stood before. Her body is, should be, around five Celsius. I cooled her so, so there wouldn't be brain damage. Is he really going to do this? Really? There had to be a catch, and Harry just couldn't see it. Voldemort had said that neither he nor any of his would harm Hermione, that her body and mind would be her own. Why? Voldemort walked forth to the altar once more, orienting the body before him with a wave of his hand to lie straight across the altar. The Dark Lord spoke with high, monotone precision. Flesh, 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 so wisely hidden. The obelisks began chanting once more. New flesh flowed out of the stumps of the girl's thighs, creeping forward like an ooze and solidifying. The obelisks ceased chanting. A complete form lay naked upon the altar. It didn't look like Hermione. A Hermione Granger should be standing up and talking. She should have her Hogwarts uniform. Voldemort raised a hand, then hissed as though in annoyance. With a violent gesture, the robes around Quirinus Quirrell's sleeping form were torn in half. His purple and green tie shredded, and his suit jacket drawn from him to where Voldemort stood. Some part of Harry flinched, as if seeing the Dark Lord Voldemort attacking Professor Quirrell. Voldemort plunged his hand deliberately into the suit jacket, which jerked as though something were being broken. Then Voldemort shook out the suit jacket onto the ground beside him, emptying out the contents. 
Harry's pouch fell from it, and his time-turner, and a broomstick, and Voldemort's gun, and the cloak, and a number of amulets and rings and stranger devices that Harry did not recognize, and finally a chunk of red glass, which was laid upon Hermione Granger's form and allowed to stay there for a time. Minutes passed. The Dark Lord donned an amulet from the heap of things beside the altar. Also from the heap, Voldemort took four short wooden rods with straps upon them and reached beneath his robes to attach them. It looked like they went on his upper arms and upper thighs. The Dark Lord rose into the air, moved left, right, up and down, seeming to wobble slightly at first. Then his flight stabilized. The chunk of red glass turned, slightly. The Dark Lord Voldemort floated to the ground and prodded Hermione Granger's body with his wand. There is an obstacle. In Harry's mind, the expectation of betrayal or other failure had already been so strong that the confirmation came only as a dull shock, not a sharp one. What obstacle? Girl's body is restored. Substance is repaired but not magic or life. This is body of dead muggle. Voldemort turned from the altar, began to pace. The full ritual would solve this, but that would require time. Time in the blood of Granger's enemy, and I do not think Draco Malfoy still qualifies, nor can I take my own blood unwillingly. Foolish. Foolish, I should have foreseen this and prepared. A brain might awaken with an electrical shock. I know that much of muggle medicine, but would her magic return to her? That I do not know. And I suspect if she awakens as a muggle, she will be a muggle forever. Still, I can think of nothing better. The Dark Lord raised his wand. Wait! Harry blurted, feeling hope return. She needs a spark of life and magic. Just a spark to get her started. Voldemort turned and looked at him. The snake-like face showed some slight degree of surprise. Think I have something that might work. Needs wand. Have no intentions to use it against you. Harry said nothing about expecting his intentions wouldn't change. He'd simply blurted out the idea fast enough that he hadn't formed any specific intentions yet. This... I desire to see. The Dark Lord reached into the heap of things by the altar and picked up the wrapped form of Harry's wand. It was thrown, gliding through the air and then dropping at Harry's feet. And then the Dark Lord floated back, the heap of things moving smoothly backwards with him. Harry unwrapped his wand and moved forward. We have our wand back. That's step one, said the last voice, the voice of hope. No part of Harry had any idea what step two might be, but it was still step one accomplished. And Harry stood before the reformed body of Hermione Granger, who was still naked and dead, on a twilight-lit stone altar. Lord Voldemort, I beg you, please give her some clothes. It might help me do this. Granted. The pain in Harry's scar flared as the naked girl's body lifted into the air then flared again as dead leaves danced around her and she was clothed in the seeming of a Hogwarts uniform, though the trim was red instead of blue. Hermione Granger's hands folded over her chest, her legs straightened, and her body drifted back down. Harry looked at her, focused on her, now that she looked human again. She looks like she's sleeping, not dead. It took a conscious effort to look for breathing, fail to see it, and make the deduction. So far as naked perception was concerned, Hermione might as well be alive right now. That Hermione Granger would not approve of this situation, taken as a whole, seemed beyond question. But it didn't mean that she would rather stay dead than be alive, other things being equal, though they might not be. Because you wish to live. Because my best guess is that you would wish to live. Harry reached out his shaking left hand and touched Hermione's forehead. It was warm now, 
not the chill of five degrees Celsius. Either Voldemort had increased her body temperature to normal, or the magic of the ritual had done it automatically, which meant that Hermione's brain was currently warm and without oxygen, come to think of it. That did it, the sense of urgency rising in him. Harry's feet assumed the stance, his wand swung up to point at Hermione Granger's dead body. The only thing wrong with Hermione's body was that it was dead. Everything else about that body was right. Only one thing needed changing. You don't belong here, Death. Expecto! Harry shouted, feeling the magic and the life rise up into the Patronus charm that was fueled by both. Patronum! The girl in the Hogwarts uniform was surrounded by a blazing aura of silver fire as the Patronus was born inside her. Harry staggered as he felt a dip, a bite. Intuition, or Tom Riddle's memory, told Harry that the life and magic that had just flowed into Hermione would never return to him, either one. It hadn't been all his life or all his magic, not by a long shot. There hadn't been time to expend that much. But whatever he'd just expended was gone forever. And Hermione Granger was breathing, just like she was sleeping, rhythmic inhalations and exhalations. The twilight sky had dimmed further, and Harry could not see if color was returning to her. But it should have been. It certainly should have been. She looked to be sleeping peacefully, and it wasn't because being dead looked like sleeping. It was because she was asleep, and her body was fine, and nothing was hurting her while she slept. Some part of Harry, that had somehow managed not to speak up earlier, quietly pointed out that they were still in a graveyard, the recently victorious Lord Voldemort was still in control of the situation, and that his guess about Hermione wanting to be alive was just a guess. Harry was still smiling as he slowly lowered his wand. The celebratory fireworks going off inside his mind were restrained. Harry wasn't screaming and running around in little circles like Professor Flitwick. But that... That... Harry said aloud inside his mind. That is what I call step two. Interesting. Your Patronus draws upon your life as well as your magic. I guessed that much, for it was too powerful for a first year to fuel with magic alone. And yet, there must be more to the puzzle, since not just any light-fueled spell would have done. Was your happy thought the image of her returning to life? Was that all it took? Voldemort was again toying with his wand, a dark interest in those red-slitted eyes. I suspect I will feel quite stupid when I finally comprehend that spell some day in my eternity. Now step away from the girl. There is small work I intend to do to give her best chance of continued life. Harry stepped back reluctantly, the sense of tension starting to return to him. He almost tripped over one haphazard grave marker as the Dark Lord continued to walk forward. Standing before the altar, the Dark Lord laid one finger upon Hermione Granger's forehead. Then the Dark Lord tapped his finger upon Hermione Granger's forehead and said, in a voice so low Harry almost did not hear, Resquiescus. Voldemort waved his hand at an obelisk, which began to rotate, turning itself to lay flat upon the ground, pointing outward. Fascinating indeed. She is alive and magical, and not another Tom Riddle as I feared you might have made her. The tension was rising again in Harry. He'd put his wand away into the back belt of his pants. He did not want to remind Voldemort that he still had the wand on him. What are you doing to her now? Another obelisk turned, lay flat upon the ground. There is old lost ritual to sacrifice magical creature, transfer magical nature to subject. Limitations are great. Transfer is temporary. Only few hours. Subject sometimes dies 
when transfer wears off, but stone will make permanent. Four obelisks lay flat upon the ground, evenly spaced. The other two obelisks had been floated away. Voldemort began to reach into his own mouth, checked himself, hissed with annoyance again. <sighs> he gestured at the sleeping mouth of Quirinus Quirrell, and from Quirrell's mouth floated up two teeth, almost invisible in the falling night. One of these went to the pile of items, the other floated up to before the altar. Moments later, Harry cried out and hey! took a step back. Huge and misshapen, lumpy skin, legs as thick as tree trunks, a small head that looked like a coconut perched upon a boulder. A mountain troll stood within the circle of obelisks, motionless as though asleep while standing. What are you doing? Voldemort's mouth was stretched in a wide smile. It looked horrible on him, like his face had too many teeth. Shall sacrifice my fallback weapon, and girl child shall gain troll's power of regeneration. Transfiguration sickness is nothing before that, if perchance it was not fixed by previous ritual. And no knife shall slay girl child, nor cutting curse, nor sickness take her. Why, why are you doing this? Have not tiniest intention of letting girl child die again after going to such lengths to resurrect her. Harry swallowed. I'm very confused. Was Voldemort practicing being nice? This hypothesis did not seem like a sufficient explanation. Stay well back. This ritual is darker than the last. The Dark Lord began a new chant, softer syllables that seemed to see through the air like living things. And Harry, feeling a new surge of apprehension, stepped backwards. Then Harry cried aloud as pain flared again through his scar. The mountain troll crumbled in on itself, becoming ashes hanging in the air, then dust. And then the dust seemed to blow away without going anywhere. It was gone. Hermione Granger slept on peacefully, whatever spell of repose Voldemort had cast on her being sufficient to the task. Um, did it work? Defendo. Harry stepped forward with a choked yell, no! and then halted, both as the stupidity of his motion caught up with him, and as the sudden cut that the severing charm had opened on Hermione's leg closed almost as quickly as it had been made. In seconds, there was only a light stain of blood on the surrounding flesh. The stone was laid again on Hermione, and after a time, it turned. Voldemort laughed once more as he passed his hand over her. Marvelous. Then another tiny tooth was floating within the circle of obelisks, and an instant later, a unicorn stood where the troll had stood before, eyes dull and head bowed. What? Why a unicorn? Power of unicorn's blood to preserve life makes excellent combination with troll's healing. Only fiend fire and killing curse shall girl child fear from this day. A flicker of snakish laughter. Besides, had a spare unicorn left over, might as well use. Unicorn's blood has side effects. That is only when power of unicorn's blood is stolen by another. This spell will make power of unicorn belong inside girl child, as if she was always born that way. The grim chant and its seething words began again. Harry watched, not understanding in the slightest. Forget understanding. What am I seeing? I'm seeing the Dark Lord Voldemort going to enormous lengths to resurrect Hermione Granger and keep her alive. It's like he thinks that his own life depends on Hermione Granger being alive, somehow. The confused parts of Harry looked around for a procedure to follow. Make a prediction based on your best current hypothesis 
was the first thought that came to mind, but it didn't seem to lead anywhere. The plot of the story wasn't going how it ought to after the villain had won. Again, the blaze of pain in his scar, like a blow to Harry's forehead. The unicorn swayed, and then disintegrated as the troll had done. The Dark Lord laid the stone upon Hermione's form once more, clasping her hands around it. Voldemort watched the unremarkable process for a time, then turned while the stone still laid on her, making a high humming sound in his throat. Hmm. Ah, yes, that would be most appropriate. Do you still have the diary I gave you, boy? The diary of the famous scientist? Harry's brain took a moment to place what Voldemort was talking about. It had been in Mary's room, in Mary's place, in October. That precious gift from a friend. The thought should have triggered a wave of awful sadness for the Professor Quirrell that had been lost, or never real. But there had been enough of that emotion already, and his brain had set it aside for now. Yes, I think it's in my pouch. Can I check? Harry knew it was in his pouch. He'd loaded it up with everything that he might possibly conceivably need, that he owned or had bought, everything that could have been a quest item. From the heap of items by the altar, Harry's mokeskin pouch was drawn out, tossed to Harry's feet. Roger Bacon's diary, Harry said as he reached in a hand and the diary appeared. Professor Quirrell had said that the diary would emerge unscathed from a fire, so Harry threw it toward Voldemort's altar. Harry did not wince. There were more important things to worry about than polite treatment of books. Even that one. Voldemort picked up the diary, examining it, appearing quite absorbed. Harry, as quietly and unobtrusively as he could, attached the pouch to his belt loop in back, where it wouldn't be visible, near where Harry had put his wand. Step 3. The Pouch Yes! Voldemort hissed as he flipped pages of the diary. This will do quite well! The stone moved slightly, and the Dark Lord's other hand stored the stone again within his robes. What was your hidden purpose behind the diary? Harry said when the pouch was attached to his belt and he'd put both of his empty hands where Voldemort could see them again. I tried translating a little at the beginning, but it was going slowly. Actually, it had been excruciatingly slow, and Harry had found other priorities. Diary was exactly what it seemed. A gift meant to seduce you to my side. Voldemort made intricate gestures in the air with his wand, not even looking at what his hand was doing as he held the diary in his other hand. For a moment, Harry thought he could see a trail of darkness in the air, but the moonlight was too faint for certainty. And now, my dear boy... Voldemort's high voice was laced with grim amusement as his wand briefly tapped Hermione Granger's forehead with a casual gesture. I make this diary into a far more precious gift, a sign of how much wisdom I have learned from you, for I would never want you to be deprived of Hermione Granger's counsel and restraint, not ever while the stars yet live. Avada Kedavra! The green bolt of the killing curse blazed out faster than Harry could possibly have cast the Patronus charm, faster than he could possibly have moved. It was already over, even as Harry cried out and went for his wand. Quirinus Quirrell's unconscious body did not even jerk in death. The green light struck into it without other sign. Darkness glowed in the air, anti-light in the trails that Voldemort had made before and the diary of Roger Bacon darkened as though corruption were creeping over it, even as a shiver appeared in the air around Hermione Granger's form. The pain in Harry's scar flared overwhelmingly, like a brand driven into his forehead. It sent Harry dodging unthinkingly to one side as Tom Riddle's reflexes took over. And Voldemort was also screaming, shrieking as he dropped the diary to the ground, holding his own head and screaming. Chance! The last voice of hope said that, as Harry tried frantically to think, to understand. There wasn't any point in trying to kill Voldemort now. It might only annoy him. 
weapons couldn't kill him while any of his hundreds of horcruxes remained. But it still seemed worth it to temporarily disincarnate Voldemort, take the stone and Hermione, and run. Harry's right hand had already taken his wand. His left hand went around to his back, reached awkwardly into his pouch, began to make a silent sign. Three English letters. No! Voldemort had dropped his hands from his head, was staring at Hermione's body as though bewildered. No! No! The item came up from Harry's pouch into his hand, and Harry began to step forward as smoothly as he could, diminishing the range between them to what his brief trials had shown was doable. My great creation! Voldemort's voice was high, sounding panicked. Two different spirits cannot exist in the same world! It is gone! It is severed! Horcrux! I must make a Horcrux at once! Voldemort's gaze fell on Hermione Granger's still sleeping form, and he began to raise his wand in the air, executing the same gestures as before. Harry raised his gun and pulled the trigger three times. End Chapter 111 Chapter 112 Failure, Part 2 Even as Harry had raised the gun, he'd known he was making a mistake. His forebrain saw it and tried to stop his hand, but somehow the sick certainty didn't propagate fast enough to prevent his finger from pulling the trigger. The echo of the shots died away within the graveyard. A fraction of a second before Harry had pulled the trigger, Voldemort had jabbed his wand downward, and a wide wall of dirt had shot up between them from the graveyard earth, intercepting all three bullets. An instant after that, pain flared in Harry's scar, a crawling feeling came close to his skin, and then Harry's pouch, clothes, gun, and everything except his wand disappeared, leaving him naked but for the wand still in his right hand and the glasses he'd charmed to stick on his nose. The steel ring upon his left pinky finger was yanked off hard enough to scrape skin, taking the transfigured jewel with it. That, said the voice of Voldemort from behind the dirt wall, was absolutely predictable. Do you really think I would shout it aloud for you to hear if my immortality were disrupted? Really, stupid child? Lower your wand. Do not raise it up again at any time or you die upon the spot. Harry swallowed and pointed his wand downward. You would have been disappointed in me, Harry said, his own voice now unusually high. If I'd missed an opportunity like that, I mean... There was no time to think, and Harry's mouth was operating on autopilot for trying to placate evil overlords that might have paternal feelings for you and whom you'd just failed to assassinate. Voldemort stepped around from behind the dirt wall, smiling that horrible smile that seemed to contain too many teeth. I promise not to raise my hand or wand against you, child, if you did not raise your hand or wand against me. I used bullets. That's not a fist or a spell. My curse thinks differently. That is the puzzle piece you missed. Did you think I would leave the piece between us to mere fortune? Before I created you, I invoked a curse upon myself and all other Tom Riddles who would descend from me. A curse to enforce that none of us would threaten the other's immortality so long as the other made no attempt upon our own. Typical of that ridiculous fiasco, the curse seems to have ended up binding me but taking no hold upon the infant with his self so lost. <laughs> but you tried to end my life just then, stupid child. Now, curse is lifted, and I may kill you any time I wish. I see. He did see. That was why Voldemort had told him about his Horcrux system in the first place, just to set up the moment when Harry knowingly tried to violate his immortality. 
Harry's mind was frantically churning through options, none of which seemed helpful. His pouch, his clothes. Harry saw by the moonlight that they all now lay in another heap by the altar, out of reach. And now you kill me? Harry still had his wand. Presumably, the Dark Lord couldn't cast his own magic on that or his glasses because of the disharmony. Cast my own spell first? No, Voldemort just jabs his wand downward to make another shield, then shoots me. What else is there? What else? Still a fool. If no further matters remained between us, I would already have killed you. The dirt wall crumbled at another gesture of the wand, and Voldemort moved smoothly back toward the heap of items by the altar. The Dark Lord stretched out a hand, and the diary of Roger Bacon flew to him. This is indeed Horcrux of Girl Child, my superior version. In his other hand appeared a parchment. This is ritual for resurrecting her, if it must be done again. Instructions are honest, no traps. Remember that girl child's spirit cannot float free like ghost. Resurrection stone is my Horcrux, not hers. Do not lose her Horcrux, or her spirit may be trapped within it. Voldemort reached down, picked up Harry's pouch, fed both the diary and the parchment into it. Remember that, in case something goes wrong with next moves. I don't understand what is happening. There was nothing else left. Please explain to me. The Dark Lord was now regarding Harry with a grim look. When Girl Child died, was in company of school seer. Heard prophecy spoken that you would become force of vast destruction. You would become threat beyond imagination, beyond apocalypse. That is why I went to such lengths to undo my killing of girl child. Keep it undone. Are... What? Are you sure? What? Dare not say specifics to you. Prophecy I heard of myself led me to fulfill it. Have not forgotten that disaster. Voldemort backed further away from Harry, red-slitted eyes fixed upon the boy who lived, gun unwavering in his left hand. All of this, all I have done, is to smash that destiny at every point of intervention. If some fate makes me fail in what comes next, idiot child foretold destruction, then you must kill yourself to save girl child, else all you claim to value dies by your own hand. I... I... I really, really wouldn't do that! Seriously! Silence, fool. Remain silent unless given leave by me to speak. Keep your wand pointed down and do not raise it unless told, else you die upon the spot. And mark that I have said that in parcel tongue. Voldemort reached into the altar again. For a second, Harry's mind couldn't process what he was seeing, and then he saw that Voldemort was holding a human arm, severed near the shoulder. It seemed too thin, that arm. The Dark Lord pressed his wand to the flesh above the severed arm's elbow, and the fingers twitched, twitched like they were alive. By dim moonlight, Harry saw a darker mark appear on that flesh, just above the elbow. Seconds later, the first hooded figure appeared inside the graveyard, with the popping sound of an apparition. A moment after that came another pop, and then another. The hooded figures wore silver skull masks, and moonlight fled from the robes beneath them. Master! cried one of the black robes, the third to arrive. The voice was of peculiar timber from behind the silver skull mask. Master, it has been so long! We had lost hope! Silence! shouted the high voice of the Dark Lord Voldemort. 
Every trace of Professor Quirrell was now gone from the too tall figure. Train your wand upon the boy who lived and watch him. Do not be distracted, not by anything. Stun him at once if he moves, if he begins to speak. More pops. Between graves, behind a tree, in all the shadowy spaces, more black robes were apparating, all hooded and masked. Some of them voiced exclamations of joy, many of those sounding rather forced. Others moved forwards as though to greet their master. Voldemort gave them all the same instruction, except that some were commanded to cruciate Harry Potter if he moved, others to restrain the boy who lived if he moved, others told to fire hexes and curses, others told to cancel his magic. Thirty-seven pops Harry counted before the black robes and skull masks seemed to stop arriving. All of them were now holding their wands pointed at Harry, aligned in a semicircle before him where they wouldn't get into each other's lines of fire. Harry continued pointing his wand downward, insofar as he had been told that, if he tried to raise it, he would die. He remained silent, insofar as he had been told that if he tried to speak, he would die. He tried not to shiver in the falling night temperatures, for he was naked and it was getting colder. You know, said the last voice within Harry, the voice of hope. I think this is getting pretty bad, even by my standards. End chapter 112 Chapter 113 Final Exam The gibbous moon riding higher in the cloudless sky. The stars and wash of the Milky Way visible in all their majesty within the darkness. All these illuminated thirty-seven skull masks gleaming above black robes, and the darker-clad Lord Voldemort, whose eyes shone red. Welcome, my Death Eaters, spoke Lord Voldemort's voice, smooth and high and terrible. No, do not look at me, you fools! Eyes on the Potter child! Ten years it has been! Ten years since we last met! Yet you answer my call as though it were yesterday! The Dark Lord came near to one hooded figure, tapped fingers upon the mask. In a hastily transfigured mockery of a Death Eater's true armor, with a childish charm to distort your voice! Explain, Mr. Honor. Our old masks and robes, said the robe whose mask the Dark Lord had tapped. Even through the distorting timber of the mask, the fear in it was audible. We, we were not fighting them, Master. With you gone, so I did not maintain their enchantments. And then you summoned me to appear here, masked, and I... I always held faith in you, Master, but I did not know you would return this very day. I am truly sorry to have displeased you. Enough! The Dark Lord moved on to stand behind another figure that seemed to tremble, though it kept its mask facing the boy who lived and its wand held level. I might think more kindly of such neglect if you had pursued my agenda by other means, Mr. Council. Yet I return to find what? A country conquered in my name? No! I find you playing ordinary politics in the Wizengomet! I find your brothers and sisters still abandoned in Azkaban! It is a disappointment to me. I find myself disappointed. You thought I was gone, the Dark Mark dead, and you forsook my purpose. Is that right, Mr. Council? No, Master. We, we knew you would return, but, but we, we could not fight Dumbledore without you. Crucio! A horrible scream tore out of the mask, piercing the night. It continued for long, long seconds. Get up! The Dark Lord said to the figure that had collapsed upon the ground. Keep your wand on Harry Potter. Do not lie to me again! Y yes master sobbed the figure as it pushed itself to its feet. Voldemort resumed pacing behind the black-robed figures. 
I suppose you are also wondering what Harry Potter is doing here. Why he is a guest at my rebirthing party. I know, Master, said one of the robes. You mean to prove your power by killing him in front of us all, to leave no doubt as to which of you is stronger, to show how your killing curse can slay even this so-called boy who lived. There was a pause. None of the cloaked figures dared to speak. Slowly, the dark Lord Voldemort, in his high-collared shirt and dark robes, turned to face the Death Eater who had spoken. That is a little too much folly for me to credit, Mr. Sallow. You heard that theory of how I died and tried to provoke me into repeating a mistake? Lord Voldemort was floating, rising high off the ground. I suppose you came to prefer your laziness to my mastery, McNair? The Death Eater who'd spoken was suddenly surrounded by a blue haze. He spun, slashed his wand at the Dark Lord, and cried, Avada Kedavra! Voldemort simply tilted to one side in midair, dodging the green bolt. Avada Kedavra! cried the Death Eater. His hand that didn't hold a wand was making other gestures, further colors and layers building up in his shielding haze with each gesture completed. Help me, my brothers, if we all... The Death Eater fell in seven flaming pieces to the ground, chunks of flesh with the cauterized edges still glowing. Eyes and wands on Harry Potter, all of you. And McNair acted in sheer stupidity just then, for I command your marks as I always shall. I am immortal. Master, said another robe. The girl upon the altar, is she to serve us for a dark revel? She seems unworthy of such a joyous occasion. I could find better, Master, if you give me leave for just a short time. No, Mr. Friendly. The little witch you see upon the altar is none other than Hermione Granger. What? cried one of the black robes, and then... I'm sorry, Master, I'm sorry, I beg you... Crucio. <laughs> this screaming only lasted a few seconds, and Voldemort had performed it as though it were perfunctory. Afterward, Voldemort's voice returned to low amusement. I have resurrected this mudblood through the darkest of magics for my own purposes. You shall not offer her the slightest trouble, any of you. You are better off dead than if I learn my little experiment has come to harm at your hands. This order is absolute, regardless of other circumstances. Even if she escapes, let us say. A cold, high laugh, <laughs> as if at some joke that nobody else understood. Master, one of the rope said in a faltering voice distorted by his mask. Master, please. I would never defy you. I am obedient, as you see. But, Master, I beg you, let me return. It is better to serve you later. I came here in haste, forsaking. Master, with so many of us being gone, others will wander. They will mark the absences who has disappeared. Soon there shall be no alibi I can offer. <laughs> ah, Mr. White. The most delinquent of my servants. I have not yet decided if you will survive your punishment. I have less need of you than I once did, Mr. White. In two days' time, the Death Eaters shall walk openly. My powers have increased, and I have just this day disposed of Dumbledore. More gasps of shock arose from the Death Eaters. Voldemort paid them no heed. Tomorrow I shall slay Bones, Crouch, Moody, and Scrimgore, if they have not fled. The rest of you shall go into the Ministry at the Wizengomet and cast imperious curses as I direct you. We are finished waiting. By tomorrow's nightfall, I shall have declared myself Lord Ruler of Britain. Intakes of breath rose from the gathered masks, but one figure was <laughs> laughing. You find me amusing, Mr. Grimm. Apologies, Master, said the robed figure who had laughed, his wand perfectly level upon where Harry stood. I was glad to hear that you had dispatched Dumbledore. I fled from Britain in cowardly fear of him, having lost faith in your return. Voldemort's chuckle resounded within the graveyard. <laughs> your candor earns you my mercy, Mr. Grimm. I was surprised to see you here tonight. You are more competent than I suspected. 
But before we turn our attention to happier matters, there is a certain affair to which I must attend. Tell me, Mr. Grimm, if the boy who lived swore an oath to you, might you trust him? Master, I, I, I don't understand. One or two of the other Death Eaters turned their masks toward Voldemort before quickly fixing their skull gaze on Harry. Answer me. This is not a trick, Mr. Grimm, and you will answer truthfully or bear the consequences. You knew the boy's forebears, did you not? Even knew them for straightforward folk. If the boy freely chose to swear to you an oath, even knowing you for a Death Eater, might you trust his words? Answer me! Uh, uh, yes, Master, I suppose I might. Good. The potential for trust must exist to be sacrificed. And for the bonder of the unbreakable vow, which of you shall sacrifice their magic? It shall be quite the long vow, much longer than usual. Much magic shall be required for that. Voldemort smiled his awful smile. Mr. White shall do. No, please. Master, I beg you. I served you better than any, as best as I could. Crucio! And Mr. White screamed through his mask's distortion for what seemed like a full minute. Be grateful if I leave you your life. Now approach the boy, Mr. Grimm, Mr. White. From behind him, idiot. You must not block the other's wands. The rest of you, you must fire if Harry Potter tries to run, even if it means striking at your fellow Death Eaters. Mr. White took time to approach, the black robe seeming to shake, even as Mr. Grimm moved smoothly into position. What is to be the vow, Master? came the voice of Mr. Grimm. Ah, yes. Today, though I hardly expect even you to believe me, Today we are doing Merlin's work, my Death Eaters. Yes, before us stands a great danger, who in his blundering folly has been prophesied to wreak destruction such as even I can scarcely imagine. The boy who lived. The boy who frightens Dementors. The cattle who believe they own this world should have been more worried when they saw that. Useless, all of them. Forgive me, said one black robe in a halting voice. Master, surely if that is so... Master, why don't we just kill him right away? Voldemort laughed, a strange, <laughs> bitter laugh. When he spoke on, his high voice was precise. Here is the oath's intent. Mr. Grimm, Mr. White, Harry Potter... Listen well and comprehend the vow that must be sworn, for its intent is also binding, and you three must share understanding of its meaning. You will swear, Harry Potter, not to destroy the world, to take no risks when it comes to not destroying the world. This vow may not force you into any positive action. On that account, this vow does not force your hand to any stupidity. Do you understand that, Mr. Grimm, Mr. White? We are dealing with a prophecy of destruction. A prophecy! They can fulfill themselves in twisted ways. We must be cautious that this vow itself does not bring that prophecy about. We dare not let this vow force Harry Potter to stand idly after some disaster is already set in motion by his hand, because he must take some lesser risk if he tries to stop it. Nor must the vow force him to choose a risk of truly fast destruction over a certainty of lesser destruction. But all Harry Potter's foolishness, all his recklessness, all his grandiose schemes and good intentions, he shall not risk them leading to disaster. He shall not gamble with the Earth's fate. No researches that might lead to catastrophe, no unbinding of seals, no opening of gates. Unless this very vow itself is somehow leading into the destruction of the world, in which case, Harry Potter, you must ignore it in that particular regard. You will not trust yourself alone in making such a determination. You must confide honestly and fully in your trusted friend and see if that one agrees. Such is this vow's meaning and intent. 
It forces only such acts as Harry Potter might choose himself, having learned that he's a prophesied instrument of destruction, for the capacity of choice must also exist to be sacrificed. Do you understand, Mr. White? I... I think so. Oh, Master, please do not let the vow be so long. Silence, fool. You do a more useful thing this day than you have ever done. Mr. Grimm. I think, Master, that it must be repeated to me. Voldemort smiled that too wide smile and said it all again using different words. And now, Harry Potter, you will keep your wand low and permit Mr. Grimm to touch his wand to yours, and you will speak such words as I direct you. If Harry Potter speaks any other word, then cut him down the rest of you. Yes, Master, came the thirty-four-fold chorus. Harry was chilled and shivering, and not only because he was naked in the night. He didn't understand why Voldemort was not killing him. There seemed to be only a single line leading into the future, and it was Voldemort's chosen line, and Harry did not know what came after this. Mr. White, touch your wand to Harry Potter's hand and repeat these words. Magic that flows in me, bind this vow. Mr. White spoke those words. Even through the distortion effect of his mask, it sounded as though his heart were breaking. Behind Voldemort, the obelisks chanted, a language that Harry did not know. Three times they repeated their words, and then fell silent. Mr. Grimm, think of the reasons why you might trust this boy if he had given this oath freely. Think of that potential for trust, and sacrifice it, as you say. By my trust that I hold for you, be you held. And then it was Harry Potter's turn to repeat Lord Voldemort's words, and Harry did so. I vow... I vow... That I shall not... That I shall not... By any act of mine, destroy the world. By any act of mine, destroy the world. I shall take no chances in not destroying the world. I shall take no chances in not destroying the world. If my hand is forced... If my hand is forced... I may take the course of lesser destruction over greater destruction. I may take the course of lesser destruction over greater destruction. Unless it seems to me that this vow itself leads to the world's end. Unless it seems to me that this vow itself leads to the world's end. And the friend in whom I have confided honestly agrees that this is so. And the friend in whom I have confided honestly agrees that this is so. By my own free will. By my own free will. Harry could feel it as the rite was invoked, the shining cords of power wrapping around his wand and Mr. Grimm's wand. Wrapping around his hand where Mr. White's wand touched it. Wrapping around his self on some disturbingly abstract level. Harry could feel himself invoking his power of free choice. And he knew that his next words would sacrifice it. That this was absolutely the last chance to turn back. So shall it be. So shall it be. And he knew in that moment that the content of the vow was no longer something he could decide whether or not to do. It was simply the way in which his body and mind would move. It was not a vow he could break even by sacrificing his life in the process. Like water flowing downhill or a calculator summing numbers, it was just a thing Harry Potter would do. Did the vow take, Mr. White? Yes, Master. I have lost so much, please. I have been punished enough. Return to your places. Good. All eyes on the Potter child. Bad to fire the instant he tries to flee or raise his wand or speak any word. The Dark Lord floated high in the air, the black-clad figure overlooking the graveyard. Again, he held a gun in his left hand and his wand in his right. Better. 
Now we shall kill the boy who... Mr. White staggered. Mr. Grimm was laughing again, and so were others. I did not do that to be funny. We are dealing with a prophecy. We are snipping the threads of destiny one by one. Carefully, carefully, not knowing when we first encounter resistance. This is the order in which the next acts shall be done. First, Harry Potter shall be stunned. Then his limbs severed and the wounds cauterized. Mr. Friendly and Mr. Honor will examine him for any trace of unusual magics. One of you shall shoot the boy many times with my muggle weapon, and then as many of you as can shall strike him with the killing curse. Only then will Mr. Grimm crush his skull and brains with the mundane substance of a tombstone. I shall verify his corpse. Then his corpse shall be burned with fire. Then we will exercise a surrounding area and Daisy is left to ghost. I myself will guard this place until six hours have passed, for I do not fully trust the wards I have set against time looping. And four of you shall search the surroundings for signs of anything noteworthy. Even after that, we must remain vigilant for any sign of Harry Potter's renewed presence in case Dumbledore has left some unimagined trick in play. If you can think of any trick that I have missed, make sure that Harry Potter's threat is ended. Speak now. I shall reward you handsomely. Speak now in Merlin's name. There was stunned silence amid the cemetery. No one made to speak. Useless, the lot of you. Now I shall ask Harry Potter one final question, and he is to answer that question for my ears alone. It parcel tongue. Strike the boy down at once if he answers with anything but hisses. He tries to speak one word of human speech. Then Voldemort hissed. Papa, I know not. It was said. You would have the Muggle arts. I have now learned from you, and I am already studying them. The power of my fetus must be comprehended for oneself, or so you say. If there is any other power you possess that I may come to have, tell me of it now, else I intend to torment certain of those you care for. Doctor's lives, I have already promised. But others I did not. Your blood, blood, servants, your body, your precious parents, all shall suffer for what will seem to them like eternity. And then I shall send them broken into the light to prison to remember it until they waste and die. For each unknown power you tell me how to master, or other secret you tell me that I desire to know, you may name one or of those to instead be protected and honored under my reign. This also I promise and intend to keep. Voldemort's smiling expression now came as though it were a snake's gaping fangs, and the meaning that expression bore among snakes a promise that whoever beheld the teeth was to be consumed by them. Waste not time in thoughts of escape if you care for those ones. You have sixty seconds to begin telling me something I wish to know, and then your death begins. I'm going to do something a little out of the ordinary here and read the author's notes that Eliezer left at the end of this chapter. Ahem. <clears throat> this is your final exam. You have 60 hours. Your solution must at least allow Harry to evade immediate death, despite being naked, holding only his wand, facing 36 Death Eaters, plus the fully restored Lord Voldemort. If a viable solution is posted before midnight on Tuesday, March 3rd, the story will continue to Chapter 121. Otherwise, you will get a shorter and sadder ending. 
there was then a list of constraints to act as a reminder and instructions on how to post a proposed solution. It ended with the following words. Harry is allowed to solve this problem the way you would solve it. If you can tell me exactly how to do something, Harry is allowed to think of it. But it does not serve as a solution to say, for example, Harry should persuade Voldemort to let him out of the box if you can't yourself figure out how. For anyone who was not around when this chapter was originally published, I want you to imagine for a moment the way the HPMOR subreddit freaked out after this was posted. It was a brilliant and beautiful thing, and those 60 hours will definitely be among the highlights of 2015 for me. If you have the inclination, take some time over the next two weeks to think about how you would solve this problem if you were Harry. I've copied the reminders and list of restrictions that Eliezer posted over to hpmorpodcast.com for anyone who's interested. End Chapter 113 Chapter 114 Shut Up and Do the Impossible The gibbous moon riding higher in the cloudless sky, the stars and wash of the Milky Way visible in all their majesty within the darkness. All these shone down upon the graveyard to bear witness from their unimaginable distances. In the instant when Harry had realized there was no way at all left to save everyone, his mind's voices had fallen away, become one, a single purpose taking up every fraction of his mind. Fifty seconds. Forty seconds. Harry's eyes tracked slowly across the air until his gaze landed on the first Death Eater, the one closest to him. Thirty seconds. Twenty seconds? Time's almost up. I do know secrets you would like to know. Harry didn't look directly at the Dark Lord as he spoke. But most valuable knowledge to you, I think, would be my ideas as to how world might be destroyed. Yet to tell you such thoughts might lead to destruction of world. Do not know prophecy, but if there is prophecy, that makes it more than unusually probable that any action I take might have that effect. Or to tell you such might prevent destruction of world, since you do seem motivated to avoid it. Not allowed to make such a decision myself. Would need to awaken and consult girl-child friend. Vow requires. There was a long pause. The Dark Lord, floating above and behind the curve of Death Eaters with leveled wands, began to laugh as Salazar Slytherin had thought a snake would laugh cold amusement in the form of a hiss. Do you know how to destroy world then? Cannot deliberately try to imagine method. You might have way for servant to steal my thoughts. Vow prohibits. But suspect I could devise method if girl child said to try. Harry's eyes drifted slowly to another Death Eater, and another. More snakish laughter. Clever! You have my compliments for thinking such tactics. But no. No, it is annoying. But with world and your eternity at stake, would you not... Greater risk to world in introducing such complications, delaying your end. I will study muggle sciences myself. Think of all you might imagine. Now speak such secrets as you may tell me, or this ends. Slowly, Harry's vision tracked across the graveyard in careful arcs ignoring the Dark Lord except as a floating blackness in his peripheral vision. His mouth went on speaking with only half his attention. 
Have thought of idea you might not have considered, teacher. Your attempt to kill me might fail in certain specific way, despite all your precautions. Perhaps lead into destroying world later. Would not ordinarily deem probable, but with prophecy at hand, may well be so. Voldemort went still in the air. How? Am not obligated to tell you. A cold anger began to seethe through the snakish reply. Though I understand well your desperation and attempted cleverness, this begins to annoy me. I will not withhold from killing you, for that is still greater risk. To fail to tell me your thought risks destroying world. Speak. No. Vow does not obligate me to any positive action. The Dark Lord stared down at Harry Potter, who glanced up at the angry face only briefly before his eyes went back to the next Death Eater. Some of them were shifting their stances slightly, but they stood still and said no words as they leveled their wands. The silver skull masks could not be read. Then the Dark Lord began to chuckle again. Survive your death? You think you might? No, child. My Horcruxes are not linked to you. Also, I would know if they were. Or is there other reason you think you may survive beyond my ways of ensuring your death? Harry didn't allow himself to be distracted. The repeated failures didn't matter. They only led into the next action in the chain, but he still needed a next action. Now, speak a secret, or I. Life eaters will pursue you always, hate you always, seek you out wherever you go. If what I have just done was successful, I have caused them to be set upon you. Guardian charm secret will be beyond you for long time to come, perhaps forever. Best defense against life eaters would die with me. This is starting to become sad. Ah, I see. Life eaters respond to expectations. You tell me I will be hunted. I expect. To be hunted, they hunt me. Such is rare, but not unheard of. Valuable secret, yes, can see many uses. A cruel smile. I shall allow you to select one person to be saved. Myself. Would tell you to die with dignity, but knowing myself, I know it for futility. You have wasted my kindly gift just then by annoying me, and I retract it. Any other secrets? Yes, really interesting ones too. Some you are unlikely to figure out on your own. Not for very long time, if ever. If I say I have told you all that do not risk world, will you not torment any of my friends or family? All of this speech started because you left me no way at all to save everyone. The Dark Lord stood still in the air for a long moment. And Harry's eyes went on tracking slowly across the graveyard as his hand remained tight upon his wand. In the instant when Harry had realized there was no way left to save everyone, he couldn't speak any incantation in English, but transfiguration was wordless. There was no material in contact with his wand's end except air, which couldn't be transfigured. But Voldemort didn't know about partial transfiguration, which Harry could use to transfigure a tiny bit of the material from his wand itself. 
You're stalling just to delay death or with other purpose. Harry said nothing, his other work slowing as his mind sought a continuation of the conversation that would work even against the Dark Lord's will. Speak and tell me this purpose, or this ends now, and your friends suffer for lifetimes. Lower muggle weapon and do not point wand in my direction. Speak no commands to servants. I do possess capabilities of which you are ignorant can use one such capacity to cause a huge explosion almost instantly without speaking incantation. Slay your new body, all servants, stone scattered to who knows where. At his current level of practice, Harry could transfigure one cubic millimeter as fast as he could apply his will and magic. One cubic millimeter of antimatter. It wasn't a world-ending threat. Voldemort could have been carved from stone. You bluff. Somehow. Not bluffing. Speaking in snake talk, I tell you, I can do it almost instantly. Before any spell can be cast at me, I think. You know very little of science as yet. Power I would command is stronger than process that fuels stars. Vow will stop you. You cannot risk world. Take no risks, none with clever ideas. Would not risk world. I estimated size of explosion. Nowhere near that large. You do not know, fool. Cannot be sure. I am reasonably certain. Thou will not stop me. There was an increasing fury in Voldemort's expression, and yet his hiss carried a tinge of fear. I shall wreak pain beyond imagining on all you care for. Shut up. I disregard all such threats now, as theory of games says I should. Only reason you make threats is that you expect me to respond. That, too, Harry had truly understood in the last extremity. Offer me something I want, teacher, for your new body, for your continued holding of stone. For lives of your servants. Harry's mouth was running on automatic, his real attention elsewhere. Beneath the moonlight glints a tiny fragment of silver, a fraction of a line. From a tiny spot on the end of Harry's wand, a cubic millimeter of anchor stretched out a thin line of transfigured spider silk. It would have broken at once if tested. It would have gone unremarked if any had noticed its glint. Less than a tenth of a millimeter in cross-section, the tiny shape represented by the extended line of spider silk was something Harry could transfigure swiftly, ten centimeters of length to a cubic millimeter of total volume. And Harry could transfigure a cubic millimeter in a fraction of a second. He was forcing the transfiguration outward, extending it through the air as fast as he could without risking the transformation. The tracing line of spider silk looped around a Death Eater's hood at neck level, returned to the pattern of threads. Voldemort's face was now impassive. You must not leave here alive. Sensible people called good would also agree. This I tell you in snake speech. But all your friends I will treat kindly and protect under my reign if you agree to die now as a good person should. The last Death Eater was looped. The pattern of spider silk was complete. The web had been drawn with loops around all the Death Eater's necks. 
the ends of those loops had been anchored to a central circle, and that central circle in turn had three threads stretching across its center, the entire pattern still touching the anchor line stretching out of Harry's wand. Over the next seconds, those near-invisible threads of reflected moonlight turned black. Filaments narrower, stronger, and sharper than steel wire. Braided carbon nanotubes, each individual tube all a single molecule. Want you to also promise to treat nations kindly under your rule. Will not accept less. Voldemort hovered still in the air, snake face showing a dawning fury. The last two threads stretched out from the dark pattern, black threads already in the form of nanotubes. They moved lightly through the air toward the Dark Lord himself, toward the sleeve just above Voldemort's left hand that held the gun, toward the sleeve just above the right hand that held the Yu wand. Threads placed high at first, to give them time to drift slowly downward through the air. The threads looped around, went over themselves, tied slippable knots, began to tighten, coming closer to the sleeve as Harry transfigured them shorter. Harry felt the tickle of Voldemort's power beginning to touch his own in the back of his mind. At the same time, the Dark Lord's eyes widened, his mouth opened and Harry transfigured the black threads stretching across the black pattern center to a quarter their previous size, shrinking the circle, yanking hard on everything attached, tightening loops. Black robes, falling. Harry wasn't looking there, he didn't see the falling masks, the blood. In the back of his mind he felt some explosions of magic like he'd felt when Hermione died, but he ignored them. Harry's eyes saw only the Dark Lord's hands and wand and gun dropping downward. And then Harry's wand was rising, pointing. Stupefy! The red bull to the color of the stunning hex winged towards Voldemort, blazing across the graveyard almost faster than the eye could see. Without any hesitation despite his wounds, the Dark Lord jerked down and right through the air and the red bolt from Professor Flitwick's secret swerving stunner turned in midair and slammed into Voldemort. The pain that flashed through Harry's scar was searing. It made him cry out, and a red haze appeared across his vision. Despite everything, Harry dropped his wand in pain and sheer fatigue. As Harry let go of his wand, the pain began to clear. End Chapter 114 Chapter 115 Shut Up and Do the Impossible Part 2 Something like a fugue state had come over Harry's mind. The absolute state had partially worn off him, partially stayed with him. Elements of his mind were numb maybe deliberately numbed by some part that was smart enough to predict what would happen otherwise. What he'd just done. The thought was shut off, making space for an awareness of other things. Harry was standing in the middle of a haphazard graveyard, tombstones scattered without order. By moonlight and starlight, it could be seen that black robes littered the ground, surrounded by textures that didn't match the surrounding graveyard earth, wetness tinged red in the moonlight. Some heads had come loose from the surrounding hoods of the robes, revealing hair that was long or short, dark or bright, which was all that could be seen beneath the moon. The silver mask stayed on, making all the hair originate in skulls instead of human faces. The thought was shut off, making space for awareness of other things. A girl in a red-trimmed Hogwarts uniform slept upon an altar. Near the altar, Harry's things lay in a heap. Upon the ground lay a too tall pale man of inhuman face, blood pouring from the stumps of his wrists. As soon as the Dark Lord Voldemort awakens, he will destroy everything you love. Dumbledore is no longer there to stop him. He cannot be imprisoned, for he can abandon his body at any time. 
he cannot be killed permanently, not without destroying more than a hundred horcruxes, one of which is the pioneer plaque. Materials. One wand. You are allowed to point it and speak this time. You have five minutes. Solve. Harry stumbled toward the altar, knelt at its side, and picked up his pouch. He walked toward where Voldemort lay. The sense of apprehension had diminished after Voldemort had been hexed unconscious. Now, as Harry approached, it rose to a terrifying height, flaring also into pain in his scar. Harry ignored the inner shriek. That had been the last memory of Tom Riddle seared into Harry's brain, the last cognitive pattern to be transferred over into the infant baby before Tom Riddle had exploded. A sense of mounting horror and dismay associated with the resonance that had spun out of control. Harry knew the meaning of it now, that sense of apprehension, and that made it easier to disregard. He'd guessed that the effect of the resonance mostly hit the caster, with power proportional to the caster's power, and the bet had paid off. Harry looked upon Voldemort's body and breathed deeply, through his mouth, because coppery smells Harry was not thinking about were coming in through his nose. Harry knelt by Voldemort's side, took out his medical kit from his pouch, and placed a self-tightening tourniquet around the body's left wrist than another tourniquet about the right. It felt wrong, showing Voldemort that concern. Some part of Harry was aware, in the back of his mind, that some number of people had just had something extremely bad happen to them. What would have been balance, what would have been justice, was if Voldemort had suffered the same fate without an instant's more hesitation. What Harry was doing now felt like Batman showing more concern for the Joker than for the Joker's victims. It felt like a comic book where the writers wrung their hands endlessly about the morality of killing the big-named villains while innocents went on dying in the background. To show more solicitousness for the head villain than his minions, to pay more attention to his fate than the fate of his lower-status followers, was a flaw in human nature. So it felt wrong when Harry rose up from beside the body, the tourniquet having tightened upon Voldemort's wrists. It felt like Harry was doing something ethically monstrous. Even though any sane strategic thinking said that Voldemort's body must not die, the soul he'd created for himself had to be anchored in this brain. It mustn't be allowed to float free. Harry stepped back, back from Voldemort's unconscious body breathing deeply through his mouth. He went to the pile of his things to put on his robes and other items, starting with placing the time-turner around his throat once more, readying his own escape and return if that was required. More than a hundred horcruxes. That had been insane. There wasn't any other word for it. A sign of Voldemort's damaged thinking about death. A muggle security expert would have called it fence post security, like building a fence post over a hundred meters high in the middle of the desert. Only a very obliging attacker would try to climb the fence post. Anyone sensible would just walk around the fence post, and making the fence post even higher wouldn't stop that. Once you forgot to be scared of how impossible the problem was supposed to be, it wasn't even difficult. Not by comparison to the last one. Neville's parents, for example, had been crucioed into permanent insanity. Two hundred advanced horcruxes wouldn't prevent that insanity. They would all just echo the same damaged mind. It would be an ethically justified use of the Cruciatus curse, if that was the only way to stop Voldemort permanently. It would be justice. Balance. It would show that the Joker's life wasn't worth more than his meanest henchman. All Harry needed to do was cast the Patronus charm, send it to... Alistair Moody? And tell him to come here. Well, no. It was a pretty good guess that the Patronus charm wouldn't work if it was cast with that intent. Maybe just resolve to tell Moody that, and use his time-turner once he was out of range of Voldemort's wards. And then Voldemort could be crucioed into permanent insanity. 
It wasn't even the least merciful feint. That would have been throwing Voldemort's wand into the pit at Azkaban, if the wand stayed connected to Voldemort's life and magic no matter where his ghost tried to flee. Harry turned to face where Voldemort lay. He walked forward and continued to control his breathing, ignoring the burning feeling in his throat. Some part of him knew that Voldemort was also Professor Quirrell, even though his body was now different. Even though the shift of personality had been perfect, and that meant that Professor Quirrell had been just another mask. Though Voldemort hadn't planned to kill Harry painfully, hadn't thought to strike Harry with his followers' cruciatus when Harry was being annoying before. That meant something when your opponent was Voldemort. Maybe he'd had some remaining shred of fellow feeling for the other Tom Riddle after all. It would be wrong to take that into account. Wouldn't it? Harry looked back up at the stars. Here below the atmosphere, the stars twinkled. They were embedded in the false dome of the night sky, stretched out across the wash of the Milky Way that glowed like a long ribbon, as if they were all close enough that you could fly up to them on a broomstick and touch them. What would they want him to do now, at this juncture? The children's children's children. The answer to that also felt obvious, if it wasn't just the part of Harry that still cared about Professor Quirrell doing the real talking. Harry had needed to do the thing he'd done. It had prevented greater evils. Harry couldn't have stopped Voldemort if the Death Eaters had fired first. But the thing Harry had done wasn't something that could be balanced by a not-necessary tragedy happening to one more sentient being even if that being was Voldemort. It would just be one more element of the sorrows of ancient Earth so long ago. The past was past. You did what you had to do, and you didn't do one scrap of harm more than that. Not even to balance things out and make it all symmetrical. The children's children's children wouldn't want Voldemort to die, even if his minions had. They wouldn't want Voldemort to hurt if it didn't accomplish anything compared to him not hurting. Harry breathed deeply and let go of... Not his hate. Not quite his hate. He hadn't been able to hate his creator even at the very end. But even so... Harry let go of something, of the sense that he ought to hate Voldemort, that it was a hate he was obligated to feel, for the endless list of crimes that Voldemort had committed for no good reason, not even his own happiness. It's all right, the stars whispered down at him. It's all right to not hate him. It doesn't make you a bad person. In the end, there was only one option he would take. And since Harry already knew that, there was no point agonizing about it. Whether it was the best option, only time would tell. Harry breathed deeply, building up the magic inside himself. The spell he was going to cast didn't need to be precise, but it was still one of the most powerful spells he'd mastered. Harry thought again of how unjust it was that Voldemort could not die with his followers, felt the slight trace of coldness in his blood that came with thoughts of ruthlessness. And then Harry let it go, let it all drain away beneath the starlight, because his dark side had never been anything except an inherited pattern of cognition, just one more bad habit of thinking to break. Instead, Harry looked at Hermione's breathing form atop the altar and let the tears finally start from his eyes. What would become of Hermione now, what path she would choose after this, Harry couldn't guess. But she would be there to have a choice. Their friendship wouldn't have destroyed her existence. He hadn't realized how shaky his hope had been until he'd noticed how surprised he'd been after the hope had come true. Sometimes things did go better than expected. 
And Harry took that thought too, and put it in the magic he was building. The power he was storing up was vibrating in him, like his whole body was part of his wand. Either Harry's eyes were blurring, or there was a luminous white quiver running over the holly. And Harry thought the shape of the spell he would cast. He didn't have much fine control, but the pattern he needed was simple. It just needed to include... Everything. Forget everything. Tom Riddle, Professor Quirrell, forget your whole life. Forget your entire episodic memory. Forget the disappointment and the bitterness and the wrong decisions. Forget Voldemort. And at the last moment, before Harry cast the spell, he had one final thought, a note of grace. But if you ever had any truly happy memories, not hurting people or laughing at their pain, but the warm feeling of helping someone or being helped, there won't be many, maybe just when you were a child. But if you had any truly happy memories, then keep only those. Something bright in him unfolded at the decision, knowing he'd made the right choice. And Harry pushed that too into his wand. Obliviate! And it all poured out of Harry into the spell. Harry fell over on his side, dropping his wand, gritted screams coming from his throat, his hands going helplessly to his scar, even as the sudden blast of pain in his head began to fade. Only dimly did his eyes see that the air was filled with glowing snowflakes, drifting motes of silver light like tiny specks of Patronus charm. Only a moment the silver light lasted, and then it was gone. Professor Quirrell was gone, nothing left but a remnant. And that spirit, what remained of it, wouldn't be so different now from Harry's own. The prophecy was complete. They had each remade the other in their own image. Harry started (laughs) sobbing, then, from where he was curled up in the dirt. He cried for a while. And then eventually, Harry staggered to his feet and picked up his wand again, because this day's work wasn't quite done. Harry laid his wand directly on Voldemort's wrist stump. It made his scar throb with an ongoing pain, but neither of them exploded. And Harry began a transfiguration. Slowly... Though faster than Harry had been able to transfigure Hermione's body last time, the stunned form of the Snake Man changed, reshaped itself. As the transfiguration progressed, especially as the Snake Man's head began to turn glassy and shrunken, the pain in Harry's scar faded. It would be a spell to maintain whether Harry was waking or sleeping. And later, when Harry was older and more powerful, and maybe had some help, he would untransfigure the mind-wipe Tom Riddle and heal his body with the power of the stone. After, future Harry had figured out what to do with an almost completely amnesiac wizard who still had some bad habits of thought and some highly negative emotional patterns. A dark side, as twere. Plus, a great deal of declarative and procedural knowledge about powerful magic. Harry had tried his best not to obliviate that part, because he might need it, some day. And meanwhile, just like magic hadn't defined a transfigured unicorn as dead for purposes of setting off wards, Voldemort's horcruxes wouldn't define a transfigured Voldemort as dead and try to bring him back. That was the hope, anyway. Harry's scar twinged one last time when the steel ring went on his pinky finger, holding the tiny green emerald in contact with his skin. Then his scar subsided and did not hurt again. An upthrust rock served Harry for a chair when he staggered over it and sat down motionless, resting after a fashion, shoving back the exhaustion that threatened the corners of his mind. It was not done. 
there was more to do. Harry took another deep breath, still inhaling through his mouth, and said, Lumos! and looked around the graveyard. Black robes and severed skull masks surrounded by pools of blood. Hermione Granger asleep on the altar. Voldemort's empty robes and bloody hands lying where the Dark Lord had fallen. Quirinus Quirrell and his shredded robes fallen in a heap where the killing curse had stricken him. Harry imagined someone else looking at this scene, trying to understand it, and shook his head, because that wouldn't do. It wouldn't do at all. Then Harry shoved himself up from his rock, grimacing as his mind, if not body, protested. He hadn't been bloodied or beaten much today, but somehow Harry's body was managing to feel like all the stress had hit it directly. Harry staggered over toward where Voldemort had fallen and picked up Voldemort's left hand from where it lay upon the ground. Even in just the left hand, you could see the faint trace of snake scales. It was very distinctively Voldemort. That was good. Harry went to the altar where the sleeping Hermione lay and gently placed the detached hand around Hermione's neck, carefully moving the fingers to clutch at her throat. It was hard to do. Hermione seemed so peaceful and innocent when she was sleeping, and Voldemort's severed hand seemed so ugly. Harry bluntly overrode whatever part of his mind was thinking that, since it made no sense in this context. A few weak severing charms served to mess up the almost perfectly fine cut the nanofiber had made, which was critical. It would not do to have the hand stump look like the neck stumps. The multiple defendos scattered small bits of Voldemort wrist all over Hermione's shirt, which, Harry had to remind himself, was also part of the plan. Harry repeated this with the right hand, arranging it symmetrically with the left. Harry used Inflammare to singe Voldemort's robes where they lay, and then arranged the singed clothing around Hermione. Voldemort's gun and his wand went into Harry's pouch. Harry placed the Stone of Permanency in an ordinary pocket. He wasn't sure what the stone might do to his pouch. The heap of things from inside Quirrell's robe, also near the altar, yielded the wand that the defense professor had used when he was being Quirrell. Harry went to where Quirrell lay and straightened out the body as best he could and put Quirrell's wand into his hand. Tears predictably came to Harry's eyes and Harry wiped them away on his sleeve. Harry took another deep breath, still inhaling through his mouth, said, Lumos! again, and once more looked around the graveyard. Black robes, severed skull masks, and Hermione Granger lying on an altar with Voldemort's severed hands clutched around her throat, and Voldemort's singed clothing scattered around her. Quirinus Quirrell lay dead with his clothes torn and shredded, his wand in his right hand. That would do. There remained the problem of calling attention to it. Harry was very nearly out of magic at this point, but he still had enough to transfigure a leaf into the deflated form of a three-meter weather balloon. Harry's pouch produced a bottle of acetylene and a stick of dynamite and a spool of fuse cord. Be prepared. That's the Boy Scouts' marching song. Be prepared for a life that includes mountain trolls and who knows what else. Harry inflated the weather balloon with oxyacetylene. That would produce a very sharp overpressure when it detonated, maybe as loud as a sonic boom. He attached the stick of dynamite. It was overkill for detonation, but it would do. He attached a 60-second fuse to the stick of dynamite, but did not light it yet. Harry put on his cloak of invisibility that had been among the piles by the sacrificial altar. He obtained his broomstick from his pouch and mounted it. Harry cast a quieting charm around Hermione Granger. It wouldn't stop all the noise, not even close, and it wasn't like she'd be permanently hurt if her eardrums burst, but it still seemed polite. And then, that was it. The quieting charm had done it. Harry was drained of magic for at least the next hour. Harry mounted the broomstick, slowly rising into the air, lifting the weather balloon filled with oxyacetylene with him. 
the castle Hogwarts came into view, distantly gleaming in moonlight a few kilometers away as Harry rose above the trees and Harry did his best to figure the distance and the angle as it would be seen from Hogwarts. When he had risen high above the forest, Harry used a lighter to ignite the fuse on the dynamite attached to the weather balloon full of oxyacetylene. Then Harry spun the broomstick and darted away, though not directly toward the castle. That might take him too close to the route past Harry and Professor Quirrell had traversed. It wouldn't do to have the professor sense another Harry. Harry felt a leaden stab of sadness and refused it. Thirty-one one thousand, thirty-two one thousand, thirty-three one thousand. When Harry reached forty, not wanting to take chances with his own eardrums, he glanced at his wristwatch, noting the exact time, and spun his time-turner once. End chapter 115 Chapter 116 Aftermath Something to Protect Part Zero At first, Anna had been gratified to see the final Quidditch Cup go on so long. As a Gryffindor, she was a bystander at the House Cup thing. It wasn't like Gryffindor ever won. In contrast, last year's World Cup of Quidditch, to which her family had bought some very expensive tickets, had been over in 10 minutes, which was awful. Modern Quidditch games had become too short. The snitch caught much too quickly. It was a widely talked problem among aficionados. Broomstick enchantments had advanced, while the snitch stayed the same regulation speed, with the result that Quidditch games had become shorter and shorter. At professional levels, the sport of Quidditch had been reduced to a contest of who had the deepest pockets for their Seeker's experimental racing broom, and the rest of the players might as well have been watching from the stands. Everyone knew something had to be done. The situation had been getting worse for centuries, and now it was intolerable. But the International Confederation of Wizards Quidditch Committee was mired in all the usual acrimony of the ICW, screaming disputes between Germans and Bulgarians, and somehow nobody could agree on exactly how to fix the rules. To Anna, the correct course seemed obvious. Just make the snitch fast enough to restore the four-hour or five-hour games of the early 19th century and the golden age of Quidditch. Except the Belgians thought the duration of the professional game should be two hours, like in La Belle Epoque, when Belgium had dominated Quidditch, and the lunatic Italians wanted to go back to the week-long Quidditch games of the 14th century. And Britain's even crazier blood purists kept on talking up the occasional day-long Quidditch match as proof that broomsticks couldn't really have improved since everything was better in the old days, which was not how the interdict of Merlin worked. She was 100% on the side of Harry Potter that it was time for Hogwarts to give up on those gibbering slowpokes and just change the rules, starting here and now. But not by eliminating the snitch. That was going all the way back to 11th century Quidditch. It didn't matter if Headmistress Hufflepuff had first introduced the innovation because one of her students had wanted to play the game but not been suited to the usual roles. Snitches had caught on internationally because it was more exciting when the game could always end in the next minute. Anna had been arguing this viewpoint at the top of her lungs for the last 30 minutes, quite forgetting to pay attention to the game. Thanks to a lucky coincidence of seating, she'd been near the boy who lived and his sign, and hence she'd managed to stake out her position right from the start. She was aware, in the back of her mind, that if the Quidditch rules really did change, starting here and now, then this was the most important thing she'd ever do. She could almost feel the pressure of time twisting around her, as though the fate of Quidditch itself were being settled this very day and she was standing close to the center of it. Though she hadn't gotten high enough scores in divination to actually sense anything like that, of course. She hardly noticed when at one point the boy who lived stood up to go to the bathroom. The boy who lived did catch her eye when he trudged back. Harry Potter looked a bit tired and wobbly, though his uniform appeared as trim as if he'd changed into a new one. She noticed half an hour later on when Harry Potter seemed to sway a bit 
and then hunch over, his hands going to cover up his forehead. It looked like he was prodding at his forehead scar. The thought made her slightly worried. Everyone knew that there was something going on with Harry Potter, and if Potter's scar was hurting him, then it was possible that a sealed horror was about to burst out of his forehead and eat everyone. She dismissed that thought, though, and continued to explain Quidditch facts to the historically ignorant at the top of her lungs. She definitely noticed when Harry Potter stood up, hands still on his forehead, and dropped his hands to reveal that his famous lightning bolt scar was now blazing red and inflamed. It was bleeding, with the blood dripping down Potter's nose. She stopped talking mid-sentence. Other people turned to look at what she was staring at. Professor McGonagall? Harry Potter said in a wavering voice. There were tears in the corner of his eyes, which shocked her. The boy who lived did not seem like the sort of person who would burst into tears. Harry Potter raised his voice further, as though it were hard for him to speak. Um, Professor McGonagall? Professor McGonagall turned away from where she was arguing with the Hufflepuff Quidditch team. The head of Gryffindor's eyes widened in shock, and then she was moving people out of her way, almost running. Harry! Your scar! Silence was spreading in a widening circle. I think... I think he's back! I I think I'm seeing through Voldemort's mind! Anna took a step back at you-know-who's name and nearly fell over a bleacher. An older boy standing next to her gave a cry of dismay, and then the boy who lived shrieked even louder. He's killing them! Half the Quidditch stadium turned to look at him. The ritual! Blood of his servants! The blood! The life! He summoned them! He took their heads! Their blood! The life! To renew his own! The Dark Lord rises! Voldemort is returned! Madame Hooch blew a shrill whistle, and the Quidditch brooms that hadn't already stopped in midair began to slow. For herself, she wasn't sure if this was a joke. If it was, boy who lived or not, he was in more trouble than she could even imagine. Professor McGonagall raised her wand into position for a quieting charm, and Harry Potter caught her hand. Wait! Harry Potter gasped, his voice lower, but still loud enough that she and the people near her could hear clearly. He can be stopped! I see his mind! His mistake! He can be stopped now! The way is open! She's following him! She who Voldemort slew! Return! 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 Revive and stop him! Stop him, Hermione! And then Harry Potter fell silent. He looked around at the people staring at him. She'd just about decided that this had to all be a prank in unbelievably poor taste when a distant but sharp crack filled the air. Harry Potter swayed and fell to his knees, even as her heart jumped into her throat. An explosion of excited babble rose around them. She could still hear the words from Harry Potter's mouth as Professor McGonagall knelt next to him. It worked! She got him! He's gone! What? Quiet! Quiet! All of you! Harry, what happened? Harry Potter was speaking rapidly but loudly. Voldemort! Tried to revive. He summoned Death Eaters and he killed them. Stole their blood and life. Hermione's body was there. I don't know why. Maybe Voldemort was planning to use it for something. Voldemort came back. He resurrected himself. But Hermione followed him back. And she destroyed him. He's gone. It's over. It happened in a graveyard near Hogwarts. It's... Harry Potter rose to his feet, still swaying. I think it's in that direction. Harry Potter pointed in the rough direction the crack had come from. I'm not sure how far. The sound from there took 20 seconds to get here, so maybe two minutes on a broomstick. With a motion so smooth it looked unconscious, Professor McGonagall shifted into a stance and said, Expecto Patronum. She addressed the glowing cat that then appeared. Go to Albus. Tell him he must come at once. Dumbledore's gone! The headmaster is gone, Professor McGonagall! 
The Dark Lord trapped him. He reversed some kind of trap the Headmaster planned, and Dumbledore was caught outside time. He's gone. The horrified babble around them rose in pitch. Go to Albus, Professor McGonagall said to her Patronus. The moonlit cat only looked at Professor McGonagall sadly, and Anna sucked in her breath in sudden horror, feeling like someone had punched her in the stomach. It was real. It was all real. This wasn't a joke. Professor McGonagall, Hermione is alive! She's really alive and not an infurious or anything! And she's still there in the graveyard! A broomstick! Professor McGonagall turned to the players hovering motionless over the Quidditch field. I need a broomstick! Now! Despite everything, Anna raised a hand in mute protest, then caught herself even as the Ravenclaw and Slytherin Seekers came zooming over, with excellent strategic sense since they weren't actually doing anything. Harry Potter was already retrieving another broomstick from his pouch, a multi-person one. Professor McGonagall saw this and nodded firmly. You stay here, Mr. Potter, unless there is some excellent reason you must be there. I will go at once. You mustn't, squeaked Professor Flitwick, who'd shoved his tiny way through the crowd, occasionally running under someone's legs. His eyes were wide. He looked as though he wanted to faint. You have to stay at Hogwarts, Minerva. You, you're the... Professor Flitwick seemed to be having trouble speaking. Professor McGonagall spun around to face Professor Flitwick, and then stopped, blood draining from her face. Then she seized the broomstick from Harry Potter's hand and presented it to the tiny half-goblin professor. Phileas? All the incipient panic had disappeared from her voice. She now spoke crisply, as though addressing lessons on Monday. Look for the graveyard of which Mr. Potter spoke. Find Miss Granger. Apparate her to St. Mungo's, and then stay by her. I think... I think Transfiguration might have been used in combat there. Professor Quirrell tried to fight Voldemort. Take precautions. Phileas Flitwick nodded without halting and getting on the broomstick. Professor Quirrell's dead! He's dead! The Dark Lord killed him! His body... It's there, in the graveyard. She stumbled back again, feeling it like another punch in her gut. Professor Quirrell had been one of her favorite professors ever. He'd made her rethink everything she'd believed about Slytherin. She'd known in some distant way that he was probably going to die very soon, but to hear that he was really, truly dead... The boy who lived sat down on the bench, as if his legs couldn't support him anymore. Professor McGonagall turned to the crowd, touching her wand to her throat. Quidditch Quidditch is is over! over. Go Go back back to your your dormitories! dormitories. Don't! screamed Harry Potter. Professor McGonagall turned to look at him. Tears were leaking down the boy who lived's cheeks. He looked like the interruption had surprised himself as much as it had surprised anyone else. It was Professor Quirrell's last plot. The boy who lived looked at the Quidditch players, who had now flown to nearby, as though speaking to them directly. His last plot. Harry Potter was floated off by Professor McGonagall to the infirmary. The other professors ran off to oversee who knew what, leaving only Professors Sinestra and Hooch behind. At the stadium, rumors ran wild. Anna repeated everything she could remember hearing as best she could. Something had happened to Dumbledore. Some Death Eaters had been summoned and killed. No, Harry Potter hadn't said which ones. Professor Quirrell had gone out to face the Dark Lord and died for it. You know who had returned and died again. Professor Quirrell was dead. He was dead. In time, most of the students wandered off back to their dormitories to sleep if they could. Anna stayed in the stadium and watched the rest of the game, ignoring her body's need for sleep and her eyes that often blurred with tears. The Ravenclaw team put up a valiant fight, but there was no Quidditch team anywhere that could have defeated the Slytherins that day. Dawn was tinging the sky when the Slytherins won their final game, the Quidditch Cup, and the House Cup.
End chapter 116 Chapter 117 Something to Protect Minerva McGonagall The morning after had come, and all the students had gathered silently around the four tables of Hogwarts, Harry James Potter Evans Varus among them. He had collapsed in exhaustion last night and been awoken in the infirmary next morning, still muzzy, with the philosopher's stone underneath his left sock. The head table looked like a plague had swept it. Dumbledore's throne was gone from the head desk, without replacement, leaving the center of the head table empty. Severus Snape was sitting in a floating seat, the magical equivalent of a wheelchair. Professor Sprout was missing. According to what Harry had been told last night, a court legilimens would examine her to see if any further compulsions remained, but probably no charges would be filed. Harry had emphasized to Professor McGonagall and the Aurors, as hard as he could, that Professor Sprout was probably just a victim. The boy who lived had pronounced that he'd seen no evidence of Sprout's intentional guilt in Voldemort's mind. Professor Flitwick was missing, presumably still staying by Hermione's side. Professor Sinester was missing, and Harry didn't know why or where. The numbness that surrounded Harry's mind was like a mylar blanket protective, if not comforting. There were scenes in his mind of black robes falling and blood spilling, appearing for an instant before being shoved back. He'd process it later, not now. Some other time would be better. Future Harry would have a comparative advantage at coping. Somewhere inside Harry was the fear that it wouldn't hurt, that there would be no price to be paid but that fear also could be put off into the future. No breakfast had appeared on the tables. The students sitting near Harry were waiting in frightened silence. Owls had been prohibited from entering or leaving Hogwarts since early last night. The doors of the Great Hall were opened once more, and forth came Deputy Headmistress Minerva McGonagall. She wore robes of formal black, and her head was bare, denuded of its usual witch's hat. Her grey-brown blonde hair was done up in a coiled braid, as if in preparation for a hat to be placed later. But for now, Harry saw her head bare for the first time. Minerva McGonagall came to the lectern that stood before the head table. All eyes were upon her. I am afraid that I have much news. Minerva's voice was sad within its precision. And most of it is terrible. First, the reason I am the one to speak to you is that the headmaster of Hogwarts, Albus, Percival Wolfric Brian Dumbledore, has been lost. You know who trapped him outside time, and we do not know if he ever can be brought back to us. We, we have lost what may have been the greatest headmaster that Hogwarts has ever had. A susurration of horror rose across the tables. No audible gasps or moans, just the sound of many intaken breaths, most from Gryffindor and some from Hufflepuff and Ravenclaw as well. The ill news had already been known, but now it had also been said by authority. Second, you know who returned briefly but is once again dead. All that remained of him were his hands clutched around Miss Granger's throat. There is no more threat from him, or so we think. Third, Professor Quirrell died with his wand in his hand, facing you-know-who. He was found not far from where you-know-who perished again, a victim of you-know-who's killing curse. Another susurration of verified horror, now from all four tables. Minerva drew another breath. Last night, we also lost what may have been the greatest defense professor in the history of Hogwarts. His scholastic merits alone. Our defense professor has gone by many names, but his true name was David Monroe, as he was the last of the noble and most ancient house of Monroe. His funeral, his second funeral, and the true one, will be held before the most ancient hall of the Wizengamot in two days. 
Yet a wake shall also be held for the defense professor of Hogwarts, for our own Professor Quirrell in this castle. That man also died a Hogwarts teacher, as nobly as a Hogwarts teacher ever did. Harry listened in silence, shoving down the tears that again rose to his eyes. It wasn't even true, let alone unexpected, and yet hearing it still hurt. From where he sat beside, Anthony Goldstein put a comforting hand over Harry's hand, and Harry left it there. Fourth, one piece of exceedingly unexpected and happy news. Hermione Granger is alive and in full health, sound of body and mind. Miss Granger is being observed at St. Mungo's to see if there are any unexpected after-effects from whatever happened to her but she appears to be doing astonishingly well, considering her previous condition. It should have produced wild cheers from Ravenclaw and Gryffindor if the news had come as part of any other package, or if it had been more unexpected. As it stood, Harry saw a few smiles, but they were brief. Maybe they'd jumped for joy earlier, but at the moment there was only silence. Harry understood that. He wasn't cheering either. Not right now. Finally, Minerva McGonagall faltered, then raised her voice. I fear that I have the gravest possible news to share with some of our students. It seems that you-know-who summoned those who were once his followers, and many of them obeyed, whether from terribly misguided loyalty or out of fear for their families if they refused. A sacrifice was required, it seems, to complete you-know-who's resurrection. Or perhaps you-know-who blamed his former followers for his defeat. Thirty-seven bodies were found. More followers outside Azkaban than you-know-who was thought to have. I am afraid... Minerva McGonagall faltered again. I am afraid that among the deceased are the parents of many of our students... No, 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 no! As though by some horrible magnet, Harry's eyes were drawn to the picture of absolute horror that was Draco Malfoy's face, even as the comforting cotton wrap around Harry's thoughts was torn away like thin tissue. How could he not have thought? How could he not have realized? Somewhere in the background, someone was already screaming, and yet the room seemed very silent. Sheila, Flora, and Hestia Caro lost both their parents last night. Students who have lost their fathers include Robert Jugson, Ethan Jugson, Sarah Jugson, Michael McNair, Riley and Randy Rookwood, Lily Liu, Sasha Sprock, Daniel Gibson, Jason Gross, Elsie Ambrose. Maybe Lucius realized. Maybe he was smart enough to stay away. Maybe he'd realized that Voldemort was the one who struck at Draco. Theodore Knott, Vincent Crabbe, Gregory Goyle, Draco Malfoy. This concludes the list. One student sitting at the Gryffindor table let out a single cheer, and was immediately slapped by the Gryffindor witch sitting nearby, hard enough that a muggle would have lost teeth. Thirty points from Gryffindor, and detention for the first month of next year. Professor McGonagall said, her voice hard enough to break stone. Lies! Shrieked a tall Slytherin who'd risen up from the table. Lies, lies. The Dark Lord will return, and he'll, he'll teach you all the meaning of... Mr. Jugson, said Severus Snape's voice. It was also faltering. It didn't sound like the Potions Master at all. It wasn't loud, and yet the Slytherin fell silent. Robert, the Dark Lord killed your father. Robert Jugson let out a scream of terrific fury and turned to run out of the room, and Draco Malfoy folded in on himself like a collapsing house and made sounds that nobody heard because the babble was starting up now. Harry rose six inches from the bench and then stopped. What would you say to Draco? There is nothing you can say to Draco. You can't go over there now and pretend to be his friend? 
You want to make it right? You want to make it better? But you cannot make it right. There is no way you can make right what you have done to him, what you did to Vincent, to Gregory, what you did to Theodore. The world blurred around Harry. He barely saw Padma Patil rise up and make her way toward the Slytherin table and Draco, or Seamus heading toward Theodore. And because Harry had already read his father's science fiction and fantasy collection, because he had already read the scene a dozen times over when it happened to other protagonists, there was an image in Harry's mind of Mad-Eye Moody, of the scarred man called Alistair. And Mad-Eye's image was saying, in just the same voice he'd used to speak to Albus Dumbledore in memory, that the Death Eaters had been pointing their wands at Harry, that they had already chosen to take the Dark Mark that they had been guilty of sins beyond reckoning, and maybe beyond Harry's imagination, that they had foregone the deontological protection of good people and made themselves targetable if there was a strong reason to sacrifice them, that it had been necessary to save Harry's innocent parents from torture and Azkaban, that it had been necessary to protect the world from Voldemort. That plain old ordinary aurors and judges had to do much more morally questionable things than killing sworn and blooded Death Eaters who were pointing wands at them in the course of carrying out ordinary justices that were less clear-cut but still necessary to society. If it were not right to do what Harry had done, if it were not right to do much more morally ambiguous things than what Harry had done, then society as human beings knew it could not exist. Nobody with common sense would blame Harry for doing it. Neville wouldn't blame him. Professor McGonagall wouldn't blame him. Dumbledore wouldn't blame him. Even Hermione would tell him it had been the right thing to do once she knew. And all of this was true. Just as it was also true that some part of Harry's mind had calculated that wiping out the blood purist political elite would make it easier and more convenient to rebuild magical Britain afterward. It hadn't been an important consideration, but it had still been calculated in those instants of rapid thought. A check on the long-term consequences to see if they rated as catastrophic and a decision that they actually rated as pretty much okay. And that check had forgotten that Death Eaters had children at Hogwarts, or that one of them wore the face of Draco's father. It wouldn't have changed anything. It wouldn't have changed anything at all. But that was the truth of the calculation Harry's mind had performed, given only seconds to think. At least Harry could, if the Death Eater survivors were in any sort of financial trouble, do something about that easily enough. Transfigure gold and use the stone to make it permanent. Unless making that much gold would be troublesome to the wizard economy at large, or cause objections from goblins who didn't understand market monetarist economics. Though it wasn't as though Harry didn't also have useful services to sell. Other cotton wrap was also being torn off Harry's thoughts, now. It seems likely... Minerva's voice was not loud, but it cut through all other sounds. That some of our students will also have been stripped last night of those named as their guardians. Should you end up a ward of Hogwarts, please know that I will take the responsibilities of my position with extreme seriousness. You will be extended every courtesy. Your family's vault will be managed well and truly. As best I can, I will treat every one of you as I would my own children. And I will protect you as much as I would protect my own children. No more, no less. I hope that is clear to everyone at Hogwarts. Students nodded rapidly. Good. Then there is one more thing that must be done. With a sad, solemn air... Professor Sinestra emerged from a side entrance. She was wearing white robes instead of her usual brown, and instead of her customary witch's hat, she was wearing a many-tasseled square hat whose colors had faded into mostly gray. In her hands, Professor Sinestra carried the sorting hat. With the air of someone carrying out a ceremony that had not changed in centuries, Aurora Sinestra kneeled on one knee before Minerva McGonagall. 
presenting to her the sorting hat in both hands. Minerva McGonagall took the sorting hat from Professor Sinestra's hands and placed it on her own head. There was a long silence. Headmistress! As Albus Dumbledore is not dead, but only taken from us, I accept this position in the capacity of acting headmistress only, until Dumbledore's return. A piercing cry split the great hall, and Fox was there, overflying all four tables in a slow spiral arc. He passed over each of the tables, humming in his bird's voice, a hum of absolute loyalty that would outlast the death of merely physical fires. Wait, the hum seemed to say. Wait until his return, and be true. Fox circled Minerva McGonagall three times, feathered wings brushing around her as the tears began to creep down her cheeks. Then the bird flew out a window above the hall and was gone. End Chapter 117 Chapter 118 Something to Protect Professor Quirrell The sun shone down on the Scottish green, striking sparks of reflected white from every passing dewdrop or reflective leaf that happened to position itself correctly, a clear blue sky for a funeral. Harry had declined to give the eulogy. He'd declined for the second time. Professor Flitwick had asked him about it weeks ago in May to give Harry time to write his lines before it would become necessary to speak and Harry had said no then, too. So it fell to a sixth-year Gryffindor, Olivia Habrika, who had the fourth-highest total of quirrell points among all the students, and who had been general of an army. The seventeen-year-old girl was tall, and not especially pretty in solid black robes. She was wearing a purple tie, such as Professor Quirrell had sometimes favored. Speaking, under the circumstances, ex tempore, the previous eulogies, written well in advance, had been discarded. Olivia Habrika had a parchment in her left hand, but she wasn't looking at it at all. Professor Quirrell was very sick, the tall girl said, her wavering voice falling into a hush of students, occasionally broken by a muffled sob. I think if Professor Quirrell had been able to fight in the fullness of his power, you know who couldn't have beat him easily and maybe not at all. They say that David Monroe was the only one that you know who was ever afraid of in his day. But... Olivia's voice broke. Professor Quirrell wasn't in the fullness of his power. He was very sick. He had trouble walking by himself. And he went to face the Dark Lord alone. There was a pause then, while the students cried for a while. Olivia wiped away her tears with her sleeve and spoke again. We don't know exactly what happened. I imagine the Dark Lord laughed at him, maybe made fun of the professor for challenging him when he couldn't stand up. Well, he's not laughing now, is he? There were fierce nods from the students, all of them that Harry could see, from Gryffindor to Slytherin. Maybe the Dark Lord knew some way of curing Professor Quirrell, you know who did come back from the dead, after all. Maybe he offered Professor Quirrell his life if Professor Quirrell would serve him. Professor Quirrell smiled and told the Dark Lord it was time for them to play a game called Who's the Most Dangerous Wizard in the World? If you don't know, don't just make stuff up. But Harry didn't say anything. It was what the Lord Voldemort might have tried, and it was what Professor Quirrell might have said back. And they aren't telling us everything, but we can guess what happened next. We all know that Hermione Granger, who is one of the professor's best students, was killed by a troll earlier this year. It must have been the Dark Lord who made it happen. He framed her for the blood cooling charm. Professor Quirrell knew the Dark Lord was behind it, so he stole Miss Granger's body and preserved it, kept it safe. Couldn't blame her for that one. Then Professor Quirrell went out to face the Dark Lord. The Dark Lord killed Professor Quirrell. 
and Hermione Granger came back to life. They say she's alive and whole now and maybe something more. When the Dark Lord tried to seize her, all that was left of him afterward was his burned robes and his hands around Miss Granger's throat. Just as Harry Potter was protected from the killing curse by his mother's love and sacrifice, Professor Quirrell, willingly going out to face the Dark Lord alone, must have called Hermione Granger's spirit back from wherever she was. Not just like that, Harry said from the front row of seats, his own voice hoarse. He had to say something at this point before it got out of control, if it wasn't already out of control. David Monroe was a powerful wizard, more powerful than anyone knew except him and me. I don't think you can bring someone back from the dead just by sacrificing yourself. No one should try doing it that way. Such a beautiful story. It should have been true. It should have been true. I don't know very much about the person behind the professor, Olivia Hebraica said after she got herself under control again. I knew David Monroe wasn't a happy man. He never could cast a Patronus charm. Tears were gathering in Harry's eyes again. It wasn't right. It wasn't fair. Voldemort had killed so many people. He should have died along with his followers. He didn't deserve special treatment. But it hadn't just been Harry's weakness. It had been the Horcruxes. Voldemort couldn't have been killed outright. So Harry could admit it. He was glad. He was glad Professor Quirrell wasn't all gone. But I know said Olivia, tears glistening on her own cheeks. Professor Quirrell is happy wherever he is now. On Harry's left hand, a tiny emerald glowed bright beneath the morning sun. Not heaven, not some faraway star, not a different place, but a better person. I'll show you, someday I'll show you how to be happy. The tall girl glanced down at the parchment she held in her other hand, the first time she'd consulted it. Professor Quirrell, Olivia said, her voice now fiercer and faster, was by far the best professor of battle magic that Hogwarts has ever had. Salazar Slytherin couldn't have been half as good a teacher, no matter what spells he knew. Professor Quirrell told us at the beginning of this year that what he taught us would always be our firm foundation in the arts of defense, and it will be forever. We'll teach it to the new students next year, no matter who we have for a professor. The older students will teach the younger ones. That's the solution to the curse on the defense position. We won't sit around waiting for authority to teach us, and we'll make sure that Professor Quirrell's teachings never die out of Hogwarts. Harry looked at where Professor... No, Headmistress McGonagall was sitting and saw the Headmistress nodding silently, a look that was sad and stern and proud. They haven't let us see Miss Granger yet. Olivia's voice quavered. The girl who revived. But I'll always think of the defense professor when I see her. His sacrifice lives on in her, just as his teachings live on in us. Olivia glanced at where Harry sat, then looked down again at the parchment. Here's to Professor Quirrell, then. The best Slytherin that ever was, what every Slytherin should be. Three cheers for him! Huzzah! 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 No one stayed silent this time, not a single student that Harry could see. End chapter 118 Chapter 119 Something to Protect Albus Dumbledore Harry stood now before the gargoyles that guarded the headmaster's, no, the headmistress's office. He had been summoned by Professor Sinestra, told that it was an emergency, but the gates were not opening for him. Experiment had showed that the stone made one transfiguration permanent every three minutes and fifty-four seconds, 
irrespective of the size of the object transfigured. Just once, holding the Philosopher's Stone up to the light of Harry's most powerful flashlight in an otherwise darkened closet, Harry had thought he'd seen an array of tiny points inside the chunk of crimson glass. But Harry hadn't been able to see it again, and now suspected himself of having imagined it. The stone had no other powers that Harry could detect, nor did it respond to any attempted mental commands. Harry had given himself until noon tomorrow to figure out how to begin using the stone without it being grabbed by someone else, trying not to think about what was still happening, what had always been happening, in the meanwhile. Ten minutes late, Minerva McGonagall approached, moving in a swift stride. Her arms were full of papers, and she was once again wearing the sorting hat. The gargoyles, with a brief sound of grinding stone, bowed low before her. The new password is impermanence, Minerva said to the gargoyles, and they stepped aside. I'm sorry, Mr. Potter, I was delayed. Understood. Minerva mounted the long spiral stairs, climbing instead of waiting to be carried, Harry following behind her. We are meeting with Amelia Bones, Director of the Department of Magical Law Enforcement, with Alistair Moody, whom you've met, and with Bartimius Crouch, Director of the Department of International Magical Cooperation. They are Dumbledore's heirs as much as you or I. How... how's Hermione doing? Harry hadn't had a chance to ask until now. Phileas said she seemed rather in shock, which I suppose is not surprising. She asked where you were, was told you were at a Quidditch game, asked where you really were, and refused to speak with anyone about what happened until she was allowed to talk with you. She was taken to St. Mungo's. The headmistress now sounded slightly perturbed. A standard diagnostic charm showed Miss Granger as a healthy unicorn, in excellent physical condition except that her mane needs combing. Charms to detect active magic have each time detected her as being in the process of transforming into another shape. There was an unspeakable who showed up before Phileas, uh removed him. He performed certain spells he probably ought not to have known, and declared that Hermione's soul was in healthy condition, but at least a mile away from her body. At that point, the senior healers gave up. She's currently alone in a cell with the rats and flies. She's what? I'm sorry, Mr. Potter, that's transfiguration jargon. Miss Granger is in an isolation chamber with a cage of tame rats and a box of flies that will bear offspring in a single day. Logic suggests that whatever mystery underlies her resurrection, it left behind an emanation that is causing the healer's charms to produce gibberish. But if nothing happens to the rats or the fly's offspring, Miss Granger will be declared safe to return to Hogwarts after she wakes up again tomorrow morning. Harry still wasn't sure, wasn't sure at all, what Hermione would think of having been resurrected, at least under these particular circumstances. He didn't actually think Hermione would yell at him for doing it wrong. That was just Harry's brain trying to imagine her as a stereotype. Harry had been legitimately exhausted and not thinking very straight when he'd come up with that cover story, and Hermione would probably understand that part. But he couldn't imagine what Hermione would think. I wonder how Miss Granger will feel about having also vanquished you-know-who. Minerva said reflectively, climbing the moving stairs fast enough that Harry felt out of breath trying to keep up. And people believing the most interesting things about her. You mean, because she's always self-identified as a normal academic genius, and now a bunch of people think of her as the girl who revived and everyone wants to shake her hand? Even though she doesn't remember doing anything to earn it. Even though it was all someone else's work and other people's sacrifices, and she's getting the credit. Even though she doesn't feel like she's actually done anything worthy of the way other people treat her, and she's not sure if she can ever live up to the person they imagine. Gosh, I don't know. I can't imagine what that feels like. Maybe I shouldn't have subjected her to it. But people had to be given something to believe, or heaven knows what they would have made up. Feeling guilty about this would be stupid. The two of them reached the top of the stairs and came into the office filled with dozens of strange objects, all facing a great desk and a mighty throne behind it. 
Minerva's hand passed over one of those objects, the one with golden wibblers, her eyes closing briefly. Then Minerva took off the sorting hat and put it on a hat rack that held three slippers for left feet. She transformed the mighty throne into a simple cushioned chair and the great desk into a round table around which four other chairs rose up. Harry watched it all with a strange pain in his throat. He knew, without either of them saying anything, that there should have been more ceremony for the changing of the chairs, the changing of the table. Much more ceremony, for the first time the headmistress sat down in her new office. But for whatever reason, there wasn't time, and Minerva McGonagall was discarding all that for speed. A wave of Minerva's wand lit the flue fire in the fireplace, even as Minerva sat down into the chair that had been Dumbledore's. Harry quietly took one of the chairs around the table, sitting at Minerva's left. Almost at once, the flu fire burned Emeraldine and whirled out Alistair Moody, who spun around with his wand raised, taking in the whole room at a seeming glance, and then pointed his wand directly at Harry and said, Avada Kedavra. It happened so fast and took him so completely by surprise that Harry's wand wasn't even half raised by the time Alistair Moody finished the incantation. Just checking. Alistair said to the headmistress, whose own wand was now pointed at Alistair, her mouth open as if to say words she couldn't find. Bully would have tried to dodge if he'd taken over the boy's body last night. I'll still need to check the Granger girl, though. Alistair Moody went to Minerva's right and sat down. Harry had thought, in that split second, to try producing a wordless silver Patronus glow from his wand but his wand hadn't been in place to intercept in time, not even close. Well, if I was feeling invincible before, that does for that. What a valuable life lesson, Mr. Moody. Then the flu fire burned green again and spat out the oldest, grimmest, toughest-looking witch Harry had ever seen, like beef jerky given human shape. The old witch did not have her wand in her hand, but she projected an air of authority that was stronger and stricter than Dumbledore's. This is Director Amelia Bones, Mr. Potter, said Headmistress McGonagall, who'd regained her poise. We are still waiting on Director Crouch. The corpse of Bartemius Crouch Jr. was identified among the dead Death Eaters, the old witch said without preamble, even as she continued toward the chairs. It took us entirely by surprise, and I'm afraid Bartemius is in considerable grief about it, on both counts. He will not be with us today. Harry kept the flinch inward. Amelia Bones sat down in a chair, sitting to Moody's own right. Headmistress McGonagall, said the elder witch, still without hesitation or delay. The line of Merlin unbroken, which Dumbledore left to me in Regency, is not responding to my hand. The wizened garment must have a chief warlock who is trustworthy at once. Matters are in great flux in Britain. I must know what Dumbledore has done immediately. Crap. Moody's mad eye was rolling wildly. That's not good. Not good at all. Yes, well... Minerva looked rather apprehensive. I cannot say that for certain. Albus, well, he clearly had an intimation that he might not survive this war. But I do not think he was expecting Miss Granger to come back from the dead and kill Voldemort only hours later. I do not think Albus was expecting that at all. I'm not quite sure what his legacies will make of that. Amelia Bones rose half out of her chair. You mean to imply that the Granger girl may have inherited the line of Merlin unbroken? This is a catastrophe! She is twelve years old! Untested! Surely Albus would not be so irresponsible as to leave the line to whoever happened to defeat Voldemort without knowing who. Well, putting it simply... Minerva's finger squared the paperwork she'd taken with her, now lying on the desk. Albus did think he knew who would defeat Voldemort. There was a prophecy concerning it, a verified one, which now seems to be in abeyance, or... I don't know, Madame Bones. I have one letter from Mr. Potter that I am to give him in the event of Albus's death or other departure, and then another letter that Albus said Mr. Potter would be able to open only after he defeated Voldemort. I'm not sure what will happen to it now. Perhaps Miss Granger will be able to open it? 
or perhaps it can never be opened. Hold up. Mad-Eye Moody reached into his robes, drew out a long, gray-knobbed wand that Harry recognized. It was Dumbledore's wand, of a form and style not like any other wand in Hogwarts. Moody laid the wand on the table. Before we go on any further, Albus left me an instruction or two of his own. Pick up this wand, boy. Harry hesitated, thinking. Albus Dumbledore sacrificed himself for me. He trusted Moody. This probably isn't a trap. Then Harry began to reach for the wand. It leapt up and flew across the table into Harry's hand. And the moment that Harry's fingers grasped the handle, it was like he heard a song, a paean of glory and battle that resonated in his mind. A wave of white fire ran up the handle and over the wood, magnifying as it moved, bursting from the end in a tremendous spray of sparks. Through the wood beneath his fingers ran a sense of strength and constrained danger, like a leashed wolf. Harry was also receiving an impression of distant skepticism, as if the wand had some level of awareness, and it was wondering how the hell it had ended up being held by a Hogwarts first year. Right, said Mad-Eye Moody into the puzzled stares. So it wasn't Miss Granger who defeated Voldy then. Didn't think so. What? Mad-Eye Moody gave Amelia Bones a respectful nod. Albus said this wand goes to whoever defeats its previous master. Took it off old Grindy, he did. Then Voldy defeats Albus yesterday. Do I need to spell it out, Amelia? Amelia Bones was staring at Harry, her mouth wide open. That might not be right. He swallowed another pang of the awful guilt. I mean, Voldemort used me as a hostage because I... I was stupid. And Dumbledore gave himself up to save me. Maybe the wand thinks that counts as my defeating Dumbledore. Um, I did defeat Voldemort, though. Vanquished him. But I think it's better if nobody has any idea I was there. Silence amid the racket of dozens of strange objects. That must have taken some doing. The scarred man inclined his head slowly, a gesture of profound respect. Don't feel too guilty about losing Albus and David and Flamel's son, no matter how stupid you were. You won in the end. All of us put together never could. Just to check, son, you and David also destroyed Voldy's Horcrux? And you're certain it was the real thing? Harry hesitated, weighing up the probable consequences of trust the possible disasters of silence, and then shook his head to Moody in reply. He'd been planning to tell at least McGonagall about what was now inside her school anyway. Voldemort had rather a lot of horcruxes, actually. So instead, I obliviated most of his memories, then transfigured him into this. Harry raised his hand and silently pointed to the emerald on his ring. Once again, silence amid the racket of dozens of strange objects. Huh, Moody said, leaning back in his chair. Minerva and I will be putting some alarms and enchantments on that ring of yours, son, if you don't mind. Just in case you forget to sustain the transfiguration one day. And don't go hunting any other dark wizards, ever. Just live a quiet and peaceful life. The scarred man took a handkerchief and wiped at the beads of sweat that had now appeared on his forehead. But well done, lad. You and David both. May he rest in peace. This was his idea, I'm guessing. Well done, I say. Indeed, said Amelia Bones, who had now regained her composure. We all owe the both of you a tremendous debt of gratitude. But I say again that there is urgent business regarding the line of Merlin Unbroken. I believe... Minerva McGonagall said slowly, That I had best give Albus's letters to Mr. Potter, right now. At the top of her stack of papers now lay a parchment envelope, and a rolled-up parchment scroll sealed with a gray ribbon. The headmistress gave Harry the parchment envelope first, 
and Harry opened it. If you are reading this, Harry Potter, then I have fallen to Voldemort, and the quest now lies in your hands. Though it may shock you to learn, this was the end that I wished in my heart would come to pass. For as I write this, it yet seems possible that Voldemort may fall by my own hand. And then, in time, I shall myself become the darkness you must overcome to enter fully into your power. For it was said once that you might need to raise your hand against your mentor, the one who made you, who you loved. It was said that you might be my downfall. If you are reading this, then that shall never come to pass, and I am glad of it. Even so, Harry, I would spare you this, the lonely fight against Voldemort. I write this, vowing to shelter you as long as I can, no matter the final cost to myself. But if I have failed, then know that I am glad of it, in my own selfish way. With my passing, there is none left to oppose Voldemort as an equal, save you. His shadow will fall long and terrible over magical Britain, and many will suffer and die for it. That shadow will not lift until you destroy its source, until you cleanse the heart of the darkness. How you are to do this, I do not know. If Voldemort knows not the power you bear, then neither do I. You must find that power within yourself. You must learn to wield it. You must become Voldemort's final judge, and I beg you not to make the error of showing him mercy. My wand, which I have left to you in Moody's keeping, you must not dare to wield against Voldemort. For when that wand's master is defeated, it passes to the victor in turn. When you have conquered my conqueror, then the wand will answer truly to your hand. But if you try to turn it against Voldemort before then, it will betray you for certain. Keep it out of Voldemort's grasp at all costs. I should advise you not to wield that wand at all, yet it is a device of great power which you might need in some desperate case. But if you pick it up, you must fear its treachery at all times. In my absence, the wizen gamut will inevitably fall to Malfoy. The line of Merlin unbroken I have passed to you, with Amelia Bones as your regent, until you come of age or come into your power. But she cannot oppose Malfoy for long, not with myself gone and Voldemort returned to advise him. Soon, I think, the Ministry will fall, and Hogwarts will become the last fortress. To Minerva I have left the Hogwarts keys, but you alone are its prince, and she will help you however she can. Halister now leads the Order of the Phoenix. Heed his words well, both his advice and his confidences. It is one of my life's greatest regrets that I did not heed Alistair more and sooner. That you will, in the end, defeat Voldemort, I have no doubt. For that will be only the beginning of your life's destiny. Of that, too, I am certain. When you have vanquished Voldemort, when you have saved this country, then, I hope... You may embark upon the true meaning of your days. Hurry then to begin. Yours in death, or in whatever. Dumbledore. P.S. The passwords are Phoenix Price, Phoenix Fate, and Phoenix Egg, spoken within my office. Minerva can move those rooms to wherever you can reach them more easily. Harry folded up the parchment and put it back into the envelope, frowning thoughtfully, then took the grey ribbon scroll from the headmistress. When the long grey wand in Harry's hand touched the ribbon, it fell away at once, and Harry unrolled the scroll and read it. Dear Harry James Potter Evans Verris, If you are reading this, you have defeated Voldemort. Congratulations on that. I hope you had some time in which to celebrate before you opened this scroll, because the news in it is not cheerful. During the first Wizarding War, 
There came a time when I realized that Voldemort was winning, that he would soon hold all within his hand. In that extremity, I went into the Department of Mysteries, and I invoked a password which had never been spoken in the history of the line of Merlin unbroken, did a thing forbidden, and yet not utterly forbidden. I listened to every prophecy that had ever been recorded. And so, I learned that my troubles were far worse than Voldemort. From certain seers and diviners have come an increasing chorus of foretellings that this world is doomed to destruction. And you, Harry James Potter Evans Varys, are one of those foretold to destroy it. By rights, I should have ended your line of possibility, stopped you from ever being born, as I did my best to end all the other possibilities I discovered on that day of terrible awakening. Yet, in your case, Harry, and in your case alone, the prophecies of your apocalypse have loopholes, though those loopholes be ever so slight. Always, he will end the world, not he will end life. Even when it was said that you would tear apart the very stars in heaven, it was not said that you would tear apart the people. And so, it being clear that this world is not meant to last, I have gambled literally everything upon you, Harry James Potter Evans Varys. There were no prophecies of how the world might be saved, so I found the prophecies that offered loopholes in the destruction, and I brought about the strange and complex conditions for those prophecies to come to pass. I ensured that Voldemort discovered a certain one of those prophecies, and so, even as I had feared, condemned your parents to death and made you what you are. I wrote a strange hint in your mother's potions textbook, having no idea why I must, and this proved to show Lily how to help her sister, and ensured you would gain Petunia Evans' heartfelt love. I snuck invisibly into your bedroom in Oxford, and administered the potion that is given to students with time-turners to extend your day's cycle by two hours. When you were six years old, I smashed a rock that was on your windowsill, and to this day I cannot imagine why. All in the desperate hope that you can pass us through the eye of the storm, somehow end this world, and yet bring out its people alive. Now that you have passed the preliminary test of defeating Voldemort, I place my all in your hands. All the tools I can possibly give you, the line of Merlin unbroken, the command of the Order of the Phoenix, all my wealth and all my treasures, the Elder Wand out of the Deathly Hallows, the loyalty of such of my friends as may heed me. I have left Hogwarts in Minerva's care, for I do not think you will have time for it, but even that is yours if you demand it from her. One thing I do not give you, and that is the prophecies. Upon the moment of my departure, they will be destroyed, and no future ones will be recorded, for it was said that you must not look upon them. If you think this frustrating, believe me when I say that even your wit cannot comprehend what frustration you have been spared. I will die, or be lost by you, or in some other way be taken from you. The prophecies are unclear, naturally, without ever once knowing what the future truly holds, or why I must do what I do. It is all cryptic madness, and you are well rid of it. There can only be one king upon the chessboard. There can only be one piece whose value is beyond price. That piece is not the world. It is the world's people, wizard and muggle alike, goblins and house elves and all. While survives any remnant of our kind, that peace is yet in play, though the stars should die in heaven. And if that peace be lost, the game ends. Know the value of all your other pieces, and play to win. Signed, Albus.
Harry held the parchment scroll for a long time, staring at nothing. There were times when the phrase, that explains it, didn't really seem to cover it. But nonetheless, that explained it. Absently, Harry rolled up the parchment scroll in his fist, still staring at nothing. What does it say? said Amelia Bones. It's a confession letter. Turns out, Dumbledore's the one who killed my pet rock. This is not a time for jokes! Are you the true holder of the line of Merlin Unbroken? Yes, Harry said absently, his mind occupied with thoughts that were, by any objective quantification, overwhelmingly more important. The old witch was sitting very still in her chair. She turned her head and locked eyes with Minerva McGonagall. Meanwhile, Harry's brain, which was juggling way too many possibilities over way too many time horizons, some of them involving literally billions of years and stellar disassembly procedures, declared cognitive bankruptcy and started over. All right, what's the first thing I have to do to save the world? No, make it even more local. What do I have to do today? Besides figuring out what to do, that is. And I'd better not delay before looking at whatever Dumbledore left me in the Phoenix's egg room. Harry raised his eyes from the rolled-up parchment and looked at Professor, at Headmistress McGonagall, at Mad-Eye Moody, and at the leathery-looking witch, as though seeing them for the first time. Though he was, in fact, seeing Amelia Bones for mostly the first time. Amelia Bones head of the Department of Magical Law Enforcement, whom Albus Dumbledore had thought worthy to lead the Wizengamot, at least temporarily. Her cooperation would be invaluable, maybe necessary, for... for whatever was headed Harry's way. Dumbledore had chosen her, and he'd read prophecies Harry hadn't seen. Amelia Bones, who had thought she'd been appointed regent over the line of Merlin unbroken and made the next chief warlock, only to find that instead the position had gone to, apparently, an eleven-year-old boy. You will now, said the voice of Hufflepuff inside his head, you will now be polite. You will not be your usual brand of bloody idiot because the fate of the world might just depend on it. Or not. We don't even know. I'm terribly sorry about all this, Harry Potter said, then paused to see what effect, if any, this polite statement had produced. Minerva seems to think that you will not take offense to honest words. Harry nodded. His Ravenclaw part wanted to include the disclaimer about that being different from people blatantly trying to push you down while crying that you were intolerant of criticism, but Hufflepuff vetoed. Whatever she had to say, Harry would hear. I do not wish to speak ill of the departed, but since time immemorial, the line of Merlin Unbroken has passed to those who have thoroughly demonstrated themselves to be not only good people, but wise enough to distinguish successors who are themselves both good and wise. A single break anywhere along the chain and the succession might go astray and never return. It was a mad act for Dumbledore to pass the line to you at such a young age, even having made it conditional upon your defeat of you-know-who. A tarnish upon Dumbledore's legacy. That is how it will be seen. The old witch hesitated, her eyes still watching Harry. I think it best that nobody outside this room ever learn of it. Um, you don't think very much of Dumbledore, I take it. I thought... Well, Albus Dumbledore was a better wizard than I, and a better person than I, in more ways than I can easily count. But the man had his faults. Because, um, I mean, Dumbledore knew everything you just said. About my being young and how the line works. You're acting like you think Dumbledore was unaware of those facts or just ignoring them when he made his decision. It's true that sometimes stupid people, like me, make decisions that crazy. But not Dumbledore. He was not mad. Harry swallowed, forcing a sudden moisture away from his eyes. I think... 
I'm beginning to realize Dumbledore was the only sane person in all of this all along. The only one who was doing the right things for anything like the right reasons. Madame Bones was cursing under her breath, low, dire imprecations that were making Minerva McGonagall twitch. I'm sorry. Mad-Eye was grinning, the scarred face twisting up in a smile. Always knew Albus was up to something he never told the rest of us. Lad, you have no idea how hard it is for me not to use my eye on that scroll. Harry quickly shoved the scroll into his mokeskin pouch. Alistair! The old witch's voice was rising. You are a man of sense. You cannot think the lad able to fill Dumbledore's socks. Not today. Dumbledore, Harry said, the name tasting strange on his tongue, did make one wrong assumption when he made his decisions. He thought we'd be fighting Voldemort for years, all of us together. He didn't know I'd vanquish Voldemort immediately. It was the right thing for me to do. It saved a lot of lives compared to fighting a long battle. But Dumbledore thought you would have years to learn me, trust me. And instead, it was all over in an evening. Can't you just pretend that we've been fighting Voldemort for years and I earned your trust and everything? So that I'm not penalized for winning more quickly than Dumbledore expected? You're still a first year in Hogwarts. You cannot take Dumbledore's place, whatever his intentions. Right, that whole looking like an eleven-year-old thing. Harry's hand came up, rubbed at his nose where his glasses lay. I suppose I could just use the stone, change myself to look like ninety. I am not a fool. I know you are no ordinary child. I have seen you speak to Lucius Malfoy, watched you frighten off a Dementor and witness Fox grant your plea. Anyone with wisdom who saw you before the wizengament, by which I mean myself and at most two others, could guess that you had absorbed some portion of you-know-who's shredded soul on the night of his undeath, but subdued it and turned his knowledge to good ends. There was a slight pause in the room. Well, yes, of course. Minerva McGonagall sighed, slumped a bit in the headmistress's chair. As Albus clearly knew from the very beginning, but thoughtfully declined to warn me about in any way whatsoever. Right. I knew that. Yep. Perfectly obvious. Wasn't confused at all. I guess that's close enough to the truth. So, um, what's the problem, exactly? The problem is that you are a bubbling, unstable blend of a Hogwarts first year and you know who. She paused, as though waiting for something. I'm getting better about that, Harry said, since she seemed to be waiting on his reply. Quite rapidly, in fact. More importantly, it's not something Dumbledore didn't know. The old witch continued. Giving away your fortune and going in debt to Lucius Malfoy to keep your best friend out of Azkaban, as much as it demonstrates your upstanding moral character, also demonstrates that you cannot corral the wizengamot. I can see now that you did the right thing for yourself, the thing you had to do to maintain your lease on sanity and hold back your inner darkness. But you also did a thing that Merlin's heir must not do. A sentimental leader can be far worse than a selfish one. Albus, master and servant of a phoenix, was barely survivable, and even he opposed you that day. Amelia gestured in the direction of Mad-Eye Moody. Alistair has hardness. He has cunning. He still does not have the talent for government. You, Harry Potter, do not yet have the sternness, the capacity for sacrifice, to direct even the Order of the Phoenix. And being what you are, you must not try to become that person. Not now. Not at your age. Align and fuse your divided soul in your own time, if you possibly can. Do not try to be Chief Warlock while you are doing it. If Albus thought that was a good idea, he was crafting a nicer story at the expense of real-world practicality. I do think the man had a problem with that. Harry's eyes were a bit wide, listening to all this. Um... What exactly do you think is going on in here? Harry tapped his head just above his ear. 
I imagine that inside you is the soul of a boy who remains honest and true, gathering his will to force down the fragment of Voldemort's spirit that tries to consume him, even as it howls at him that he is sentimental and weak. <laughs> Did you just giggle? Sorry, but seriously, it wasn't ever that bad. More like having a lot of bad habits I needed to break. Ahem. <clears throat> Mr. Potter, I think at the start of this year it was that bad. Bad habits that chained into and triggered each other. Yes, those are a bit more of a problem. <sighs> and you, Madam Bones. Uh, sorry if I'm wrong about this, but my guess is that you're feeling a bit upset that the line went to an 11-year-old? Not the way you are thinking, though it is natural for you to suspect me. The position of Chief Warlock is not one that I will find pleasant, even compared to the horrors of magical law enforcement. Albus persuaded me on this matter, and I would say that it took some convincing, but the truth is that I did not waste his time in an argument I expected to lose. I knew I would hate the task, and I knew I would do it anyway. Minerva says you have some amount of common sense, especially when others remind you of it. Can you really see yourself standing upon the Wizengamot's high dais? Are you sure it is not some remnant of you-know-who that imagines himself suited to the position, or even desires it at all? Harry took off his glasses and massaged his forehead. His scar still ached a bit from the damage he'd done by picking at it yesterday until it bled in a suitably dramatic fashion. I do have some common sense, and yes, being Chief Warlock sounds like a huge amount of aggravation, and a job that, in reality, does not fit me the tiniest bit. The trouble is, um, I'm not sure the line of Merlin is just about being Chief Warlock. There's, um, I suspect that there's weird other stuff that goes along with it. And that Dumbledore meant me to take responsibility for the other stuff. And that the other stuff is possibly quite amazingly important. Crap. Then Alistair Moody repeated, Crap. Kid, should you even be saying this to us? I don't know. If there's a user's manual, I haven't looked at it yet. Crap. And if these other matters require sternness and sacrifice? If they test you as you were tested before the Wizengament? I am old, Harry Potter, and I am not without knowledge of mysteries. You have seen how I was able to perceive your own nature at nearly a glance. Amelia, what would have happened if you'd had to fight you-know-who last night? The old witch shrugged. I would have died, I expect. You'd have lost. And the boy who lived didn't just take out Voldy. He set it up so that his good friend Hermione Granger came back from the dead at the same time Voldy resurrected himself. There's no way in hell or double hell that was an accident. And I don't think it was David's idea either. Amy, the truth is none of us know what the Keeper of Merlin's legacy has to do. But we're not the right kind of crazy for this crap. Amelia Bones frowned. Alistair. You know I've dealt with strange things before. Dealt with them quite well, in my opinion. Yeah, you dealt with the crap so you could go back to real life. You're not the kind of crazy that builds a castle out of the crap and lives there. Moody sighed. Amy, on some level you know exactly why Albus had to leave who knows what job to the poor kid. The old witch's fists clenched on the table. Do you have any idea the disaster it would be for Britain? Call me sane, but I cannot accept that outcome. I have worked too long towards this day to see it fall apart now. Now of all times! Excuse me, is there any reason why Mr. Potter cannot simply instruct the line that Madame Bones is his regent for the position of Chief Warlock, but not anything having to do with the Department of Mysteries until he comes of age? If Albus could tell the line to appoint a regent only until Voldemort's defeat, it is clearly capable of following complex orders. Slowly, this unexpected hammer blow of common sense was absorbed by everyone present. Harry opened his mouth to agree to appoint Amelia Bones his regent for Wizengamot-related matters, and then hesitated again. Um, 
Madam Bones, I would much prefer it if you took charge of handling the wizengamot instead of me. In that we are agreed. Shall we let it be done? But there was a sort of frustrated dropping back of the others. What is the problem, Mister Potter? Said the headmistress in a voice that indicated she hoped it was nothing serious. Um, I think there's a couple of things I might have to do very soon that could prove politically controversial, and in exchange for handing over the line's political power to Madame Bones, I'm going to want her um cooperation on some things. Amelia Bones exchanged another long stare with Minerva McGonagall. Then she looked back at Harry Potter. I am indignant at your request. Your hesitancy has told me that you are weak and unused to bargaining, and will probably fold if I push back. Harry closed his eyes. Slightly dark-tinged Harry opened them. All right. Let me rephrase. I don't mean to interfere with your work on a day-to-day or even month-to-month basis, but I can't just toss off the final responsibility that Dumbledore left me. I'm not going to owl you bizarre parchments out of nowhere. There can be discussions first, but at some point I may have to give you an order. If you refuse the order, I might have to take back the line's wizengamot functions and assume direct control. Can you handle that? And if I say no, slight, slight the dark tinge. I don't have an alternative to you lined up. I could start by asking Augusta Longbottom who she thought might be suitable and work from there. But it may be important that we keep to Dumbledore's plan as much as possible, since I don't know exactly why he did the things he did, and he thought Amelia Bones should be Chief Warlock for a time. I'm not going to pull Merlin's name on you, but no, strike that. I am going to pull Merlin's name on you. This might or might not be insanely important. The old witch thought for a time, her eyes going from person to person around the table. I am not satisfied with this," she said after a time. "But the wizengamot must be called to order soon. It will do for now." Slowly, the old witch reached into her robes and took out a short rod of stone, dark stone. She placed the rod on the table before Harry. Take what is yours, and then do please give it back. Harry reached out his hand to take it. In the moment that Harry's fingers first touched the dark stone, nothing happened. Well, perhaps Merlin hadn't been given to melodrama. That could explain why his final legacy looked like a small, unassuming dark rod. If that was all that was needed for its function, that would be all that was there. Harry took up the line, frowning at it. I'd like to appoint Amelia Bones as my regent for wizengamot-related functions. Then the thought occurring to him that he needed to specify a stopping point to define a regency, Harry added, "Until I say that I've taken it back." Then Harry made a face. He'd been hoping for more from the line, but it was just a key to places in the Department of Mysteries where interesting things were kept, or to seals where Merlin and his successors had stashed things that shouldn't be destroyed but ought to be kept from general circulation. Aside from that, the line didn't do much. The line didn't let you bypass the interdict of Merlin either. No, not even if the fate of the galaxy was at stake. Not even if the person seemed sane, had taken an unbreakable vow, and honestly believed the world was about to be destroyed. Otherwise, Merlin had dreamed of a long run, a world that would last for eons and not just centuries. The world had no reason not to last forever if the truly dangerous powers were removed and kept gone. Conversely, a single loophole in the safeguards made the world's destruction only a matter of time. Some day, Merlin's line would pass to the wrong person. It could reject the obviously unworthy, but eventually, it would pass into hands too subtly flawed for the line to detect. This was inevitable when dealing with human beings. And Harry needed to keep that in mind before he sealed something where future line holders could retrieve it.
The disaster of its inevitable misuse someday needed to be outweighed by its benefits over the next few thousand years. Harry let out a small sad sigh under his breath. Merlin, you idiot. Thinking that didn't unlock any final safeguards. There wasn't anything currently on fire in the Department of Mysteries, so Harry carefully placed the line back on the table. Thank you. The old witch picked up the rod of dark stone. Do you know how I am to use it to call the Wizengamot to order? Or, never mind, I shall just try striking the podium. That seems obvious enough. To the rest of the country, of course. I am the chief warlock so far as anyone knows except us four. Harry hesitated. Then he imagined the owls he would receive if anyone knew he was allowed to second-guess the chief warlock and what that would do to Amelia's negotiating power. Fine. Amelia tucked the rod back into her robes. I will not say it was a pleasure doing business with you, boy who lived, but it could have been much worse. Thank you kindly for that. Harry was already feeling worried about the exact balance of power here from the way Madame Bones was acting. The others had, quite logically, deduced that it had been mostly David Monroe who'd planned the way to defeating Voldemort, which meant they were still underestimating him. It might take a crisis of some type, with Harry figuring it out successfully for once, instead of screwing it up, before Amelia Bones started to respect his authority or believe in it at all, actually. So, any weirdness for me that you would have brought to Dumbledore while he was around? Amelia looked thoughtful. Since you ask, I can think of three things indeed. First, we don't have the faintest notion what ritual was used to sacrifice the Death Eaters and resurrect you-know-who. It corresponds to no known legend, and the magic traces from the ritual have been eradicated. So far as my auras can tell, everyone's heads fell off their necks due to natural causes. Except for Walden McNair, who was killed by magical fire after firing a killing curse from his wand. A very mysterious ritual indeed. She was giving Harry Potter a rather precise look. Harry considered this, choosing his words carefully. Voldemort had said he'd put up wards, so Harry had been confident of not being observed by time-turned aurors. But still... I think this is a matter you don't need to investigate too hard, Madam Bones. The old witch grinned slightly. We can't be seen to go easy on the investigation of so many noble deaths, Harry Potter. When I heard retold your particular account of David's last stand, I made certain to send investigators whom I considered reliable in the usual quality of their work. Auror Nobs and Auror Colin, in fact, who are widely respected outside my department. I found their report to be quite fascinating reading. Amelia paused. There's a possibility that Augustus Rookwood left a ghost. Exercise it before anyone talks to it, Harry said, conscious of the sudden hammering of his heart. Yes, sir, the old witch said dryly. I shall disrupt the soul's anchoring a little and none shall be the wiser when it fails to materialize. The second matter is that there was a still-living human arm found among the Dark Lord's things. Bellatrix! Harry's mind had leapt back, made the connection that ongoing trauma had blurred. I think that was Bellatrix Black's arm. Lesoth Lestrange hadn't been named as someone who'd lost a parent. Oh, bloody hell! She's still out there, isn't she? Can you use her arm to track her down somehow? Amelia Bones had acquired a sour look. I see. As I was saying, a still-living human arm was found among the Dark Lord's things, but it proved to be easily incinerated. What idiot! Harry stopped himself. No, not an idiot. Because immediately destroying dark objects is department policy. Because of past experiences with rings that really should have been dropped into volcanoes immediately. Right? Moody and Amelia nodded in unison. Good guess, son. It might seem literarily inevitable that Harry's past stupidity was going to come back and haunt him in some horrible fashion later. But that was no reason not to try subverting the plot. 
I expect you've thought of this already, but the obvious next step is to put out your equivalent of an international bulletin for a thin witch missing her left arm. Oh, and add twenty-five thousand galleons pledged from me. Headmistress, it's fine. Please trust me on this. To whatever reward is being offered. Well said. The old witch leaned forward slightly. The third and final matter. There was one truly puzzling element to last night's events, and I'm curious to see what you make of it, Harry Potter. Found among the corpses was the head and the body of Sirius Black. What? Yelled Moody, starting half from his chair. I thought he was an Azkaban. So he is. We checked that at once. The Azkaban guards reported that Sirius Black was still in his cell. Black's head and body have been transported to Saint Mungo's morgue and show the same cause of death as the other Death Eaters. That is to say, his head spontaneously fell off. I am also told that Sirius Black is, as of this morning, sitting in the corner of his cell, rocking back and forth with his head between his hands. No other duplicate Death Eaters have been found yet. There was a pause filled with ticking and whooping things as people considered this. Ah, that's not possible, even by you know who standards of possibility, is it? I would have thought so too when I was your age, dear. It is the sixth strangest thing I have ever seen. You see, son, this sort of thing is why nobody, even me, can ever be paranoid enough. The scarred man tilted his head, looking thoughtful as his bright blue eye kept ever roving. Twin brother concealed from the rest of the world, while Perga Black gives birth to twins, couldn't bear to kill one. New old Pollux would demand it. Nah, ain't buying it. Any ideas, Mr. Potter? Or is this another matter into which my department should not inquire too closely? Harry closed his eyes and thought. Sirius Black had hunted down Peter Pettigrew instead of fleeing the country, as common sense would have suggested. Black had been found in the middle of the street, surrounded by bodies, laughing. Nothing left of Pettigrew except one finger. Pettigrew had been a spy for the light, not a double agent, but somebody who snuck around and found things out. One of the conspiracy theories about Pettigrew had been that he was an animagus, since he'd been good at ferreting out secrets even in his Hogwarts years. Dementors sapped all the magic in their vicinity. Professor Quirrell had said something about a particular type of magic that rearranged flesh, like a Muggle Smith reshaping metal with hammer and tongs. Harry opened his eyes again. Was Peter Pettigrew a secret metamorph magus? Amelia Bones's face changed. She made a single croaking noise and fell backward within her chair. Yes, in fact. Why? Sirius Black confunded Peter Pettigrew to force him to change shape and pretend to be black. By the time the confundus wore off, Peter was an Azkaban and couldn't change back. The Aurors are used to people in Azkaban saying absolutely anything to get out, so they didn't listen while Peter Pettigrew was screaming about it over and over again until his voice wore out. Even Mad-Eye Moody's face showed the horror. Then, in retrospect, said Harry's voice, which seemed to be operating entirely on automatic. You should have been suspicious when you managed to get that one Death Eater hauled off to Azkaban without a trial. We thought Malfoy was distracted; that he was only trying to save himself. There were other Death Eaters we managed to get then, like Bellatrix. Harry nodded, feeling like his neck and head were moving on puppet strings. The Dark Lord's most fanatic and devoted servant. A natural nucleus of opposition for anyone who contested Lucius's control of the Death Eaters. You thought Lucius was distracted. Get him out of there! Minerva McGonagall's voice rose to a scream. Get him out of there! Amelia Bones shoved herself up from the chair, whirled on the flue. Stop! Everyone looked at Harry with astonishment. None more than Minerva McGonagall. Something else seemed to have taken over Harry's voice. 
There's four things we still need to discuss. An innocent man has been in Azkaban for ten years, eight months, and fourteen days. He can stay there a few minutes longer. That's how urgent those four things are. You, you should not try to be this person at your age. First, I think we should look at the complete police records on every other Death Eater that went to Azkaban while Lucius was distracted. Can you compile that by tonight? Within the hour. Amelia Bones looked gray. Harry nodded. Second, Azkaban is over. You'll need to start preparations now to move the prisoners to Nurmengard or other secure non-dementor prisons, and to provide treatment for their dementor exposure. I. The old witch seemed bent, diminished. I do not think that even with this scandal, that the remainder of the wizen gamut will bend. And the dementors must be fed, not so much as we have fed them, but they must be given some victims, or they will roam the world, prey on innocence. It doesn't matter what the wizened gamut says, because, because. Harry took a deep <sighs> breath, steadied himself. He thought he could see the shape now of the immediate future, could see it stretching out before him like a golden pathway lit with sunlight. Was this also written in the book of time that I must not see? Because if I'm right about what comes next, then sometime very soon, Hermione Granger, the girl who revived, is going to go to Azkaban and destroy all the Dementors there. Impossible. Merlin, oh dear Merlin, that's what happened to the Dementor that Dumbledore lost. That's why they're afraid of you, and now her as well. What is this? What is all this? If Hermione believes that death can be defeated, whether or not she could have believed that before, she'll believe it now. An authorized portkey to Azkaban would be appreciated. Harry's voice broke again. Tears were streaming down his cheeks. She can't die. I have her Horcrux, but Hermione doesn't need to know about that. Not for one more week. If she's willing to risk her own life to end this, though I think she might make her own way there. Harry. Harry was crying now, huge ragged breaths bursting from him, but he didn't stop talking. Somewhere out there, Peter Pettigrew was waiting while Harry cried. Somewhere out there, everyone was waiting while he cried. Third. Somewhere just inside the wards of Hogwarts, in a highly defensible position, but where emergency cases can be portkeyed in from just outside the wards, there's going to be a high security hospital with very powerful guards that have taken unbreakable vows. I don't, I don't care how much gold it takes to pay for the vows. It genuinely does not matter anymore. And, and Alistair Moody is going to design the security architecture and go completely overboard on paranoia without being constrained by a budget or sanity or common sense. Only it has to open soon. Couldn't stop talking to cry. Harry, both of them think you've gone mad. They don't know you well enough to know better. You need to slow down and explain. Instead, Harry reached into his pouch and signed letters with his fingers, and lifted out his fingers straining a five kilo chunk of gold larger than his fist from when he'd been experimenting this morning. It made a heavy thud as it landed on the table. Moody reached over and tapped it with his wand, and then his throat made an incomprehensible sound. That's your starting budget, Alister. If you need money right away. Nicholas Flamel didn't make the Philosopher's Stone. He stole it. Dumbledore didn't know the secret history, but Monroe did. Once you know how it works, the stone can do complete restoration to full health and youth every two hundred and thirty-four seconds. Three hundred sixty people per day. One hundred and thirty-four thousand healings per year. <laughs> That should be enough to stop all the wizards everywhere. 
and all the goblins and house elves and whoever from dying of old age or anything else. Harry was wiping away tears over and over. Flamel had more blood on his hands than a hundred Voldemorts for all the people he could have saved and didn't. This whole time, Moody, the Philosopher's Stone could have healed all your scars and given you back your leg any time Flamel felt like it. Dumbledore didn't know. I'm sure he didn't know. Harry smiled shakily. I can't imagine you as a teenage witch, Madam Bones, but I bet it looks good on you. <laughs> That'll give you more energy for trying to keep the Wizengamot from messing with me. <laughs> because if they get the idea that the stone is something they can mess with in any way, <laughs> tax, regulate, I don't care. Hogwarts is going to secede from Britain and become its own country. Headmistress... Hogwarts is no longer dependent on the Ministry for Gold, or for that matter, food. You may reform the educational curriculum at will. <laughs> I'm thinking we may want to add some more advanced courses soon, especially in muggle studies. Fourth, Harry said, and then stopped. Fourth, begin preparations for an orderly takedown of the Statute of Secrecy and to provide magical healing on a mass scale to the Muggle world. Those who oppose this agenda in any way may be denied services by the stone. Harry's lips couldn't move. Not wouldn't. Couldn't. With six billion Muggles thinking creatively about how to use magic... Transfiguring antimatter was just one idea. It wasn't even the most destructive idea. There were also black holes and negatively charged strangelets. And if black holes couldn't be transfigured because they didn't already exist as magic defined to within some spatial radius, there was just transfiguring lots and lots of nuclear weapons and black plague that could reproduce before the transfiguration wore off. And Harry hadn't even thought about the problem for five minutes, but it didn't matter because he'd already thought of enough. Someone would think of it. Someone would talk. Someone would try it. The probability was as close to certainty as made no difference. What happened if you transfigured a cubic millimeter of up quarks? Just the up quarks without any down quarks to bind them. Harry didn't even know, and up quarks were certainly a kind of substance that already existed. All it might take was one single Muggleborn who knew the names of the six quarks deciding to try it. That could be the clock ticking down to the prophesied end of the world. Harry would have tried to deny the thought, rationalize it away. He couldn't do that either. It wasn't a thing Harry Potter would do. Like water flowing downhill, Harry Potter would take no chances when it came to not destroying the world. Fourth! Amelia Bones was looking like she'd been hit repeatedly in the face with a planet. What comes fourth? Never mind. Harry's voice did not break. He did not fold over sobbing. There were still lives he could save, and those took precedence. Never mind. Chief Warlock Bones, I give the regency of the Wizengamot into your hands. Please use that position to announce internationally that the stone's healing power will soon be made available to all, and that meanwhile, all dying patients are to be kept alive at any cost, no matter what magic is required to do it. That announcement is your absolute priority. When you have done that, you may rescue Peter Pettigrew and tell your old department to begin preparations for shutting down Azkaban. Then, please have someone prepare a full list of imprisoned Death Eaters and what was said at their trials and whether Lucia seemed strangely uninterested in defending them. Thank you. That's all. Amelia Bones turned without another word and dashed into the flue like it was her own self that was on fire. And someone? Harry's voice broke again now that it was all set in motion and crying wasn't costing time. 
though the vast majority of total lives at stake had turned out not to be savable just yet. Someone has to. Someone tell Remus Lupin. End chapter 119. Chapter 120. Something to Protect. Draco Malfoy. The boy sat in an office near to where the once deputy headmistress had held court. His tears had run dry hours ago. Now there was only the waiting to see what would become of him, the orphan ward of Hogwarts, whose life and happiness lay in the hands of his family's enemies. The boy had been called to this room, and he had come because there was nothing else to do and nowhere else to go. Vincent and Gregory had left his side, called back by their mothers for their father's hurried funerals. Perhaps the boy should have gone with them, but he could not bring himself to do so. He would not have been able to act the part of a Malfoy. The feeling of emptiness that filled him up was so profound that it left no room even for pretended courtesy. Everyone was dead. His father was dead, and his godfather, Mr. McNair, and his fallback godfather, Mr. Avery. Even Sirius Black, his mother's cousin, had somehow managed to die, and the last remnant of House Black was no friend to any Malfoy. Everyone was dead. There came a knock upon the office's door, and then, when the boy made no reply, the door opened, revealing... Go away, Draco Malfoy said to the boy who lived. He couldn't muster any force in the words. I will soon, Harry Potter said as he stepped into the room. But there's a decision to be made, and only you can make it. Draco turned his head toward the wall, because just looking at Harry Potter took more energy than he had left in him. You have to decide what happens to Draco Malfoy after this. I don't mean that in any ominous way. No matter what, you're still going to grow up to be the rich heir of a noble and most ancient house. The thing is... The thing is, there's a horrible truth you don't know, and I keep thinking that if you knew, you'd tell me not to be your friend anymore. And I don't want to stop being your friend. But to just... never tell you, and always maintain that lie so I can go on being your friend... I can't do that. It's also wrong. I don't... want this anymore. I don't want to be manipulating you. I've hurt you too much already. Then stop trying to be my friend. You're no good at it anyway. The words rose up into Draco's consciousness and were rejected from his lips. He felt like he'd mostly lost Harry already from the games Harry had played with their friendship, the lies and manipulations. And yet the thought of going back to Slytherin alone maybe without Vincent and Gregory if their mothers terminated the arrangement. Draco didn't want to do that. He didn't want to go back to Slytherin and live out his life among only people who'd agreed to be sorted into Slytherin House. Draco was barely sensible enough to remember how many of his real friends were also friends with Harry that Padma was a Ravenclaw, and even Theodore was a chaotic lieutenant. All that remained of Malfoy House was a tradition now, and that tradition said it wasn't clever to tell the war's victor to go away and stop trying to be friends with you. All right, Draco said emptily. Tell me. That's what I'm going to do. And then the headmistress will come in after I leave and seal away your last half hour of memory. But before then, knowing the whole truth, you'll get to decide whether you still want to be involved with me. Um, according to the records I was reading through before I came here, the story really began in 1926 with the birth of a half-blood wizard named Tom Morphin Riddle. 
His mother died in childbirth, and he grew up in a muggle orphanage until his Hogwarts letter was brought to him by Professor Dumbledore. The boy who lived continued speaking, words that slammed into what was left of Draco's mind like falling houses. The Dark Lord had been a half-blood. He'd never believed in blood purity for a fraction of a second. Tom Riddle had come up with the idea of Lord Voldemort as a bad joke. The Death Eaters had been meant to lose to David Monroe, so Monroe could take over. After giving up on that, Tom Riddle had gone on playing Voldemort instead of actually trying to win because he'd liked bossing the Death Eaters around. Voldemort used me to try to frame father for my attempted murder, then used me again to go after the Philosopher's Stone. Draco couldn't remember that part, but he'd already been told that he'd been used as a pawn alongside Professor Sprout, and that no charges would be filed. And then the last horror. You. You. I'm the one who killed your father and all the other Death Eaters last night. They'd been told to open fire on me the moment I did anything, so I had to kill them in order to have a chance at dealing with Voldemort, who was a danger to the entire world. I didn't think about you and Theodore and Vincent and Gregory, but if I had, I'd have done it anyway. My mind managed not to realize until afterwards that Mr. White was Lucius. But if I'd realized, I still wouldn't have risked leaving him alive, in case he knew wandless magic. The thought occurred to me long before that it would be pretty convenient, in terms of the political landscape, for all the Death Eaters to suddenly die. I always thought that the Death Eaters were horrible people, much more strongly than I ever let on to you, since the first day we met. But if your father hadn't been there, and I'd had a button that could kill him remotely, I wouldn't have pressed that button just for political reasons. The way I feel about what I've done, and whether there's remorse... Well, there's a part of me that's screaming in generic horror about having killed anyone. And another part that says that from a moral standpoint, the Death Eaters signed away their lives on the day they signed up with Voldemort. They pointed their wands at me first, blah, blah, and so on. But right now I just feel sick about what I've done to you. Again. I feel like everything I do only hurts you. For all my good intentions that you've only ever lost things from being around me. So if you tell me to stay away entirely from Draco Malfoy after this, then I will. And if you want me to try to be your friend for real this time, without ever trying to manipulate you again, without ever using you again or risking hurting you again, then I will. I swear I will. The next Lord Malfoy was crying openly in front of his enemy, decorum and composure abandoned, because he didn't have anyone left for whose sake he could keep it. A lie. A lie. Everything had been a lie. It was all lies piled on top of lies. Lies, lies, lies. You should die. You should die for having killed father. The words only filled him with more emptiness, but they had to be said. Harry Potter just shook his head. And if that's not an option? You should hurt. Harry only shook his head again. The boy who lived pressed the Lord Malfoy for his decision. The Lord Malfoy refused to give it. He couldn't say it. Couldn't bring himself to say it, either way. He didn't want the war's victor and their mutual friends to abandon him. And he wasn't going to give Harry the absolution he wanted, either. So Draco Malfoy refused to answer. And then the time of that self's memory ended.
The boy sat in an office near to where the once deputy headmistress had held court. His tears had run dry hours ago. Now there was only the waiting to see what would become of him, the orphan ward of Hogwarts, whose life and happiness lay in the hands of his family's enemies. The boy had been called to this room, and he had come because there was nothing else to do and nowhere else to go. Vincent and Gregory had left his side, called back by their mothers for their father's hurried funerals. Perhaps the boy should have gone with them, but he could not bring himself to do so. He would not have been able to act the part of a Malfoy. The feeling of emptiness that filled him up was so profound that it left no room even for lies. Everyone was dead. Everyone was dead, and it had all been futile from the beginning. There was a knock upon the office door, and then, after a polite pause, it opened to reveal Headmistress McGonagall, dressed much as she had dressed when she was a professor. Mr. Malfoy? His family's victorious enemy said. Please come with me. Listlessly, Draco rose up and followed her out of the office. Seeing Harry Potter waiting beside her gave him some pause, but then his mind simply shut it out. Here's the last thing. I found it in a folded parchment whose outside said that it was the last weapon to be used against House Malfoy, telling me not to read any further until the whole war hung in the balance. I didn't want to tell you about it before because I thought it might prejudice your decision unfairly. If you were a good person who never killed or lied, but you had to do one or the other, which would be worse? Draco ignored him and continued in Headmistress McGonagall's company, leaving Harry behind looking sadly after. They came to the headmistress's old office, where she lit her flu fire with a wave of her wand, and said to the green flame, Gringotts Travel Office, and stepped through after a firm glance in his direction. For lack of any other option, Draco Malfoy followed. She lay in bed, feeling more listless than usual that morning awoken too early with the sun just beginning to rise, though the direct sunlight was blocked by the skyscrapers that shadowed her house. A faint tinge of hangover gnawed at her temples, dried her mouth. She tried to be sparing with the drink, though she didn't know why she bothered. But last night she'd felt even more depressed than usual, like she'd lost something, somehow. Not for the first time, not for the hundredth time, she thought about moving. To Adelaide, to Perth, maybe to Perth Amboy if that was what it took. She always had the sense that there was somewhere else she ought to be. But while she could live a comfortable life on the payments the insurance company made to her, she couldn't afford luxuries. She couldn't pay to go gallivanting around the world looking for some place that fit her unsatisfied sense of belonging. She'd watched the TV for long enough. She'd rented enough travelogues to know that nowhere the VCR showed her gave her any more sense of rightness than Sydney. She'd felt frozen, stopped in time, ever since the traffic accident that had stolen her memories. Not just of a dead family that meant nothing to her now, but memories like how a stove worked. She suspected. No, she knew that whatever her heart was waiting for, whatever key needed to turn inside her to make her life begin moving again, it was one more thing she'd lost to that runaway minivan. She thought about that almost every morning, trying to guess what she was missing, missing from her life and mind. She groaned, turning her head far enough to look at the LED alarm clock at the side of her bed. 6.31, it said, with the AM dot lit. Seriously? Well, that idiot could wait until she staggered out of bed at her own pace, then. Stagger out of bed she did, ignoring the doorbell as it rang again, as she ducked into the bathroom and dressed herself. 
She clambered down the stairs, ignoring the ever-nagging sense that someone else ought to be answering the door for her. Who's there? She called to the closed door. The door had a peephole, but it was fogged over. Are you Nancy Manson? Yes. You know. Nancy leapt back in shock as a flash of light came from the door and hit her and... Nancy swayed, putting a hand to her forehead. Flashes of light just going through doors and hitting people. That was... That was... That wasn't particularly surprising. Would you please open the door? The war is over and your memory should be returning shortly. There's someone here who ought to see you. My memories... Nancy's head was already feeling clogged, like she was about to start hacking something out of her brain, but she managed to reach out and yank the door open. There in front of her was a woman dressed as a perfectly normal witch, from black robes to tall pointed hat, and standing beside her, a boy with short white blonde hair and wearing perfectly normal dark robes trimmed in green, staring at her with his jaw dropped and eyes wide and beginning to fill with tears. Green trimmed robes and white blonde hair. Something warm stirred in her memory. She felt her heart rising into her throat as she realized that the thing she'd been looking for these past ten years might be right in front of her this very instant. Somewhere deep inside her, ice was cracking around her heart, the piece of her that had been stopped for so long, preparing to move once more. The boy was staring at her, his mouth working soundlessly. A mysterious name came into her mind, rose to her lips. Lucius? End Chapter 120 Chapter 121 Something to Protect, Severus Snape A somber mood pervaded the headmistress's office. Minerva had returned after dropping off Draco and Narcissa slash Nancy at St. Mungo's, where the Lady Malfoy was being examined to see if a decade living as a muggle had done any damage to her health. And Harry had come up to the headmistress's office again, and then... not been able to think of priorities. There was so much to do, so many things, that even Headmistress McGonagall didn't seem to know where to start. And certainly not Harry. Right now, Minerva was repeatedly writing words on parchment and then erasing them with a hand wave. And Harry had closed his eyes for clarity. Was there any next first thing that needed to happen? There came a knock upon the great oaken door that had been Dumbledore's, and the headmistress opened it with a word. The man who entered the headmistress's office appeared worn. He had discarded his wheelchair, but still walked with a limp. He wore black robes that were simple, yet clean and unstained. Over his left shoulder was slung a knapsack of sturdy gray leather set with silver filigree that held four green pearl-like stones. It looked like a thoroughly enchanted knapsack, one that could contain the contents of a muggle house. One look at him, and Harry knew. Had Mistress McGonagall sat frozen behind her new desk, Severus Snape inclined his head to her. What is the meaning of this? said the headmistress, sounding heartsick, like she'd known upon a glance, just like Harry had. I resign my position as the potions master at Hogwarts, the man said simply. I will not stay to draw my last month's salary. If there are students who have been particularly harmed by me, you may use the money for their benefit. He knows. The thought came to Harry, and he couldn't have said in words just what the potions master now knew, except that it was clear that Severus knew it. Severus? Headmistress McGonagall began. Professor Severus Snape, you may not realize how difficult it is to find potions masters who can safely teach muggleborns, or professors sharp enough to keep Slytherin House in any semblance of order. 
Again, the man inclined his head. I think it need not be said to you, headmistress, but I recommend in the strongest possible terms that the next head of Slytherin be nothing like me. Severus, you only did as Albus told you to do. You could stay on and act differently. Her voice sounded hollow. Headmistress. Harry's own voice seemed also hollow, and Harry wondered at it, for he hadn't known Severus Snape that well. If he wants to go, I think you should let him go. Dumbledore was using him. Maybe not exactly the way Professor Quirrell thought. Maybe it was prophecy rather than sabotaging Slytherin. But Dumbledore was still using him. There were things that could have been said long ago to Severus to free him. It's clear why Dumbledore didn't risk that, but still, Severus wasn't being used kindly. Even his blindness and grief were being used, the way he didn't grasp the consequences of his actions as Potion Master. It is well to find you here, Mr. Potter. There is unfinished business between us. Harry didn't know what to say, so he just nodded. Severus seemed to be having some difficulty speaking as he stood before the two of them with the gray knapsack on his shoulder. Finally, he seemed to find the words he'd come to speak. Your mother, Lily, she was... I know, Harry said through the thickness of his throat. You don't have to say it. Lily was a fine upstanding witch, Mr. Potter. I would not have you think otherwise from any words I have said to you. Severus? Minerva McGonagall looked as shocked as if she'd been bitten by her own shoes. The former potions master kept his eyes on Harry. More than one bar lay between myself and Lily, most notably my ill-advised attempts to curry favor with the purebloods of my house. If I had made it sound like one mistake upon a muddy field ended it all, if I had pretended that she had no reason but shallowness not to love me, I hope your books have also told you why fools may say such things. They did. He was looking at the fine gray knapsack on Severus Snape's left shoulder, unable to meet the potions master's eyes. They did. However, I'm afraid I have nothing more to say about your father than what I've already told you. Severus! The former potions master seemed to have eyes only for Harry. The dark mark upon my arm is not dead, nor is the prophecy fulfilled by the story that you recounted before the crowd. How did you destroy all but a remnant of the Dark Lord? Harry hesitated. I obliviated most of his memories and... sealed him, I guess is how wizards say it. Even if the seal breaks, he won't come back as himself. Severus frowned briefly, and then shrugged. I suppose that is acceptable. Professor Snape! This, too, was now Harry's responsibility. The Order of the Phoenix owes you for services rendered. I'm in an excellent position to repay it, both financially and magically, just in case you want to start your next life in a position of wealth, or with better hair, or something. Strange words to say to such as me. I went to the Dark Lord intending to sell him the prophecy in exchange for Lily's love becoming mine, by whatever darkness was required to achieve it. That is hardly something to be forgiven lightly. And then, in the years after, when I was a potions master, that you experienced yourself. Do you think my service to the Order of the Phoenix has repaid all of my sins? People are always broken, Harry said, though the words stuck in his throat. They always make mistakes. At least you tried to repay them. Perhaps. My final duty was to fail in guarding the stone, to be struck down. This I have done, and I survived it, which I never expected to do. Severus was leaning against the door through which he'd entered, taking his weight off his left leg. I would not have thought to ask for your forgiveness, but since you offer it so freely, I will accept it with thanks. From this day on, I wish to take less unkindly ways, and I think that is best done by starting over. Tears glistened on Minerva McGonagall's nose and cheeks. When she spoke, her voice was without hope. Surely you could start over inside Hogwarts. Severus shook his head. 
too many students would remember me as the evil potions master. No, Minerva, I will go someplace new, and take a new name, and find someone new to love. Severus Snape, Harry said, because it was his responsibility to say it. Has all your will been done? Lily's killer is vanquished. I am content. The headmistress lowered her head. Be well, Severus. I do have one last piece of advice, if you want it. What is it? Ruminating about the past can contribute to depression. You have my blanket permission to just never think about your past, ever. You shouldn't think that it's your responsibility to Lily to bear your guilt for her, or anything like that. Just keep your mind on your future and whatever new people you meet. I shall take your wisdom into consideration. Also, try a different brand of hair shampoo. A wry grin crossed Severus's face, and Harry thought it might have been, for the first time, the man's true smile. Drop dead, Potter. Harry laughed. <laughs> Severus laughed. <laughs> Minerva was sobbing. Without saying anything else, the free man took a pinch of flu powder and cast it into the office's fireplace and strode into the green flame, whispering something that nobody caught. And that was the last that anyone ever heard of Severus Snape. End Chapter 121 Chapter 122 Something to Protect Hermione Granger It was evening, and it was morning, the last day, June 15th, 1992. The beginning light of morning, the pre-dawn before sunrise, was barely brightening the sky. To the east of Hogwarts, where the sun would rise, that faintest tinge of gray made barely visible the hilly horizon beyond the Quidditch stands. The stone terrace platform where Harry now sat would be high enough to see the dawn beyond the hills below. He'd asked for that when he was describing his new office. Harry was currently sitting cross-legged on a cushion, chilly pre-morning breezes stirring over his exposed hands and face. He'd ordered the house elves to bring up the hand-glittered throne from his previous office as general chaos, and then he'd told the elves to put it back, once it had occurred to Harry to start worrying about where his taste in decorations had come from, and whether Voldemort had once possessed a similar throne. Which, itself, wasn't a knockdown argument. It wasn't like sitting on a glittery throne to survey the lands below Hogwarts was unethical in any way Harry's moral philosophy could make out. But Harry had decided that he needed to take time and think it through. Meanwhile, simple cushions would do well enough. In the room below, connected to the rooftop by a simple wooden ladder, was Harry's new office inside Hogwarts. A wide room, surrounded by full wall windows on four sides for sunlight, currently bare of furnishings but for four chairs and a desk. Harry had told had Mistress McGonagall what he was looking for, and had Mistress McGonagall had put on the sorting hat and then told Harry the series of twists and turns that would take him where he wanted to be, high enough in Hogwarts that the castle shouldn't have been that tall. High enough in Hogwarts that nobody looking from the outside would see a piece of castle corresponding to where Harry now sat. It seemed like an elementary precaution against snipers that there was no reason not to take. Though, on the flip side, Harry had no idea where he currently was in any real sense. If his office couldn't be seen from the lands below, then how was Harry seeing the lands? How were photons making it from the landscape to him? On the western side of the horizon, stars still glittered, clear in the pre-dawn air. Were those photons the actual photons that had been emitted by huge plasma furnaces in the unimaginable distance? Or did Harry now sit within some dreaming vision of the Hogwarts castle? Or was it all, without any further explanation, just magic? He needed to get electricity to work better around magic so he could experiment with shining lasers downward and upward. 
And yes, Harry had his own office in Hogwarts now. He didn't have any official title yet, but the boy who lived was now a true fixture of the Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry, the soon-to-be home of the Philosopher's Stone and the world's only wizarding institution of genuinely higher education. It wasn't fully secured, but Professor Vector had put up some preliminary charms and runes to screen the office and its rooftop against eavesdropping. Harry sat on his cushion near the edge of his office's roof and gazed down upon trees and lakes and flowering grass. Far below, carriages sat motionless, not yet harnessed to skeletal horses. Small boats littered the shore, prepared to ferry younger students across the lake when the time came. The Hogwarts Express had arrived overnight, and now the train cars and the huge old-fashioned engine awaited on the other side of the southern lake. All was ready to take the students home after the leave-taking feast in the morning. Harry stared across the lake at the great old-fashioned locomotive he wouldn't be riding home this time. Again. There was a strange sadness and worry to that thought like Harry was already starting to miss out on the bonding experiences with the other students his age, if you could say that at all, when a significant part of Harry had been born in 1926. It had felt to Harry, last night in the Ravenclaw common room, like the gap between him and the other students had, yes, widened even further. Though that might only have been from the questions Padma Patil and Anthony Goldstein had excitedly asked each other about the girl who revived, the rapid-fire speculations shooting through the air from Ravenclaw to Ravenclaw. Harry had known the answers, he'd known all the answers, and he hadn't been able to say them. There was a part of Harry that was tempted to go on the Hogwarts Express and then come back to Hogwarts by flu. But when Harry imagined finding five other students in his compartment, and then spending the next eight hours keeping secrets from Neville or Padma or Dean or Tracy or Lavender, it didn't seem like an attractive prospect. Harry felt like he ought to do it for reasons of socializing with the other children, but he did not want to do it. He could meet with everyone again at the start of the next school year, when there would be other topics of which he could speak more freely. Harry stared south across the lake, at the huge old locomotive, and thought about the rest of his life. About the future. The prophecy Dumbledore's letter had mentioned about him tearing apart the stars in heaven... Well, that sounded optimistic... That part had an obvious interpretation to anyone who'd grown up with the right sort of upbringing. It described a future where humanity had won, more or less. It wasn't what Harry usually thought about when he gazed at the stars, but from a truly adult perspective, the stars were enormous heaps of valuable raw materials that had unfortunately caught fire and needed to be scattered and put out. If you were tapping the huge hydrogen-helium reservoirs for raw materials, that meant your species had successfully grown up. Unless the prophecy had been referring to something else entirely, Dumbledore might have been misinterpreting some seer's words. But his message to Harry had been phrased as if there'd been a prophecy about Harry personally tearing apart stars in the foreseeable future which seemed potentially more worrisome, though by no means certain to be true, or a bad thing if it was true. Harry vented a sigh. He'd begun to understand, in the long hours before sleep had taken him last night, just what Dumbledore's last message implied. Looking back on the events of the 1991 to 1992 Hogwarts school year was nothing short of bone-freezingly terrifying now that Harry understood what he was seeing. It wasn't just that Harry had kept the frequent company of his good friend Lord Voldemort. It wasn't even mostly that. It was the vision of a narrow line of time that Albus Dumbledore had steered through fate's narrow keyhole. A hair-thin strand of possibility threaded through a needle's eye. 
the prophecies had instructed Dumbledore to have Tom Riddle's intelligence copied onto the brain of a wizarding infant who would then grow up learning muggle science. What did it say about the likely shape of the future if that was the first or best strategy the seers could find that didn't lead to catastrophe? Harry could now look back on the unbreakable vow that he'd made, and guess that if not for that vow, disaster might have already been set in motion yesterday when Harry had wanted to tear down the International Statute of Secrecy. Which in turn strongly suggested that the many prophecies Dumbledore had read, and whose instructions he'd followed, had somehow ensured that Harry and Voldemort would collide in exactly the right way to cause Voldemort to force Harry to make that unbreakable vow. That the unbreakable vow had been part of time's narrow keyhole, one of the improbable preconditions for allowing the Earth's people to survive. A vow whose sole current purpose was to protect everyone from Harry's current stupidity. It was like watching a videotape of an almost traffic accident that had happened to you, where you remembered another car missing you by centimeters, and the video showing that someone had also thrown a pebble in exactly the right way to cause an enormous lorry to miss that near collision. And if they hadn't thrown that pebble, then you and all your family in the automobile and your entire planet would have been hit by the lorry, which, in the metaphor, represented your own sheer obliviousness. Harry had been warned. He'd known on some level, or the vow wouldn't have stopped him. And yet, he'd still almost made the wrong choice and destroyed the world. Harry could look back now and see that, yes, the alternate Harry with no vow would have had trouble accepting the reasoning that said you couldn't get magical healing to the muggles as fast as possible. If the alternate Harry had acknowledged the danger at all, he would have rationalized it, tried to figure out some clever way around the problem, and refused to accept taking a few years longer to do it. And so the world would have ended. Even after all the warnings Harry had received, it still wouldn't have worked without the unbreakable vow. One tiny strand of time being threaded through a needle's eye. Harry didn't know how to handle this revelation. It wasn't a sort of situation that human beings had evolved emotions to handle. All Harry could do was stare at how close he had come to disaster, might come again to disaster if that vow was fated to trigger more than once, and think, think, I don't want that to happen again, didn't seem like the right thought. He'd never wanted to destroy the world in the first place. Harry hadn't lacked for protective feelings about Earth's sapient population. Those protective feelings had been the problem, in a way. What Harry had lacked was some element of clear vision, of being willing to consciously acknowledge what he'd already known deep down. And the whole thing with Harry having spent the last year cozying up to the defense professor didn't speak highly of his intellect either. It seemed to point to the same problem, even. There were things Harry had known or strongly suspected on some level, but never promoted to conscious attention. And so he had failed and nearly died. I need to raise the level of my game. That was the thought Harry was looking for. He had to do better than this, become a less stupid person than this. I need to raise the level of my game or fail. Dumbledore had destroyed the recordings in the Hall of Prophecy and arranged for no further recordings to be made. There'd apparently been a prophecy that said Harry mustn't look upon those prophecies. And the obvious next thought, which might or might not be true, was that saving the world was beyond the reach of prophetic instruction. That winning would take plans that were too complex for Seer's messages, or that divination couldn't see somehow. 
If there'd been some way for Dumbledore to save the world himself, then prophecy would probably have told Dumbledore how to do that. Instead, the prophecies had told Dumbledore how to create the preconditions for a particular sort of person existing. A person, maybe, who could unravel a challenge more difficult than prophecy could solve directly. That was why Harry had been placed on his own, to think without prophetic guidance. If all Harry did was follow mysterious orders from prophecies, then he wouldn't mature into a person who could perform that unknown task. And right now, Harry James Potter Evans Varus was still a walking catastrophe who'd needed to be constrained by an unbreakable vow to prevent him from immediately setting the earth on an inevitable course toward destruction when he'd already been warned against it. That had happened literally yesterday, just one day after he'd helped Voldemort almost take over the planet. A certain line from Tolkien kept running through Harry's mind, the part where Frodo, upon Mount Doom, had put on the ring, and Sauron suddenly realized what a complete idiot he'd been. And the magnitude of his own folly was at last laid bare, or however that had gone. There was a huge gap between who Harry needed to become and who he was right now. And Harry didn't think that time, life experience, and puberty would take care of that automatically, though they might help. Though if Harry could grow into an adult that was to this self what a normal adult was to a normal 11-year-old, maybe that would be enough to steer through time's narrow keyhole. He had to grow up, somehow and there was no traditional path laid out before him for accomplishing that. The thought came then to Harry of another work of fiction, more obscure than Tolkien. You can only arrive at mastery by practicing the techniques you have learned, facing challenges and apprehending them, using to the fullest the tools you have been taught, until they shatter in your hands and you are left in the midst of wreckage absolute. I cannot create masters. I have never known how to create masters. Go, then, and fail. You have been shaped into something that may emerge from the wreckage, determined to remake your art. I cannot create masters, but if you had not been taught, your chances would be less. The higher road begins after the art seems to fail you, though the reality will be that it was you who failed your art. It wasn't that Harry had gone down the wrong path. It wasn't that the road to sanity lay somewhere outside of science. But reading science papers hadn't been enough. All the cognitive psychology papers about known bugs in the human brain and so on had helped, but they hadn't been sufficient. He'd failed to reach what Harry was starting to realize was a shockingly high standard of being so incredibly, unbelievably rational that you actually started to get things right, as opposed to having a handy language in which to describe afterward everything you'd just done wrong. Harry could look back now and apply ideas like motivated cognition to see where he'd gone astray over the last year. That counted for something when it came to being saner in the future. That was better than having no idea what he'd done wrong. But that wasn't yet being the person who could pass through time's narrow keyhole, the adult form whose possibility Dumbledore had been instructed by Sears to create. I need to think faster, grow up faster. How alone am I? How alone will I be? Am I making the same mistake I made during Professor Quirrell's first battle when I didn't realize Hermione had captains? The mistake I made when I didn't tell Dumbledore about the sense of doom once I realized Dumbledore probably wasn't mad or evil. It would help if muggles had classes for this sort of thing, but they didn't. Maybe Harry could recruit Daniel Kahneman, 
fake his death, rejuvenate him with the stone, and put him in charge of inventing better training methods. Harry took the Elder Wand out of his robes, gazed again at the dark gray wood that Dumbledore had passed down to him. Harry had tried to think faster this time, had tried to complete the pattern implied by the Cloak of Invisibility and the Resurrection Stone. The Cloak of Invisibility had possessed the legendary power of hiding the wearer, and the hidden power of allowing the wearer to hide from death itself in the form of Dementors. The Resurrection Stone had the legendary power of summoning an image of the dead, and when Voldemort had incorporated it into his Horcrux system to allow his spirit to move freely. The second Deathly Hallow was a potential component of a system of true immortality that Cadmus Peveril had never completed, maybe due to his having ethics. And then there was the third Deathly Hallow, the Elder Wand of Antioch Peveril, that legend said passed from wizard to stronger wizard and made its holder invincible against ordinary attacks. That was the known and overt characteristic, the Elder Wand that had belonged to Dumbledore, who'd been trying to prevent the death of the world itself. The purpose of the Elder Wand always going to the victor might be to find the strongest living wizard and empower them still further, in case there was any threat to their entire species. It could secretly be a tool to defeat death in its form as the destroyer of worlds. But if there was some higher power locked within the Elder Wand, it had not presented itself to Harry based on that guess. Harry had raised up the Elder Wand and spoken to it, named himself a descendant of Peveril who accepted his family's quest. He'd promised the Elder Wand that he would do his best to save the world from death and take up Dumbledore's duty. And the Elder Wand had answered no more strongly to his hand than before, refusing his attempt to jump ahead in the story. Maybe Harry needed to strike his first true blow against the death of worlds before the Elder Wand would acknowledge him as the heir of Ignatus Peveril had already defeated Death's shadow, and the heir of Cadmus Peveril had already survived the death of his body when their respective Deathly Hallows had revealed their secrets. At least Harry had managed to guess that, contrary to legend, the Elder Wand didn't contain a core of Thestral hair. Harry had seen Thestrals, and they were skeletal horses with smooth skin and no visible mane on their skull-like heads nor tufts on their bony tails. But what core was truly inside the Elder Wand, Harry hadn't yet felt himself knowing. Nor had he been able to find, anywhere on the Elder Wand, the circle-triangle line of the Deathly Hallows that should have been present. I don't suppose, Harry murmured to the Elder Wand, you could just tell me. There came back no answer from the globe-knobbed wand only a sense of glory and contained power, watching him skeptically. Harry sighed and put the most powerful wand in the world back into his school robes. He'd get it eventually, and hopefully in time. Maybe faster, if there was someone to help him do the research. Harry was aware on some level, no. He needed to stop being aware of things on some level and start just being aware of them. Harry was explicitly and consciously aware that he was ruminating about the future mostly to distract himself from the imminent arrival of Hermione Granger, who would receive a clear bill of health from St. Mungo's when she woke up very early this morning and who would then flew with Professor Flitwick back to Hogwarts whereupon she'd tell Professor Flitwick that she needed to speak with Harry Potter immediately. There'd been a note from Harry to himself about that when Harry had woken up later this morning with the sun already risen in the Ravenclaw dorm. He'd read the note, and then time turned back to before the dawn hour when Hermione Granger would arrive. She won't actually be angry with me. Doubting internal silence. Seriously, 
Hermione isn't that kind of person. Maybe she was at the start of the year, but she's too self-aware to fall for that one now. Doubting internal silence. What do you mean, doubting internal silence? If you have something to say, inner voice, just say it. We're trying to be more aware of our own thought processes, remember? The sky had gone full blue-gray, dawn barely short of sunrise, by the time that Harry heard the sound of footsteps coming from the ladder that opened into his new office. Hastily, Harry stood up and began to brush off his robes, and then, realizing what he was doing, stopped the nervous motions. He'd just defeated Voldemort, damn it. He ought not to be this nervous. The young witch's head and chestnut curls appeared in the opening and peered around. Then she rose up higher, seemed almost to run up the ladder steps, like she was walking along an ordinary sidewalk but vertically. Harry could have blinked and missed it, how her one shoe came down on the top rung of the ladder, and then she leapt lightly onto the roof an instant later. Hermione. Harry's lips moved around the word, but made no sound. There'd been something Harry had meant to say, but it had gone right out of his mind. Maybe a quarter of the minute passed, on the rooftop, before Hermione Granger spoke. She was wearing a blue-edged uniform now, and the blue bronze striped tie of her proper house. Harry, said Hermione Granger, a terribly familiar voice that almost brought tears to Harry's eyes. Before I ask you all the questions, I'd like to start by saying thank you very much for, um, whatever it is you did. I mean it really. Thank you. Hermione, Harry said, and swallowed. The phrase, may I have permission to hug you, which Harry had imagined using for his opening line, seemed impossible to say. Welcome back. Hold on while I put up some privacy spells. Harry took the Elder Wand out of his robes, got a book from his pouch that he opened to a bookmark, and then carefully pronounced, Hominum Revelio, along with two other recently acquired security charms that Harry had found himself barely able to cast if he wielded the Elder Wand. It wasn't much, but it was marginally better security than just relying on Professor Vector. You have Dumbledore's wand. Her voice was hushed and sounded as loud as an avalanche in the still dawn air. And you can use it to cast fourth year spells? Harry nodded, making a mental note to be more careful who else saw him do that. Is it okay if I hug you? Hermione moved lightly over to him. Her movements were peculiarly swift, more graceful than they'd been before. Her motions seemed to radiate an air of something pure and untouched, reminding Harry again of how peaceful Hermione had looked when she was sleeping on Voldemort's altar. Realization hit Harry like a ton of bricks, or at least a kilogram of brick. And Harry hugged Hermione, feeling how very alive she seemed. He felt like crying and suppressed it because he didn't know whether that was just her aura affecting him or not. Hermione's arms around him were gentle, exceedingly light in their pressure, as if she were being deliberately careful not to snap his body in half like a used toothpick. So, Hermione said once Harry had let go of her. Her young face looked very serious, as well as pure and innocent. I didn't tell the Aurors you were there, or that it was Professor Quirrell and not you-know-who who killed all the Death Eaters. Professor Flitwick only let them give me one drop of Veritaserum, so I didn't have to say. I just told them the troll was the last thing I remembered. Ah. Harry had somehow found himself staring at Hermione's nose instead of her eyes. What do you think happened, exactly? Well, I got eaten by a troll, which I'd frankly rather not do again, and then there was a really loud bang and my legs were back, and I was lying on a stone altar in the middle of a graveyard in a dark moonlit forest I'd never seen before, with somebody's severed hands clutched around my throat. So you see, Mr. Potter, finding myself in a situation that weird and dark and scary, I wasn't going to make the same mistake I did last time with Tracy. I knew right away that it was you. Harry nodded. Good call. I said your name, but you didn't answer. 
I sat up and one of the bloody hands slid down over my shirt, leaving little bits of flesh behind. I didn't scream, though, even when I looked around and saw the heads and bodies and realized what the smell was. Hermione stopped, took another deep breath. I saw the skull masks and realized that the dead people had been Death Eaters. I knew right away that the defense professor had been there with you and killed them all, but I didn't notice Professor Quirrell's body was also there. I didn't realize it was him even when I saw Professor Flitwick checking the body. He looked different when he was dead. Hermione's voice became quieter. She looked humbled somehow, in a way Harry couldn't often remember seeing. They said David Monroe sacrificed his life to bring me back, the same way your mother sacrificed herself for you, so that the Dark Lord would explode again when he tried to touch me. I'm pretty sure that's not the whole truth, but I've thought a lot of nasty things about her defense professor that I never should have thought. Um... Hermione nodded solemnly, her hands clasped in front of her as though in penitence. I know you're probably too nice to say the things to me that you have a right to say now, so I'll say them for you, Harry. You were right about Professor Quirrell, and I was wrong. You told me so. David Monroe was a little bit dark and a whole lot Slytherin, and it was childish of me to think that that was the same thing as being evil. Ah. Uh... This was very hard to say. Actually, the rest of the world doesn't know this part, not even the headmistress. But, in point of fact, you were 112% correct about him being evil. And I'll remember for future reference that although dark and evil may not technically be the same thing, there's a great big statistical correlation. Oh. Hermione fell silent again. You're not going to say you told me so? His mental model of Hermione was yelling, I told you so! Didn't I tell you so, Mr. Potter? Didn't I tell you? Professor Quirrell is evil, I said, but you didn't listen to me! The actual Hermione just shook her head. I know you cared about him a lot. Since I was right after all, I knew you'd probably be hurting a lot after Professor Quirrell turned out to be evil, and that wouldn't be a good time to say I told you so. I mean... That's what I decided when I was thinking that part through several months earlier. Thank you, Miss Granger. Harry was glad she'd said that much, though. It just wouldn't have felt like Hermione otherwise. So, Mr. Potter, said Hermione Granger, tapping her fingers on her robes at a round thigh level. After the Mediwitch drew my blood, it stopped hurting right away. And when I brushed away the little bit of blood on my arm, I couldn't find where the needle had poked me. I bent some of the metal in my bed frame without trying hard, and though I haven't had a chance to test it yet, I feel like I should be able to run really fast. My fingernails are pearly white and shiny, even though I don't remember painting them. And my teeth look like that, too, which, being the daughter of dentists, makes me nervous. So, it's not that I'm ungrateful, but just exactly what did you do? Um, and I'm expecting you're also wondering why you're radiating an aura of purity and innocence? I'm what? That part wasn't my idea! Honestly! Please don't kill me! Hermione Granger raised her hands in front of her face, staring somewhat cross-eyed at her fingers. Harry, are you saying... I mean, my radiating innocence and being all fast and graceful and my teeth being pearly white? Is it alicorn my fingernails are made of? Alicorn? It's the term for unicorn horn, Mr. Potter. Hermione Granger seemed to be trying to nibble her fingernails and not having much luck. So I guess if you bring a girl back from the dead, she ends up as, what did Daphne call it? A sparkling unicorn princess? That's not exactly what happened, though it was frighteningly close. Hermione took her finger out of her mouth, frowning at it. I can't bite through it either. Mr. Potter, did you consider the problems now that it's literally impossible for me to trim my fingernails and toenails? The Weasley twins have a magical sword that should work. I think that I would like to know the whole story behind this, Mr. Potter, because knowing you and knowing Professor Quirrell, there was some sort of plan going on. Harry took a deep breath. Then he exhaled. Sorry, it's classified. I could tell you if you studied occlumency, but do you want to? Do I want to study occlumency? Hermione looked slightly surprised. That's at least a sixth-year thing, isn't it? I learned it. I started with an unusual boost, but I doubt that really mattered in the long run. 
I mean, I'm sure you could learn calculus if you studied hard, regardless of what age muggles usually learn it. The question is... Um... Harry was having to control his breathing. The question is, do you still want to do that kind of stuff? Hermione turned and looked at where the sky was lightening in the east. You mean, do I still want to be a hero now that it's earned me a horrible death that one time? Harry nodded, then said, yes, because Hermione wasn't turning toward him, though the word felt blocked in his throat. I've been thinking about that. It was, in fact, an exceptionally gruesome and painful death. I, um, I did set some things up just in case you still wanted to be a hero. There were some short windows of opportunity where I didn't have time to consult you. I couldn't let you see me because I expected you to be given Veritaserum later. But if you don't like it, I can undo most of what I did and you can just ignore the rest. Hermione nodded distantly. Like making everyone think that I... Harry, did I actually do anything to you-know-who? No, that was all me, though please don't tell anyone that. Just so you know, that time the boy who lived supposedly defeated Voldemort on the night of Halloween in 1981, that was Dumbledore's victory, and he let everyone think it was me. So now I've defeated a Dark Lord once, and gotten credit for it once. It all balances out eventually, I guess. Hermione went on gazing to the east. I'm not really comfortable with this, she said after a while. People thinking I defeated the Dark Lord Voldemort when I haven't done anything at all? Oh, that's the same thing you went through, isn't it? Yeah, sorry about inflicting that on you. I was... Well, I was trying to create a separate identity for you in people's minds, I guess. There was just the one opportunity, and everything was sort of rushed, and... And I realized afterwards that maybe I shouldn't have, but it was too late. Harry cleared his throat. Though, um, if you're feeling like you want to do something that's actually worthy of the way people think about the girl who revived, um, I might have an idea for what you can do. Very soon, if you want. Hermione Granger was giving him a look. But you don't have to. You can just ignore this whole thing and be the best student in Ravenclaw, if that's what you prefer. Are you trying to use reverse psychology on me, Mr. Potter? No, honestly. I'm trying not to decide your life for you. I thought I saw, yesterday, I thought I saw what might come next for you. But then I remembered how much of this year I'd spent being a total idiot. I thought of some things Dumbledore said to me. I realized it genuinely wasn't my place to say. That you could do anything you wanted with your life, and that, above all, the choice had to be your own. Maybe you don't want to be a hero after this. Maybe you want to become a great magical researcher because that's who Hermione Granger really was all along, never mind what your fingernails are made of now. Or you could go to the Salem Witches Institute in America instead of Hogwarts. I won't lie and say I'd like that, but it really is up to you. Harry turned to the horizon and swept his hand wide, as though to indicate all the world that lay beyond Hogwarts. You can go anywhere from here. You can do anything with your life. If you want to be a wealthy 60-year-old merman, I can make it happen. I'm serious. Hermione nodded slowly. I'm curious about how you'd do that exactly. But what I want isn't to have things done for me. I understand. Um, Harry hesitated. I think, if it helps you to know... In my case, things were being arranged for me a lot. By Dumbledore mostly, though Professor Quirrell too. Maybe the power to earn your own way in life is itself something you have to earn. Why, that sounds very wise. Like having my parents pay for me to go to university so I can someday get my own job. Professor Quirrell, bringing me back to life as a sparkling unicorn princess. And you telling everyone that I off the Dark Lord Voldemort is just like that, really. I am sorry. I know I should have done it differently, but I didn't have much time to plan and I was exhausted and not really thinking straight. 
I'm grateful, Harry. You're being too harsh on yourself, even. Please don't take it so seriously when I'm snarky at you. I don't want to be the sort of girl who comes back from the dead and then starts complaining about which superpower she got and that her alicorn fingernails are the wrong shade of pearly white. Hermione had turned and was again gazing off at the east. But, Mr. Potter, if I do decide that dying a horrible death isn't enough to make me rethink my life choices, not that I'm saying that just yet, then what happens next? I do my best to support you in your life choices, whatever they are. You have a quest already lined up for me, I'm guessing. A nice, safe quest where there's no chance of my getting hurt again. Harry rubbed his eyes, feeling tired inside. It was like he could hear the voice of Albus Dumbledore inside his head. Forgive me, Hermione Granger. I'm sorry, Hermione. If you go down that path, I'm going to have to Dumbledore you and not tell you some things. Manipulate you, if only for a short while. I do believe there's something you might be able to do now. Something real. Something worthy of the way people are thinking about the girl who revived. That you might have a destiny even. But in the end, that's just a guess. I know a lot less than Dumbledore did. Are you willing to risk the life you just got back? Hermione turned to look at him, her eyes widening in surprise. Risk my life? Harry didn't nod, because that would have been outright lying. Are you willing to do that? Harry said instead. The quest that I think might be your destiny, and no, I don't know any specific prophecies, it's just a guess, involves literal descent into hell type stuff. I thought... Hermione sounded uncertain. I thought for sure after this, you and Professor McGonagall wouldn't, you know... Let me do anything the least bit dangerous ever again. Harry said nothing, feeling guilty about the false relationship credit he was getting. It was, in fact, the case that Hermione was modeling him with tremendous accuracy, and that if not for Hermione having a horcrux, the surface of the planet Venus would have dropped to fractional Kelvin temperatures before Harry tried this. On a scale of 0 to 100, how literal a descent into hell are we talking about here? The girl now looked a bit worried. Harry mentally calibrated his scales, remembering Azkaban. I'd say maybe 87? This sounds like something I should do when I'm older, Harry. There's a difference between being a hero and being a complete lunatic. Harry shook his head. I don't think the risk would change much, leaving aside the question of how much risk that really was. And it's the sort of thing that's better done sooner, if someone does it at all. And my parents don't get a vote. Or do they? Harry shrugged. We both know how they'd vote, and you can take that into account if you like. Um, I said for Dr. and Dr. Granger not to be told yet that you're alive. They'll find out after you come back from your mission, if you choose to accept it. That seems a bit... kinder on your parents' nerves. They just get the one pleasant surprise, instead of having to worry about, um, stuff. Well, that's very thoughtful of you. It's nice that you're so concerned about their feelings. May I think about this for a few minutes, please? Harry gestured toward the cushion he'd set down opposite his own, and Hermione moved over with fluid grace and sat down to look out over the castle edge, still radiating peacefulness all over the place. They'd really need to do something about that. Maybe pay someone to invent an anti-purity potion. Do I have to decide without knowing what the mission is? Oh, hell no! Harry said, thinking of a similar conversation before his own trip to Azkaban. This is the sort of thing you have to choose freely if you do it at all. I mean, that's an actual mission requirement. If you say that you still want to be a hero, I'll tell you afterwards about the mission after you've had some time to eat and talk to people and recover a bit, and you'll decide then if it's something you want to do. And we'll test in advance whether returning from death has allowed you to cast the spell that normal wizards think is impossible before you go out. Hermione nodded and fell back into silence. The sky had lightened further by the time Hermione spoke again. I'm afraid. Not of dying again. Or not just that. I'm afraid I won't be good enough. I had my chance to defeat a troll, and instead I just died. 
That troll was empowered by Voldemort as a weapon. Plus, he sabotaged all your magic items, just so you know. I died. And you killed the troll somehow. I think I remember that part. It didn't even slow you down. Hermione wasn't crying. No tears glistened on her cheeks. She simply gazed off at the lightning sky where the sun would rise. And then you brought me back from the dead as a sparkling unicorn princess. I know I couldn't have done that. I'm afraid I'll never be able to do that, no matter what people think about me. This situation is where your journey begins, I think. Excuse me, I shouldn't be trying to influence your decision. No. Hermione still gazed at the hills below her. She raised her voice. No, Harry. I want to hear this. Okay. Um, I think this is where you start. Everything that's happened up until now, it places you in the same place I started out in September, when I'd thought of myself as just being a child prodigy before, and then I found something new I needed to live up to. If you weren't comparing yourself to me and my... Adult cognitive patterns copied off Tom Riddle. Dark side? Then you'd be the brightest star in Ravenclaw, who organized her own company to fight school bullies and kept her sanity under assault by Voldemort, all while she was only 12 years old. I looked it up. You got better grades than Dumbledore did in his first year. Leaving aside the defense grade, because that was just Voldemort being Voldemort. Now you have some powers and a reputation to live up to, and the world is about to hand you some difficult tasks. That's where it all begins for you, the same as it began for me. Don't sell yourself short. And then Harry shut his mouth hard, because he was talking Hermione into it, and that wasn't right. He'd at least managed to stop before the part where he asked, if she couldn't be a hero with all that going for her, who exactly she thought was going to do it. You know, Hermione said to the horizon, still not looking at Harry, I had a conversation like this with Professor Quirrell once, about being a hero. He was taking the other side, of course, but apart from that, this is feeling like when he argued with me somehow. Harry kept his lips pressed shut. Letting people make their own decisions was hard, because it meant they were allowed to make the wrong ones, but it still had to be done. Hermione spoke carefully, the blue fringes of her Hogwarts uniform now seeming brighter against her black robes as the sky all around them became illuminated. There were no more stars in the West. Professor Quirrell told me he said he'd been a hero once. But people weren't helping him enough, so he gave up and went off to do something more interesting. I told Professor Quirrell that it hadn't been right for him to do that. What I actually said was, that's horrible. Professor Quirrell said that, yes, maybe he was an awful person, but then what about all the other people who'd never tried to be heroes at all? Were they even worse than him? And I didn't know what to say back. I mean, it's wrong to say that only Gryffindor-style heroes are good people. Though I think from Professor Quirrell's perspective, it was more like only people with big ambitions had a right to breathe and I didn't believe that. But it also seemed wrong to stop being a hero, to walk away like he'd done, so I just stood there looking silly. But now I know what I should have told him back then. Harry controlled his breathing. Hermione stood up from her cushion and turned to face Harry. I'm done with trying to be a heroine, said Hermione Granger, with the eastern sky brightening around her. I shouldn't have ever gone along with that entire line of thinking. There are just people who do what they can, whatever they can. And there are also people who don't even try to do what they can. And yes, those people are doing something wrong. I'm not ever going to try to be a hero again. I'm not going to think in heroic terms if I can help it. But I won't do any less than I can. Or not a lot less. I mean, I'm only human. Harry had never understood what was supposed to be mysterious about the Mona Lisa. But if he could have taken a picture of Hermione's resigned and joyous smile just then, he had the sense that he could have looked at it for hours without understanding, and that Dumbledore could have read through it at a glance. I won't learn my lesson. I will be that stupid. I'll go on trying to do most of what I can, or at least some of what I can. Oh, you know what I mean. Even if it means risking my life again, so long as it's worth the risk and isn't being, you know, actually stupid. That's my answer. 
Hermione took a deep breath, her face resolute. So, is there something I can do? Harry's throat was choked. He reached into his pouch and signed C-L-O-A-K, since he couldn't speak, and drew forth the fuliginous spill of the Cloak of Invisibility, offering it to Hermione for the last time. Harry had to force the words from his throat. This is the true Cloak of Invisibility, the deathly hallow passed down from Ignatus Peveril to his heirs, the Potters. And now, to you. Harry! Hermione's hands flew up across her chest, as though to protect herself from the attacking gift. You don't have to do this. I do have to do this. I've left the part of the path that lets me be a hero. I can't risk myself adventuring, ever. And you... can. Harry reached up the hand that wasn't holding the cloak and wiped at his eyes. This was made for you, I think, for the person you're going to become. A weapon to fight death in its form as the shadow of despair that falls on human minds and drains away their hope for the future. You will fight that, I expect, in more forms than just Dementors. I do not loan you my cloak, but give you unto Hermione Jean Granger. Protect her well forevermore. Slowly, Hermione reached out and took hold of the cloak, looking like she was trying not to cry herself. Thank you. I think, even though I'm done with the notion of heroing, I think that you always were, from the day I met you, my mysterious old wizard. And I think, even if you deny that way of thinking now, I think that you were always destined to become, from the very beginning of the story, the hero. Who must Hermione Granger become? What adult form must she take when she grows up to pass through time's narrow keyhole? I don't know the answer to that either, any more than I can imagine my own adult self. But her next few steps ahead seem clearer than mine. Harry let the cloak go and passed it from his hands to hers. It sings. It's singing to me. She reached up and wiped at her own eyes. I can't believe you did that, Harry. Harry's other hand came out of his pouch, now bearing a long golden chain, at the end of which dangled a closed golden shell. And this is your personal time machine. There was a pause, during which the planet Earth rotated a bit further in its orbit. What? A time-turner, they call it. Hogwarts has a stock they give out to some students. I got one at the start of the year to treat my sleep disorder. It lets the user go backwards in time, in up to six one-hour increments, which I use to get six extra hours per day to study, and to vanish out of potions class, and so on. Don't worry, a time-turner can't change history or generate paradoxes that destroy the universe. You were keeping up with me in lessons by studying six extra hours per day using a time machine. Hermione Granger seemed to be having trouble with this concept for some unaccountable reason. Harry made his face look puzzled. Is there something odd about that? Hermione reached out and took the golden necklace. I guess not by wizard standards. For some reason, her voice sounded rather sharp. She arranged the chain around her neck, placing the hourglass inside her shirt. I do feel better now about keeping up with you, though, so thank you for that. Harry cleared his throat. <clears throat> also, since Voldemort wiped out the House of Monroe, and then, so far as everyone believes, you avenged them by killing Voldemort... I got Amelia Bones to railroad a bill through what's left of the Wizengomet, saying that Granger is now a noble house of Britain. Excuse me? That also makes you the only scion of a noble house, which means that to get your legal majority, you just need to pass your ordinary wizarding levels, which I've set us up to do at the end of the summer, so we'll have some time to study first. If you're okay with that, I mean... 
Hermione Granger was making some sort of high-pitched noise that would, in a less organic device, have indicated an engine malfunction. I have two months to study for my owls. Hermione, it's a test designed so that most 15-year-olds can pass. Ordinary 15-year-olds. We can get a passing grade with a low third year's power level if we learn the right set of spells, and that's all we need for our own majorities. Though you'll need to come to terms with getting acceptable scores instead of your usual outstandings. The high-pitched noises coming from Hermione Granger rose in pitch. Here's your wand back. Harry took it from his pouch. And your mokeskin pouch. I made sure they put back everything that was there when you died. That pouch Harry withdrew from a normal pocket of his robes, since he was reluctant to put a bag of holding inside a bag of holding, no matter what was supposed to be harmless, so long as both devices had been crafted observing all safety precautions. Hermione took her wand back, and then her pouch, the motion somehow managing to look graceful, even though her fingers were a bit shaky. Let's see, what else? The oath you swore before to House Potter only said that you had to serve until the day you die, so you're now free and clear. And right after your death, I got the Malfoys to publicly declare that you were innocent of all charges in Draco's attempted murder. Why, thank you again, Harry. That was very nice of you. And them too, I guess. She was repeatedly running her fingers through her chestnut curls, as though, by organizing her hair, she could restore sanity to her life. Last but not least, I had the goblin start the process of building a vault in Gringotts for House Granger. I didn't put any money into it, because that was something where I could wait and ask you first. But if you're going to be a superhero who goes around righting certain kinds of wrongs, It will help a lot if people consider you to be part of the upper social strata. And, um, I think it may help if they know you can afford lawyers. I can put in as much gold into your vault as you want, since after Voldemort killed Nicholas Flamel, I ended up holding the Philosopher's Stone. I feel like I ought to be fainting, only I can't because of my superpowers, and why do I have those again? If it's all right with you, your Occlumency lessons will start on Wednesday with Mr. Bester. He can work with you once per day. Until then, I think it might be better for the true origin of your powers not to become known just because a Legilimens looks you in the eyes. I mean, obviously there's a normal magical explanation, nothing super supernatural. But people do tend to worship their own ignorance. And, well... I think the girl who revived will be more effective if you remain mysterious. Once you can keep out Mr. Bester and beat Veritaserum, I'll tell you the entire backstory, I promise, including all the secrets you can never tell anyone else. That sounds lovely. I'm quite looking forward to it. Though you'll need to take an unbreakable vow to not do anything that might destroy the world before I can tell you the more dangerous parts of the story. I mean, I literally can't tell you otherwise, because I took an unbreakable vow myself. Is that okay? Sure. Why wouldn't it be okay? I wouldn't want to destroy the world anyhow. Do you need to sit down again? Harry was feeling alarmed by the way Hermione was swaying slightly, as though in rhythm with the words being spoken. Hermione Granger took several deep breaths. No, I'm perfectly peachy. Is there anything else I should know about? That was it. I'm finished, at least for now. Harry paused. I do understand that you want to do things for yourself, not just have them done for you. It's just... You're going to be a more serious kind of hero, and the only sane choice is for me to give you all the advantages I can manage. I understand that quite well, now that I've actually lost a fight and died. I didn't used to understand, but now I do. A breeze ruffled Hermione's chestnut hair and stirred her robes, making her look even more peaceful in the dawn air as she raised one hand and carefully clenched it into a fist. If I'm going to do this, I'm going to do it right. We need to measure how hard I can punch and how high I can jump and figure out a safe way to test if my fingernails can kill lethifolds like a real unicorn's horn. And I should practice using my speed to dodge spells I can't let hit me and sounds like you could maybe arrange for me to get aura training like from whoever taught Susan Bones. 
Hermione was smiling again now, a strange light in her eyes that would have puzzled Dumbledore for hours and that Harry understood immediately, not without a twinge of apprehension. Oh, and I want to start carrying muggle weapons, maybe hidden so nobody knows I have them. I thought of incendiary grenades when I was fighting the troll, but I knew I couldn't transfigure them fast enough, even after I stopped caring about obeying the rules. I have the feeling, Harry said, imitating Professor McGonagall's accent as best he could, that I ought to be doing something about this. Oh, it's much, much, much too late for that, Mr. Potter. Say, can you get me a bazooka? The rocket launcher, I mean, not the chewing gum. I bet they won't be expecting that from a young girl, especially if I'm radiating an aura of innocence and purity. All right, now you're starting to scare me. Hermione paused from where she was experimenting with balancing on the tip of her left shoe, her arm reaching in one direction and her right leg stretched in the other like a ballet dancer. Am I? I was just thinking that I didn't see what I could do that a ministry squad of hit wizards couldn't. They have broomsticks for mobility and spells that hit harder than I possibly could. She gracefully lowered her leg back down. I mean, now that I can try a few things without worrying about who's watching, I'm starting to think that I really, really, really like having superpowers. But I still don't see how I could win a fight that Professor Flitwick couldn't, not unless it involves me taking a dark wizard by surprise. You can take risks other people shouldn't, and try again with the knowledge of what killed you. You can experiment with new spells, more than anyone else could try without dying for sure. But Harry couldn't say any of that yet, so instead he said, I think it's okay to think more about the future, not just what you can do this very minute. Hermione jumped high in the air, clicked her heels together three times on the way down, and landed on her tiptoes, perfectly posed. But you said there was something I could do right away. Or were you just testing? That part is a special case, Harry said, feeling the chill of the dawn air against his skin. He was increasingly not looking forward to telling Super Hermione that her ordeal would involve facing her literal worst nightmare under conditions where all her newfound physical strength would be useless. Hermione nodded, then glanced to the east. At once, she went to the side of the roof and sat down, her legs dangling over the rooftop ledge. Harry went to her side and sat down too, sitting cross-legged and further back of the roof edge. In the distance, a brilliant tinge of red was rising above the hills to the east of Hogwarts. Watching the tip of the sunrise made Harry feel better, somehow. So long as the sun was still in the sky, things were still all right on some level, like his having not yet destroyed the sun. So, Hermione's voice rose a bit. Speaking of the future, Harry, I had time to think about a lot of things while I was waiting in St. Mungo's, and maybe it's silly of me, but there's a question I still want to know the answer to. Do you remember the last thing we talked about together? Before, I mean. What? Oh. It was two months ago for you. I guess you don't recall then. And Harry remembered. Don't panic, Hermione said as a sort of strangled half-gurgle came from Harry's throat. I promise no matter what you say, I won't burst into tears and run away and get eaten by a troll again. I know it's been less than two days for me, but I think that dying has made a lot of things I used to fret about seem much less important compared to what I've been through. Oh! That's a good use of a major trauma, I guess. Only see, I was still wondering about it, Harry, because for me, it hasn't been very long at all since our last conversation, and we didn't finish talking, which was admittedly all my own fault for losing control of my emotions and being eaten by a troll, which I'm definitely not going to do again. I've been thinking I ought to reassure you that's not going to happen every time you say the wrong thing to a girl. Hermione was fidgeting, leaning from one side to the other where she sat, slightly back and forth. But, well, even most people who are in love don't do literally one hundredth of what you've done for me. So, Mr. Harry James Potter Evans Varus, if it's not love, I want to know exactly what I am to you. You never said. That's a good question. Harry controlled the rising panic. Do you mind if I think about it? Bit by bit, more of the searingly brilliant circle became visible beyond the hills. Hermione, 
Harry said when the sun was halfway above the horizon. Did you ever invent any hypothesis to explain my mysterious dark side? Just the obvious one. Hermione kicked her leg slightly over the rooftop's edge. I thought that maybe when you know who died right next to you, he happened to give off the burst of magic that makes a ghost, and some of it imprinted on your brain instead of the floor. But that never felt right to me, like it was just a clever explanation that wasn't actually true, and it makes even less sense if you know who didn't really die that night. Good enough. Let's imagine that scenario for now. His inner rationalist was looking back and face palming again at how he'd managed to not think about hypotheses like that one. It wasn't true, but it was reasonable, and Harry had never thought of any causal model that concrete, just vaguely suspected a connection. Hermione nodded. You probably know this already, but I just thought I'd say it to be sure. You're not Voldemort, Harry. I know, and that's what you mean to me. Harry took a breath, finding it still painful to say aloud. Voldemort... He wasn't a happy person. I don't know if he was ever happy a single day in his life. He never could cast the Patronus charm. That's one reason his cognitive patterns didn't take me over. My dark side didn't feel like a good place to be. It didn't get positively reinforced. Being friends with you means that my life doesn't have to go the way Voldemort's did. And I was pretty lonely before Hogwarts, although I didn't realize it then. So, yeah, I might have been slightly more desperate to bring you back from the dead than the average boy my age would have been. Though I also maintained that my decision was strictly normative moral reasoning, and if other people care less about their friends, that's their problem, not mine. I see. Hermione hesitated. Harry, don't take this the wrong way, but I'm not 100% comfortable with that. It's a big responsibility that I didn't choose, and I don't think it's healthy for you to lay it on just one person. Harry nodded. I know, but there's more to the point I'm trying to make. There was a prophecy about my vanquishing Voldemort. A prophecy? There was a prophecy about you? Seriously, Harry? Yeah, I know. Anyway, part of it went... And the Dark Lord shall mark him as his equal, but he shall have power the Dark Lord knows not. What would you guess that meant? Hmm. Hermione's fingers tapped thoughtfully on the roof stone. Your mysterious dark side is you know whose mark on you that made you his equal. The power he knew not was the scientific method, right? Harry shook his head. That's what I thought too at first that it was going to be muggle science or the methods of rationality. But... Harry exhaled. The sun had now fully risen above the hills. This felt embarrassing to say, but he was going to say it anyway. Professor Snape, who originally heard the prophecy... Yes, that's also a thing that happened. Professor Snape said he didn't think it could just be science. That the power the Dark Lord knows not needed to be something more alien to Voldemort than just that. Even if I think of it in terms of rationality, well, it turns out that the person Voldemort really was... Why, Professor Quirrell? Why? The thought still stabbing sickness at Harry's heart. He'd have been able to learn the methods of rationality too if he read the same science papers I did. Except, maybe, for one last thing. Harry drew a breath. At the end of all of it, during my final showdown with Voldemort, he threatened to put my parents and my friends into Azkaban, unless I came up with interesting secrets to tell him, one person saved per secret. But I knew I couldn't find enough secrets to save everyone. And in the moment that I saw no way at all left to save everyone, that's when I actually started thinking. Maybe for the first time in my life, I started thinking. I thought faster than Voldemort even though he was older than me and smarter, because... Because I had a reason to think. Voldemort had a drive to be immortal. He strongly preferred not to die. 
But that wasn't a positive desire, it was fear. And Voldemort made mistakes because of that fear. I think the power that Voldemort knew not was that I had something to protect. Oh, Harry. Hermione hesitated. Is that what I am to you, then? The thing that you protect? No, I mean, the whole reason I'm telling you this is that Voldemort wasn't threatening to put you in Azkaban. Even if he'd taken over the whole world, you'd have been fine. He'd already made a binding promise not to harm you because of... Um, because of reasons. So in my moment of ultimate crisis, when I reached deep down and found the power Voldemort knew not, I did it to protect everyone except you. Hermione considered this, a slow smile spreading over her face. Why, Harry, that's the least romantic thing I've ever heard. You're welcome. No, really, it does help. I mean, it makes the whole thing much less stalkery. I know, right? The two of them shared a companionable nod, both of them looking more relaxed now, and watched the sun rise together. I've been thinking about the alternate Harry Potter, the person I might have been if Voldemort hadn't attacked my parents, if Tom Riddle hadn't tried to copy himself onto me. That other Harry Potter wouldn't have been as smart, I guess. He probably wouldn't have studied much muggle science, even if his mother was a muggle-born. But that other Harry Potter would have had the capacity for warmth that he'd inherited from James Potter and Lily Evans. He would have cared about other people and tried to save his friends. I know that part would have been true, because that's something Lord Voldemort never did, you see. Harry's eyes were watering. So that part must be... The Remnant. The sun was well above the horizon now, the golden light illuminating both of them, casting long shadows off the other side of the rooftop platform. I think you're fine just the way you are. I mean, that other Harry Potter might have been a nice boy, maybe, but it sounds like I would have had to do all his thinking for him. Going by heredity, Alter Harry would have been in Gryffindor like his parents, and the two of you wouldn't have become friends. Though James Potter and Lily Evans were the head boy and head girl of Hogwarts back in the day, so he wouldn't have been that bad. I can just imagine it. Harry James Potter, sorted into Gryffindor, aspiring Quidditch player. No. Just no. Remembered by history as the sidekick of Hermione Jean Granger, who'd send out Mr. Potter to get in trouble for her, and then solve the mystery from the library by reading books and using her incredible memory. You're really enjoying this alternate universe, aren't you? Maybe he'd be best mates with Ron Weasley, the smartest boy in Gryffindor, and they'd fight side by side in my army defense class, and afterwards help each other with their homework. Okay, enough. This is starting to creep me out. Sorry. Though Hermione was still smiling to herself, appearing wrapped in some private vision. Apology accepted. The sun rose a little further in the sky. After a while, Hermione spoke. Do you suppose we'll fall in love with each other later on? I don't know any better than you do, Hermione. But why does it have to be about that? Seriously, why does it always have to be about that? Maybe when we're older we'll fall in love, and maybe we won't. Maybe we'll stay in love, and maybe we won't. Harry turned his head slightly. The sun was hot on his cheek, and he wasn't wearing sunscreen. No matter how it goes, we shouldn't try to force our lives into a pattern. I think when people try to force patterns onto this sort of thing, that's when they end up unhappy. No forced patterns. Hermione's eyes had taken on a mischievous look. That sounds like a more complicated way of saying no rules, which I guess seems a lot more reasonable to me than it would have at the start of this year. If I'm going to be a sparkling unicorn princess and have my own time machine, I might as well give up on rules, I suppose. I'm not saying that rules are always bad, especially when they actually fit people, instead of them being blindly imitated like Quidditch. But weren't you the one who rejected the hero pattern in favor of just doing the things she could? I suppose so. Hermione turned her head again to gaze down at the grounds below Hogwarts, for the sun was too bright to look at now. Though, Harry thought, Hermione's retinas would always heal now. 
It was safe for her alone to look directly into the light. You said, Harry, that you thought I was always destined to be the hero. I've been considering, and I suspect you're completely wrong. If this had been meant to be, things would have been a lot easier all around. Just doing the things you can do, you have to make that happen. You have to choose it over and over again. That might not conflict with your being a destined hero, Harry said, thinking of compatibilist theories of free will and prophecies that he must not look upon in order to fulfill. But we can talk about that later. You have to choose it, Hermione repeated. She pushed herself up on her hands, then popped herself backwards and onto the roof, rising to her feet in a smooth motion. Just like I'm choosing to do this. No kissing! Harry scrambled to his feet and prepared to dodge, though the realization came to him that the girl who revived would be much, much faster. I won't try to kiss you again, Mr. Potter. Not until you ask me, if you ever do. But there are all these warm feelings bubbling up inside of me and I feel like I might burst if I don't do something. Though it does now occur to me that it's unhealthy if girls don't know any way of expressing gratitude to boys besides kissing them. Hermione took out her wand and offered it crosswise, in the position she'd used to swear her oath of fealty to House Potter before the Wizengomet. Oh, hell no! Do you realize what it took to get you out of that oath last time? Don't go jumping to conclusions, you. I wasn't about to swear fealty to your house again. You've got to start trusting me to be sensible if you're going to be my mysterious young wizard. Now please hold out your wand. Slowly, Harry took out the Elder Wand and crossed it with Hermione's ten and three-quarters inches of vine wood, forcing down a last worry about her choosing the wrong thing. Can you at least not say anything about until death takes me? Because did I mention I have the Philosopher's Stone now? Or anything about the end of the world and its magic? I'm a lot more nervous around phrases like that than I used to be. Upon a roof floored in square stony tiles, the brilliant morning sun blazes down upon two not-really-children anymore, both in blue-fringed black robes facing each other across crossed wands. One has brown eyes beneath chaotic chestnut curls and radiates an aura of strength and beauty that is not magic only. The other has green eyes under glasses with messy black hair above a recently inflamed scar. Below, a stone tower nobody remembers seeing from ground level stretches downwards into the broad base of the castle Hogwarts. Far beneath them are visible the green hills and the lake. In the distance, a huge red and black line of rail cars and an engine appearing tiny from this height, a train neither muggle nor fully magical. The sky is nearly unclouded, but for faint tinges of orange-white where wisps of moisture reflect the sunlight. A light breeze carries the crisp chill of dawn and the dampness of morning. But the huge, blazing golden globe is now risen high above the horizon, and its incandescence casts warmth on everything it touches. Well, maybe after this you'll be less nervous, the hero says to her enigmatic wizard. She knows she doesn't know the whole story, but the fragment of truth that she does hold shines bright like sunlight within her, casting warmth on her insides, the way the sun warms her face. I do choose this now. Upon my life and magic, I swear friendship to Harry Potter. To help him and trust in him. To stand with him and, um, stand by him. And sometimes go where he can't go. Till the day that death takes me for real. If it ever does, I mean. And if the world or its magic ends, we'll deal with that together. End Harry Potter and the Methods of Rationality Check out my novel, What Lies Dreaming, at whatliesdreaming.com This chapter's original text, production notes, and attribution links, along with archives and much more, can be found at hpmorpodcast.com 
If you would like to learn more about the art of rationality, please visit lesswrong.com, an online community of aspiring rationalists founded by Eliezer Yudkowsky. Some sound effects used are courtesy of the Free Sound Project. The music used is Catch That Goblin by Skaven.